Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? I call the clerk. Mr. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and a return to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sitting of the Senate? I call the clerk. Mr. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill 2023, resumption of debate on the second reading and on the amendment moved by Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McKim, you're in continuation. Well, thanks very much, uh, President. When uh, I was speaking on uh, this legislation yesterday evening, I was uh, reflecting on the native forest logging industry, uh, how it uh, does not have a social licence, uh, how it is a massive carbon bomb that is playing a large role in driving uh, climate change and the breakdown of our climate, which in turn uh, is uh, tragically uh, turning our planet into a place where future generations will find it uh, impossible to enjoy the same levels of prosperity that we are today and may even yet uh, end up in, uh, inheriting an uninhabitable planet because of um, uh, the greed uh, and the psychopathy of current generations and in particular uh, those who represent the major parties in this place. Now, I want to make a few points about the native forest logging industry, particularly in Tasmania, and this is relevant in terms of the amendments that the Greens have, um, have secured to this legislation. Recently, uh, thanks to the Bob Brown Foundation, we've seen uh, the most distressing photos of a juvenile Tasmanian devil that was crisped, burned uh, to death, died in agony in a logging burn in Tasmania. And this one devil is symbolic of the millions of mammals that have been slaughtered by the native forest logging industry, either by being burned alive and dying the most agonising death or being deliberately poisoned and dying the most agonising death. And it is time the industry was held to account for this utter abject animal cruelty, and that's just on the mammals, let alone the insects and other invertebrates that are, that are just destroyed in massive numbers by this industry. It is a biodiversity harvester. It is trashing Tasmania's biodiversity, not to mention uh, trashing uh, our clean air, not to mention trashing our beautiful landscapes, not to mention poisoning our beautiful rivers and waterways, not to mention poisoning our estuary systems, not to mention the massive amount of carbon that it emits into the atmosphere. It's time to end native forest 
logging. It no longer has a social licence and it is a mendicant industry that costs the taxpayer tens of millions of dollars a year, even just in my home state of Tasmania. And I'll give you a tip, colleagues. If you pulled the public subsidies out of the native forest logging industry, it would be gone overnight because it cannot survive without massive public subsidies, money that should be going into making sure everyone has a home, money that should be going into making sure we've got a health system that can properly look after people, a public education system where schools don't have to sell lamingtons to buy textbooks. Those are the things that that money should be going into, not propping up an environmentally destructive industry of climate criminals who have once again got their hand, hands out for tens of millions of dollars of taxpayer funds. Now, the Greens have secured, as I said, an amendment that ensures coal, um, gas and native forest logging are prohibited investments under this legislation. Now, it's worth pointing out that this is the same amendment put in place by the Greens for the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. This is the same amendment put in place by the Greens for uh, ARENA. Those amendments prevented the CEFC and ARENA from being used as slush funds for coal and gas by the coalition government that we have now thankfully seen the back of. And the amendments negotiated to the National Reconstruction Fund bill by the Greens ensures that the NRF will be focused on the task of rebuilding a genuine manufacturing base, not propping up coal and gas corporations and native forest logging. And that is critical because the Greens want the monies appropriated for the National Reconstruction Fund to be used to accelerate the transition in Australia, the transition away from coal, gas and native forest logging, those environmentally destructive industries, those industries that are, con that are contributing so massively to climate change. We want to see these funds used to drive the transition away from those industries into the industries of the future into industries that can help us become a world leader in, uh, in transitioning to uh, a net zero emissions society, because that's what we need to be. And of course, there will be opportunities for those countries and jurisdictions around the world that can lead that transition. And we genuinely hope and we genuinely want the funds used in this legislation to drive and to accelerate that transition. We've also secured an amendment in this legislation that would uh, mean that investments made by the National Reconstruction Fund Board must align with legislated climate targets and any future updated commitment by Australia under the Paris Agreement. Now, interestingly, the Greens took a policy to the last election to create a $15 billion Made in Australia bank and manufacturing fund. And because of the amendments that we have secured to this legislation, the National Reconstruction Fund reflects most of the core spirit of the Greens Made in Australia bank. Now, I want to be very clear, the Made in Australia bank was planned with one of its primary tasks being to decarbonise Australia's existing manufacturing base and the amendments we have secured to the National Reconstruction Fund legislation will assist in achieving uh, that aim. Something that not a lot of people know, uh, Deputy President, is that currently Australia ranks 91st country in the world for economic complexity. And that's because over the years and decades, we've traded off a self-reliant manufacturing base for uh, an economy that is uh, to far too great a degree reliant on uh, the extraction and export of fossil fuels. And you can see that uh, in the gas industry today. I mean, the gas cabal uh, in this country 
um, is, uh, is effectively given the resource for next to nothing. Uh, they emit large amounts of, of climate destroying carbon and methane and other greenhouse gases as they uh, extract and convert the gas for transport. And then the overwhelming majority of the gas ends up exported to other countries around the world, while the gas price remains stubbornly high in this country, helping uh, to contribute to the cost of living crisis faced by so many Australians. And because uh, we are uh, uh, ranked so low for economic complexity and because um, the fossil fuel cabal uh, owns the major parties in this place through the institutionalised bribery of political donations. We are far too deeply reliant on, uh, on a globally integrated open market economy and therefore shocks abroad reverberate to far too great a degree throughout the Australian economy. And we can see that um, today, as uh, we have just gone through 10 consecutive interest rate rises in a row by an out-of-control reserve bank uh, and a government who's pretending that it's all too difficult and it can't itself uh, do anything to address inflation, which is, of course, uh, an absolute load of neoliberal rubbish. But these 10 consecutive interest rate rises, by the way, colleagues, that has never happened before in Australia's history that um, the RBA has raised interest rates on, uh, uh, at 10 consecutive board meetings. Uh, what you are seeing is real wages decreasing at the fastest rate on record in Australia. So inflation up. We are overexposed to global sh supply shocks because of um, the factors I mentioned earlier. That means that along with those global shocks, which are, uh, many of which are climate related, many of which are pandemic related, many of which are geopolitics related, such as the war uh, in the Ukraine, with those um, global supply shocks that we are overexposed to, plus this government's refusal to rein in um, the rampant profiteering that is going on from big corporations at the moment, who are using the cover of the global supply shocks to put up their prices higher than they otherwise would be able to, what we are seeing is an inflation spike. And then we get the Reserve Bank coming in, raising interest rates, putting massive strain on mortgage holders and renters, because this government is just putting the whole problem in the too hard basket. Well, here is a little shopping list of what this government could do. Firstly, they could put in place a corporate super profits tax that would disincentivise disincentivise um, uh, corporations from price gouging. Then they could actually. Uh, remove the stage three tax cuts for the top end, walk away from the $368 billion of nuclear submarines that we don't, don't need and will actually make this country a more dangerous place to live. And they could use those savings to invest in programs that would actually help people with the cost of living crisis in a non-inflationary way. For example, put dental and mental health into Medicare. No inflationary impact, but it would actually do something meaningful to help people, families with kids struggling with uh, cost of living. They could make childcare free. They could build more affordable homes so more people would have a home. This government's been very happy to intervene in the gas price, but it's uh, it, it, stubbornly refusing to in, uh, intervene in the rental crisis. They could do something to freeze rents. These are all Australian Greens policies, I might add. And finally, they need to raise income support because people on JobSeeker are literally starving and poverty is a political choice being made by the Labor Party. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I rise to speak to the National Recon Reconstruction Fund, Corporation Bill 2023. One Nation is not inclined to support this legislation, but, as usual, we are going to try and make it better. I remind the Senate this is why we are here, to improve legislation, not to rubber stamp the Green Left political agenda. One Nation will be moving amendments to the bill. Our First Amendment will attempt to put some substance behind the phrase that Australia is the clever country. This nation has produced world-leading scientists, engineers and inventors who have contributed a great deal to the body of human knowledge. 
But all too often, clever Australians are forced to take their great ideas overseas to be commercialised, and this intellectual property is lost to our nation. A recent example of this was the COVID-19 vaccine, a non-mRNA vaccine developed by the University of Queensland. It was re refused a patent, and the TDA refused to approve it, and Australia was left to import vaccines from overseas pharmaceutical companies. A more famous example was the invention of Wi-Fi. The alliance, which owns the trademark, is not based in Australia, but in the United States. While the CSIRO was eventually compensated to some extent, those making the real profits from this piece of Australian technology are foreign companies like Apple, Samsung, Microsoft, Intel and Sony. The government says this bill will make it easier for industry to commercialise innovation and technology, supporting the development of our national sovereign capabilities. One Nation's amendment seeks to absolutely guarantee this by ensuring the commercialisation of Australian intellectual property for the benefit of Australia is included within the investment perimeters of the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation within the definition of constitutionally supported activities. A subsequent amendment will also loosen up the risk management guideline. Innovation and ideas and extracting some reward from their success often require taking risks. Clever Australians often risk a great deal of their own money and reputation to bring their ideas to commercialisation. At the very least, the government should help them shoulder some of the risk if there's a good chance that innovation can benefit the Australian people. One of these inventions was brought to my attention about 2017-2018. Now, a lot of Australians would be shocked to know that both the Liberal and Labor governments, and I personally spoke to two former Liberal MPs and PM Albanese, Anthony Albanese, that they canned an asbestos eradication plant that I brought to them in 2017. The coalition government put aside $80 million in the budget. This went through a process. After going be before six ministers dragging their knuckles, nothing happened with regards to this. Now, it would have been the first domestic plant in Australia, uh, that in the world actually, that would have dealt with 100 tonnes a day of deadly asbestos fibres instead of burying it. Instead, every state and territory is leaving a deadly legacy for future generations to deal with. Also, the same plant, with a few minor changes, could have also dealt with low-grade nuclear, that's hospital waste, and solar panels. We have not discussed how the impact of these hundreds of millions of panels are going to be dealt with other than burying them again with the potential to poison our waterways. And this is what they've turned their back on. They talk about innovation and the reconstruction fund, and uh, yet no one was interested in taking up this technology which would have actually got rid of asbestos, nuclear waste, solar panels. No one's told me how. You're all pushing for solar panels, but no one's told me how you intend to get rid of the solar panels, apart from burying them in the ground. And yet you've lost this opportunity. It's still there if you've got the, if you've got the determination to actually do something about it. But our Prime Minister, he wasn't interested. Our second amendment once again seeks to ensure it is Australians who benefit from the extraction of our natural resources. This is because Labor has once again caved into the green left extremists and ruled our out investment in gas and coal projects by the corporation despite Australia's desperate shortage of affordable and reliable energy. This is despite Labor's promise to reduce household energy bills by $275 per year, a promise they obviously never intended to keep. 
Our amendment will ensure the ban placed on the corporation investing in the construction of pipeline infrastructure for the extraction of natural gas will not limit investment to, in pipelines for the transport of natural gas <coughs> to Australians' households and businesses. Australia has some of the largest reserves of natural gas in the world, yet we receive very little in return for their exploitation by mostly foreign-owned multinationals which pay little to no tax in Australia. Again, another issue that I've raised with the former coalition and Prime Minister Albanese. Whereas we export $91 billion worth of gas in Australia—93 per cent comes from the northwest shelf, 7 per cent from the east coast of Australia. Of that, $77 billion off the northwest coast, we get about $300 million in taxes because, under the Labor Party, they thought it was a great idea to, to increase the PWRT. That's on an investment. They've got a 15 per cent uplift factor, so if they put $100 million a year in exploration, they get $115 million in tax credits, which accumulates every year. And so your big companies, Chevron, ExxonMobil and Shell, have accumulated about $400 billion worth of tax. So we're not getting anything out of there off the northwest shelf. All our resources, which belongs to the Australian people, and you're not chasing that. You're chasing your tail where you want to actually you know, get rid of the personal tax cuts to Australians, which they highly need and deserve, but you're not prepared to go after the multinationals and get rid of the PWRT and make them pay for our resources, which belongs to all Australians, but you allow the Western Australian government to do another 25-year deal that they get their gas at cost price. And where your, your McGowan Premier McGowan has said, it's our gas, it's, you know, you're not, we're not going to send pipelines to the east coast to supply the rest of Australia. And that is what is actually happening. And yet nothing's done about it. No one's interested. That gas does not belong to the Western Australian people. It's in continental water. It's in our waters, Australian waters. It belongs to every Australian. And to hear both the former Prime Ministers, plus also the Prime Minister, current Prime Minister Anthony Albanese saying we're going to get multinationals to pay their fair share of tax. I'm yet to see it. I'm yet to see any of this. And I'd like to see where this bill is actually going to go. If you're going to give it handouts, it is going to be to multinational companies again who don't pay their fair share of tax in Australia. That's going to be very interesting in itself too. So these uh, things are very important to me. One Nation will continue to advocate for a transcontinental pipeline bringing gas from the northwest shelf to eastern Australia. It has to happen. If you don't do that, then we must transport it by ship, which would probably be a lot easier and cheaper than putting the pipeline in, but we've got to look at it. We've got you know, a couple of hundred years, if not more, of gas that we can actually drive this nation, give cheap power to the Australian people. It's an inescapable fact that as more unreliable and costly renewables come online, more gas is needed to firm this intermittent supply. Green left extremists either don't understand this or deliberately refuse to acknowledge it. One Nation will continue to advocate for our energy resources to benefit Australia and Australians first. We seek tax reform, which ensures Australians get a fair return for our natural resources, as I stated. This government is going to need a way to meet the $368 billion cost to AUKUS. Properly taxing foreign-owned multinationals would be an excellent place to start. Now, I have a concern with this uh, with the reconstruction fund, because it's going to be sent up by the minister, and I'd like to know, and they're handpicking who's on the board. Well, who's going on the board? Is it going to be unionists? Are they actually going to say to the government which firms are going to be able to get the funding? Will it be union dominated, meaning that they have to have union workers? You know, these things need to be answered. And if that is the case that union members are going to go on the board, why? What right do they have to be on the board? 
It should be experienced people in the business world, not unions, involved in this. So that question needs to be asked. Listening to the Green Senator yesterday, Shoebridge, he said that um, we're destroying native forests at a, at a greater rate than human CO2. He said that we're destroying human forests. Actually, no, Senator Shoebridge, all your wind farms are destroying. Go up to North Queensland on the Tablelands and have a look at the hundreds of thousands of acres that you've put under wind farms. You've destroyed natural habitat. You've destroyed the flora and fauna. You are destroying it with your wind farms that are, that are killing um, birds and animals, flora and fauna, and acres and acres of it. You know, the size of these wind turbines that comes from China, China, mind you, and your solar panels mostly out of China, that we are actually and 800 tonnes of cement in the base of one of these wind turbines. Again, where is that beneficial to the environment? Are we going to put monies from the fund into more of this into the country, which, is at, which states we can't run this country on just wind and solar? That is so stupid to head down that path. It's not going to happen. We haven't got the batteries to store the power. So you're heading down a pathway that is going to destroy our economy, jobs and our industries and manufacturing, let alone putting people in a situation in their households that they will not be able to turn on their power for heat, heating or warmth. But no, listen to the Greens. And Senator Hanson Young, she says, scrap fossil fuel subsidies. Well then, let's scrap the billions in subsidies to renewable energy. What's the difference? What is the difference? Wind farms are destroying the environment, wildlife, birds, flora and fauna, solar panels. They don't and will not alter climate change and will not deliver the cheap, reliable power that we need. The green sex scaremongering with the term pollution, CO2, it's just ridiculous. It's a gas. It is necessary. It is actually, CO2 is necessary and vital for all life on this planet to exist. If you're going to scaremonger and tell that we need to get rid of it, it is absolutely ridiculous. CO2 is 97% from natural sources, basically the oceans, and 70% of this earth is covered by oceans. So how the hell is actually taxing people or companies and businesses or telling people to turn off their power? And even Tim Flannery said if you turned off all the, you know, got rid of CO2, it would never change a damn thing, never alter the earth's temperature at all. This is all the scaremongering that's going on purely to get the vote or confuse kids in our educational system that they don't know what they're doing. Europe has learnt from this. They got rid of their coal-fired power stations and actually shut down the gas. Now they're understanding that people are dying because they can't heat or warm their houses. Their industry is gone. Now they're turned around, they're opening up coal mines, they're building the power stations. And not only that, the hypocrites from the Greens again, stating that where's your complaint about China? Where's your complaint that China's emissions are 30 per cent? You never mention that. You never mention about shutting down the imports that we get from them from all their emissions. Not one word. No one speaks about China or India. India won't change it to 2070 and, and China not till 2060. So what a bunch of hypocrites in this place and you actually want to destroy our economy, you want to ch shut down um, people's livelihoods and uh, our standard of living in this country. It's an absolute disgrace and I wish that you would actually um, talk with them the truth instead of the scaremongering that goes on all the time in this chamber purely to get the vote. And that is not what we are about. And you've got to talk about future generations. There is no computer modelling, no proof to really say that you know that the temperature is going to, temperature is going to rise by one and a half to two degrees in 100 years' time. What a joke. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Deputy President. This bill provides an opportunity for Australia to build a new economic future. However, what this future looks like will be up to the government. It could be a future of a thriving economy investing in renewable energy technology, the circular economy and new sustainable innovative products. Or it could be a future relying on more of the same. 
under a different name, financing industries that destroy our environment and climate and our home, focusing on defence technologies or industries that feed into giant fossil fuel projects or allow the destruction of country. I commend the Greens for negotiating the prohibition of direct investment of the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation into coal and natural gas projects, as well as native forest logging. But there is more to this. There are many industries that are required for these projects to go ahead, that produce the equipment for gas drilling, the machinery needed at coal mining or for logging our forests. Today I will be moving amendments to pro prohibit the corporation to invest into these industries as well. I will also be moving an amendment to prohibit investments in nuclear technologies. At a time when nuclear war becomes more threatening than it has been over the last 30 years, and at a time where we know not only of the dangers of nuclear energy production and dealing with radioactive waste, but also the economic rabbit hole that nuclear power constitutes. It only makes sense to exclude this thinking from the past, from our planning for the future. For those of you worried about nuclear medicines, we can and will continue to produce nuclear medicines, but this can be done safely through the use of particle accelerators rather than nuclear reactors, posing much less risk to our communities and environment. I will also move an amendment requiring any extractive industry project or major development seeking funding through the corporation to demonstrate that they have thoroughly engaged with the traditional owners of the land of the proposed project. They have provided information that they have pro provided information to traditional owners in accessible formats and properly consulted about what they are proposing to do. And last but not least, that they have actually obtained consent for the project. Our economy of the future should not be built against the wishes and concerns of First Nations people. There are many projects our people would like to and will support. Your votes on these investment-related amendments will be a sign of which future you want to see for this country. The second reading amendment in my name further stresses the importance of the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation to take into account free, prior and informed consent. Australia has a poor record on ensuring First Nations people are being heard and get a say over what happens on their country. This would be an encouraging step towards ensuring we actually comply with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which we endorsed 14 years ago but have done almost nothing to actually implement. This commitment could easily be incorporated into the investment mandate, which will be prepared shortly, and could be part of the investment application process. I therefore foreshadow that I will later move the second reading amendment in my name on sheet 1916, seeking government commitment to the corporation, ensuring the principle of free, prior and informed consent is adhered to by those receiving funding for major projects with environmental impact. Thank you. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to speak on the National Reconstruction Fund. And let me say up front about this bill, uh, there's been a lot of disappointing legislation and programs uh, being delivered since getting into government by those opposite, but this really ranks right up at the top of bad, bad legislation for our nation. This is a highly cynical bill that I think reeks of left-wing uh, policies and politics instead of being a genuine nation-building uh, policy and program. It is a flawed fraud on the Australian people and on, Australian, uh, on the Australian economy, and it will do far more harm to this nation than it will do good. 
Labor has made a desperate last-minute dodgy deal with the Greens, uh, which will prohibit coal or gas from receiving finance from the National Reconstruction Fund. The fact is this that Australian manufacturers rely on cheap energy to make things on shore, but Labor's continued irresponsible demonisation of gas and broken promises to bring power prices down will force more Australian manufacturers offshore. And what is the result of that? Uh, far, possibly far more expensive gas for Australians, but also for people such, you know, like the Ukrainians who we're forcing to take still to rely a lot on Russian gas. So every expert in the country is calling on the Prime Minister to unlock more supplies of gas. Indeed, some manufacturers have had their gas bills triple. That is triple. And at the same time, those opposite say this is all about uh, supporting Australian manufacturers. What this dodgy, irresponsible deal has done is to ensure that we make it as difficult as possible for Australian manufacturers. In fact, you couldn't think of anything worse to do to Australian manufacturers at this time than to triple their energy prices. And it is very, very clear, despite all of their rhetoric before the election. Oh, I'm seeing. Are you taking a photo of me, Senator Pratt? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, sorry, Deputy Chair. I thought I was uh, seeing Senator Pratt take another photo in the chamber, but uh, my apologies. Uh, Labor will always work with the Greens against the interest of families, businesses, and our manufacturers. That is very clear. No matter what they say before the election, they always do that after the election. Benchmark power prices for hundreds and thousands of Australians are set to rise by more than 20 per cent over coming months. And sadly, for all Australians who are already struggling with increased cost of living, including increased power costs, this desperate and very dodgy deal will make it worse for Australian manufacturers and for everyday Australians through further increased power prices. Now, the industry minister himself, he claims, he speaks out of one side of his mouth that he supports gas, but his actions in caving into these radical green amendments speak the loudest. This is a very bad bill which has become even worse with this dodgy deal. And on this side of the chamber, we will fight it because it is such a flawed bill. There are five main reasons why this is flawed, and let me share them with you now. The fund will be administered by a corporation with an independent board who will deliver against an investment mandate set by the government. But that framework is fundamentally flawed for five reasons. And as I've said, it will make the circumstances for Australian manufacturers and for Australian energy consumers, i.e. Australian families, all the worse. And what's worse is that Labor and the Greens understand these flaws, and yet they are still going ahead with this legislation. To me, it reeks of them pushing through the cashless debit card repeal, knowing and having the warnings of the consequences this would cause to thousands of Indigenous Australians and remote communities, but they were ideologically hell-bent on introducing it. And the safety and security of those communities and women and children be damned. And that is exactly what we're seeing here. They are going to introduce this legislation come hell or high water, and they don't really care about the implications for Australian workers, Australian manufacturing and, of course, our energy producers. So let's have a look at the five reasons why this is such bad legislation. Firstly, the bill almost is devoid of any economic considerations. Now, the government must, they must, and they promised before the election to address rising energy prices. But guess what? As we've heard time and time again in question time uh, inside this place, another broken promise, and they don't really care at all. The government must address, as I said, rising energy prices. They must address labour market shortages and disrupted supply chains if our manufacturers are to succeed. And without the policies, and they have no policies in any of these areas yet, that create stronger economic conditions 
Any government spending like this, apart from being inflationary, will have no positive impact on our economy. It would be money in one pocket and money out of the other due to the cost pressures that the government in the last first nine months has completely failed to deliver, as every Australian will tell you about the pressures on their hip pocket. The Coalition is opposing this bill because this arrogant government is telling our manufacturers what they think they need and what they ideologically are now bound to deliver because of this deal, rather than addressing what our manufacturers actually need to be competitive, to produce and to employ Australians. And the simple fact is, without these other policies, they are holding industry back, and this is not just useless, it is counterproductive. And it seems that every time Labor is in government, they have such terrible luck. Every time they come to government, there is such a, you know, such an unprecedented crisis. But that is government. And that is always the case. So that's the first thing, is they don't have the economic policies to make this policy work. The second flaw, fundamental flaw in this policy, is that this bill will create even more lost time for manufacturers. In this terribly broken model, it will take far too long for money to start flowing to manufacturers. The Clean Energy Finance Corporation, on which the NRF is modelled, was established in 2012, and the first investment took nearly 12 months to make. Our manufacturers cannot afford to wait that long. The government announced that the NRF should be up and running by next financial year, but of course they have not yet given any indication of a start date. Why? Because they know it is going to be a long time away. So that's the second reason this is such flawed legislation. The third reason is that the NRF is based on a highly flawed and a very poor funding model. The model shifts from competitive grant programs, which have in built in with them robust processes to government acquiring um, equity and also for how government provides loans, which in their model will lead inevitably to unfavourable and unintended consequences. Government equ equity and loan schemes are less accessible than grants, and manufacturers are almost certainly going to struggle to meet their return on investment thresholds or put together detailed business cases in-house. And these are the sorts of things that the Labor Party and the Greens do not think about. What is the reality of business development and equity financing and capital raising for manufacturing companies in Australia. So what will happen to failed or failing loans? It is clear that the last experiment down this very similar path was a Victorian Economic Development Corporation which uprooted manufacturers. Eligibility is also another issue. Certain industries may have margins which are too small or it could be too risky with disrupted supply chains that many companies are still facing. The, third, sorry, the fourth flaw, the fourth very fundamental flaw in this legislation, is that this bill undermines investment certainty in our nation's priorities. And with the government changing Australia's national manufacturing priorities on a highly partisan political whim, not based on sound economic principles, it will undermine investment decisions and erode investor confidence. This is particularly pertinent to the space industry, complementary medicine and, to a lesser extent, but still validly, to the recycling industry. The, government's, the Labor government's new priorities are too vague and they strip industry policy of the focus needed to drive investment in highly tailored and specific sectors. This is so typical of Labor, choosing to spray money uh, in indiscriminately instead of continuing investment certainty for our manufacturers and our industry. So if that wasn't enough, there is a fifth reason why this is such a flawed fraud on Australian people. 
The bill ultimately is fiscally irresponsible. In delivering funding well in excess of the coalition's modern manufacturing strategy, which was highly targeted, specific and aimed at value-adding uh, for manufacturing in this nation, uh, an initial $5 billion appropriation is provided upon passage of this bill. But the timing, and this is the kicker, but the timing of the remaining $10 billion will not be subject to further parliamentary approval. Think about that. This is the next Labor Party slush fund, $10 billion, and this is why it is so flawed. In fact, similar financial structures to the one underpinning this bill have drawn criticism from the IMF itself, who stated that implementation of below-the-line activity through newly created investment vehicles, such as the NRF, this one we're talking about today, should be phased appropriately and, more broadly, a proliferation of such vehicles should be avoided because they are bad policy, they are fiscally irresponsible. And this is what the IMF also said that the cost of living support in light of higher energy prices should be targeted, aiming at, aimed at protecting vulnerable households and small viable firms. So let's not forget Labor are carelessly rushing through a total of $45 billion of off-budget spending, and this has to be stopped by this place. It is inflationary. It will further drive up the costs of living and particularly power prices for all Australian families. And worse, it will not achieve the desired or the stated effect by those opposite of actually increasing targeted uh, manufacturing in this nation. Now, I'll finish on this, which is something that absolutely just floored me. But then again, I'm not surprised. So when the Assistant Minister for Manufacturing, Senator Ayres, and the department were pressed in Senate estimates recently about whether any modelling had been done on the inflationary pressures of the NRF and what inflationary pressures they would cause. What do you think the answer was? Had the Labor Party and the government modelled this in any way to determine the inflationary impact on Australians, particularly now with the high cost of living for all Australians under this government? And the department officials said no. No modelling, no inflationary modelling on this at all, despite the fact that it is very clear this could well have an inflationary impact on Australians and on uh, companies, particularly for their energy prices. And when pressed further, as if that wasn't bad enough, the response from the official was this. They didn't do it because they didn't think it was necessary. This government did not think it was necessary to even model the inflationary impact of this clearly inflationary policy. The only reason you can possibly imagine they did that, because then they can say when it inevitably does drive up inflation and energy costs, well, no one told us. That's because you didn't ask and because you ignored the economic facts. Now, the coalition does acknowledge the importance of having strong supports for Australian manufacturing, which is why we achieved this and delivered the modern manufacturing strategy. But it was transparent and it was sound economically. Labor's National Reconstruction Fund is many times the cost has great risk for ta Australian taxpayers and will demonstrably not result in any benefit for Australian manufacturers. It will just result in more paying for Australian taxpayers. Thank you. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Throughout Australia's history, manufacturing has been at the heart of our economic growth and success. The revitalisation of our manufacturing sector is of critical importance, not only as a pillar of our domestic economy, but also as a crucial element of our national security. Supporting our manufacturing industry is therefore key to Australia's future. However, the future will not look so kindly and history will look very dimly 
on Labor's National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill. This bill fails to address the economic conditions now facing Australian manufacturers. It fails to provide for timely funding. It fails to present manufacturers with a rational funding model and it fails to provide investment certainty. The bill is, in other words, a reckless and slapdash attempt to throw money at the manufacturing industry with no certainty as to the returns that will deliver. This is typical Labor legislation. This is typical Labor policy on the run. It is neither rational nor responsible. It is, in fact, an embarrassingly poor attempt at a manufacturing policy. Under this government, Australians, including manufacturers, are dealing with soaring energy prices. Soaring energy prices, labour market shortages and disrupted supply chains. This economy under this Albanese Labor government is spiralling out of control. The government's response to this chaos is to tell manufacturers what they think they need rather than addressing what they want. And Madam Acting Deputy President, a number of weeks ago I attended the 25th anniversary celebration of the Geelong Manufacturing Council. Geelong has an incredible history of manufacturing. It is one of the centres of excellence of manufacturing in this country. So it was with great pride that I attended that function, which brought together manufacturers from manufacturing in food, agriculture, uh, diesel, petrol, um, heavy chemicals, uh, right across the spectre of all types of manufacturing. And I'll tell you the two things that manufacturers were talking about. While the Deputy Prime Minister, the member for Correo, gave his speech, which said nothing of substance, I'll tell you what they were saying on the floor of the event. There are two things that this Labor government needs to fix. One is spiralling energy costs and the ridiculous energy cap legislation, which has created more uncertainty so much uncertainty that the gas import terminal proposed by Viva Energy at Geelong's refinery is now up in the air. Uh, so much uncertainty because of the haphazard and unacceptable way that this government has attempted to fix the spiralling cost of energy. And of course, the multi-employer bargaining provisions. And manufacturers around this country are appalled by what this government is doing to their business. They are appalled. So for any business approaching 20 employees or with more in than 20 employees, under this Labor government, they are a sitting duck. And you know why they're talking quietly on the floor of these events, speaking to us in confidence? Because if they stick their head up they will be destroyed by the unions. They will be targeted as soon as those provisions come into force. So if this Labor government wants to do the manufacturing industry any favour, it should get out of the way. It should allow our manufacturers across the country to thrive in the best possible conditions. And I say on behalf of all manufacturers in Victoria, one of the reasons that we have such a fine history of manufacturing is because of our low energy prices, delivered primarily by brown coal. That kept our energy prices, our electricity prices, lower than anywhere else in the country. And under this government and under a Daniel Andrews Labor government in Victoria, uh, we are now delivering the highest prices or amongst the highest prices in the country, which is putting manufacturers' backs to the wall. And of course, we will never forget in our city, in our region, in our Victoria, what the former Labor government did 
Madam Acting Deputy President, when last in government, the Rudd-Gillard governments. They imposed a carbon tax on all Australians and all manufacturers, which of course hurt everyone economically, particularly employers, had a, had a huge impact on jobs. And as, as part of that terrible climate that Labor created when it was last in government, Ford closed on Labor's watch. Ford Manufacturing in 2013, under Labor, announced it was ending manufacturing. And this Labor government continues to prosecute the argument that car manufacturing stopped under our government. Well, I can tell you there is no finer manufacturer in our city and our region than Ford at both Geelong and Broadmeadows. And they packed up shop. They announced that they were closing manufacturing under the former Labor government uh, because, of course, the conditions that they were forced to compete in meant that Ford was no longer competitive. So this is terrible, terrible legislation. And as I say, this is not want what our manufacturers want. They want cheap energy prices. They want industrial relations harmony. They do not want a situation where, within a matter of weeks or months, they will have the knock at the door. Oh, we've got a vote. We're now coming for you. We're now, uh, we've got Geelong Refinery in our region. So we're now going to suggest that all manufacturers in Geelong pay the same prices, the same wages that are paid at a large corporation like Viva Energy. There is so much fear. There is so much fear by reason of what this government has done. And I have to say, as someone who has proudly stood up for manufacturing before I was ever elected, Growing up in Geelong and since I was first elected in 2013, the many ways that we drove investment into Geelong manufacturers, into manufacturing across this country, uh, meant that those really dark days that we faced in 2013 were reversed because of the enormous amount of investment on a competitive basis that we drove into great regions like Geelong, including, of course, our fine Geelong manufacturers. And of course, we're very proud of our $2.5 billion modern manufacturing strategy, uh, which sought to bolster our sovereign manufacturing capability and empowered over 200 key projects across Australia. So, despite promising over and over again that their National Reconstruction Fund would re reinvigorate manufacturing in Australia, we saw next to nothing in the budget to roll out this program, and now Labor has chosen to spitefully redirect the Modern Manufacturing Initiatives Fund without even having rolled out its own National Reconstruction Fund. So I say to this government, from the grassroots, from the manufacturers who work so hard and their workers every single day, to produce the goods and services for our country, I say, why don't you start listening? Why don't you start listening to what they're saying in their factories, on the factory floors, in their shop fronts, in their businesses? They want cheaper price, power prices. They want industrial relations harmony. They want to be allowed to get on and deliver. And of course, supported by great programs like the modern, manufacture, modern manufacturing strategy, uh, that's what these manufacturers were doing. So let me just uh, reiterate that firstly this bill ignores key economic issues. The government's failure to address rising energy prices, labour market shortages and disrupted supply chains if our manufacturers are to succeed. This is classic Labor policy. Let's just throw a bucket of money at this, just as they did with the VEDC, the Victorian Economic Development Corporation, where the government thought it was part of the market and it was a disaster. Tens and tens of, of millions of dollars of losses. The second floor with this bill 
it will create even more lost time for manufacturers. This is a broken model, and under this model, which was modelled on the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, which is a much more specific program, this will take a very significant time for the money to start flowing, and our manufacturers cannot afford to wait that long, particularly when all of the investment that we put in to manufacturing has now been reallocated or cut. The NRF has a very poor funding model because it shifts from a competitive grant program with robust processes where applications are decided on their merits to government acquiring equity and providing loans, which uh, is likely to lead to unintended consequences. Government equity and loan schemes are firstly they're less accessible than grants and manufacturers may struggle to meet the return on investment thresholds which are required to put or, or all of the investment required to put together a detailed business case in-house. And so what's going to happen if uh, a manufacturer is saddled with a failing loan? What is going to happen to the financial viability of those businesses? Um, that is a question that the government cannot answer. The bill also undermines investment certainty in national priorities, with the government changing Australia's national manufacturing priorities on a political whim, undermining investment decisions and eroding investment confidence. Uh, this is particularly pertinent to the space industry, complementary medicine and, to a lesser extent, recycling. And I have to say on that note, even just yesterday I had a meeting with a university which is doing an enormous amount of work in space and aerospace. Uh, they are doing cutting edge work, actually working with a private business in launching a satellite. Not only are they um, giving incredible opportunities to their students, but they're also embracing school students. And to exclude space and aerospace as a key manufacturing priority is a very big, very, very big mistake which needs to be rectified. The other, the other point that I want to make is the bill is fiscally irresponsible. Um, it delivers funding well in excess of the coalition's modern manufacturing strategy without any of the checks and balances. Uh, an initial $5 billion appropriation is provided upon passage of the bill, but the timing of the remaining $10 billion will not be subject to further parliamentary approval, which is extraordinary. Can you imagine if we, when we were in government, bringing a $10 billion appropriation to the parliament and not being accountable? Uh, in fact, similar financial structures to the one underpinning this bill have drawn criticism from the IMF, which stated that implementation of below-the-line activity through newly created investment vehicles such as the NRF should be phased appropriately and, more broadly, a proliferation of such vehicles should be avoided. And This is the important part. The IMF said that cost of living support in light of high energy prices should be targeted, aimed at protecting vulnerable households and small viable firms. So, of course, Labor hasn't done any of that. It's just got this ugly bucket of money, a big, fat slush fund, that it's just throwing out there and thinking that it can do the job. Well, I can tell you, on the ground, from the manufacturers who are talking all around this country, this is shocking policy, and it is time that this Labor government started to focus on the things that really matter, proper competitive support, uh, lower power prices, and changing the revolting, regressive IR laws. Senator, your time has expired. Senator Rustin. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And, um, I stand here um, as a member of a, a coalition party that has, I think, a very strong record in supporting manufacturing in this country. Um, we did so during our time in government, um, and we would have continued to do so, um, and we, we will continue to do so um, when we are in government again. Um, because we believe that there are um, manufacturing industries in Australia that have been the backbone of our country. And 
Um, I can't think of any manufacturing sector that has been more in virtually integrated in this, this country than the Australian wine industry. Uh, and I come from a very proud wine growing area uh, in the Riverland of South Australia. And the reason I say that I think that the wine industry is probably the most vertically integrated um, manufacturing sector in Australia is because, first of all, we grow the primary product, so we grow something from, uh, from natural, uh, the natural environment, whether that be the soil and the water. Uh, we then manufacture that product into something that not only is consumed in Australia, but it is also a very large export product for Australia. But most importantly, it also is a tourism industry. Many people from around the world visit Australia because they want to experience not just our world-class wine, but also the experiences that we offer through our fantastic wine regions around every single state and territory um, of Australia has something proud to showcase in relation to the wine industry. So there can be no better example of a vertically integrated um, manufacturing sector than our fantastic Australian wine industry. But you know what I think the greatest threat to the manufacturing sector in Australia is right now is rising energy costs. Um, because so many of our fantastic um, industries rely on not just reliable but also affordable energy in order for them to manufacture. So there is no point in making great investments into, uh, into manufacture unless you actually deal with the cost of doing business and the challenges that are currently facing Australian manufacturing sector. I mean, it was so devastating yesterday. I mean, as the Shadow Minister for Health, there can be nothing that is more important than us being able to provide an environment in Australia where um, Australians, particularly um, Australian children, have access to be able to um, have a healthy lifestyle and participate in sport. And to find that we now are hearing that swimming centres across the country are actually not um, heating their pools to the same extent that they previously were, to the temperatures that they uh, thought were the most appropriate to enable a comfortable experience for Australians who want to participate in water sport and swimming as part of uh, their health uh, regimes, we're now seeing them dropping the temperature um, because they cannot afford the energy cost to maintain the, the, uh, the temperature levels in pools. I mean, this is an extraordinary admission um, of the failure of this government to be able to provide the support to Australia to be able to support them um, in being able to deliver the things that we know that Australian businesses and industry and manufacturing can do. The other thing that is really disappointing about um, the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill 2023 um, is the fact that um, the, it, it basically applies every single piece of bad policy, bad legislative design and regulation and stuffs it all into one bill. Um, you know, the fact that we have got um, this is, is off balance sheet, and it seems to be a bit of a track record of those opposite in the sort of um, ideological pursuit of somehow being able to say that you know, there's budget repair has, has occurred. They've stuffed a whole heap of money um, into off-balance sheet um, instruments so that they don't have to list it on the bottom line of their budget. I mean, it's not just this one. We've got the rewiring the nation. Um, we've got the housing um, fund, which um, surprisingly seems to have disappeared off a notice paper and doesn't seem to be the subject of, uh, of the, uh, the hours motion that is uh, sitting on our tables to consider later this afternoon. That one seems to have disagreed, but disappeared. But you know, we have got tens of billions of dollars being hidden off balance sheet. And of course, we all know that it doesn't matter whether it's on the government's balance sheet or whether it's off the government's balance sheet. Um, expenditure that is not designed appropriately and is not designed around the productivity um, uh, outcomes that need to be associated with that expenditure, they become inflationary. So we have a fund here that this government has not paid any attention whatsoever to the inflationary um, impact of it. And because it is off balance sheet and it and it relies um, around other market aspects the, in terms of the, the functioning of the broader, the broader market, it becomes really uncertain about what actually is able to be spent. Um, it also avoids proper and robust process and proper and robust scrutiny. Um, you know, when you're spending this kind of money of Australian taxpayers, um, you really do need to make sure that you have got a proper competitive process. You're not just running around picking winners for the people and the mates that you like and the sectors that you, you know, uh, maybe are unionised. Who would know? Um, but you know, you can't do that because Australian taxpayers have got the right to know 
that when you put these kind of things together, that they have got this absolute maximum level of strength of governance around them, because it's their money you're spending. Because the one thing that we need to remember in this place, and I never forgot when I was in government, not one cent of the money that I had responsibility for the administration of was my money. Every single cent of that money that I was administering on behalf of the department that I had responsibility for belonged to the taxpayers of Australia, and those opposite would do well to remember that. And, and the other thing is, um, what is the, the dodgy deals um, that have been done with uh, the people in this place that have been necessary to be able to get this bill through this place. And um, I'll go back to another fantastic um, primary industry that has great um, advanced manufacturing opportunities in this country, and that is the forestry sector. Um, what is the deal that has been done with the Greens to enable them to agree um, to this? Because I have to say, you know, when uh, when this was uh, first put out there um, during the election. Um, the Prime Minister um, at the time, who was the opposition leader, claimed that um, forestry at the heart of his manufacturing policy. Um, so where's that gone? I promise you that if I become Prime Minister, a government that I lead will not shut down native forestry industry. Is that still absolutely a promise? And I'll take up the fight to protect your job too. Um, so. It is going to be really interesting you know, when we actually see um, the deals that have come out of this. But you know, it, your own previous minister for um, agriculture in a previous Labor government, um, you know, somebody who I think had probably more integrity in him than, than just about anybody um, who sits on the other side of this chamber, Joel Fitzgibbon, um, still an absolute supporter um, of the forestry sector. Um, the opportunity that it provides for Australia, because we do have some of the best landscape in order um, to uh, develop a, a forestry sector. Um, and we all know that, you know, guess what? Forestry is the ultimate renewable. Um, and we have got an opportunity in Australia um, to have one of the greatest forestry sectors because we have the ability to, um, to harvest and replant and make sure that we are managing our forests in a way, because we have some of the best forestry management in the world. We're recognised worldwide as having some of the greatest forestry management. Um, and, and also, you know, for those who don't um, particularly like um, forestry, have a look in your own house and have a look at some of the things that you rely on for some of the fabulous hardwood timbers that are grown in this country, in this country as we, uh, we sit here today. But, you know, overall, um, I suppose the greatest disappointment as we, we stand here today um, is the fact that, you know, once again, we see bills that were promised come in in a form that have obviously been um, mangled in order to get a deal. Um, we've seen promises broken as we have seen the promise to the forestry sector broken by the actions and the changes of this government. You know, hand on heart, I will not touch your forestry sector. But anyway, that's all fine to say that before the election because you don't want to lose the votes in Tasmania or in other areas that rely so heavily on forestry in Australia. But all bets are off as soon as you've uh, won the election. You don't seem to care. And it seems to be a track record so far in just about everything. I mean, who could uh, forget the broken promise of you know, $275 for your power bills going down? I mean, that has got to go down in history as you know, there will be no carbon tax under the government that I lead. Uh, this government's uh, carbon tax promise, because you know what? I reckon uh, there would not be a person, a business, or anybody in the manufacturing sector in Australia who could honestly tell you that their power bills have gone down since this government has come to office. But it's not just the energy bills that are impacting. We have seen so many broken promises in so many places to so many Australians. In my sector, uh, that I have responsibility as the shadow minister for both health and aged care. The litany of broken promises almost um, you know, are, are too many to recall and recount um, here. But a couple of the really, really serious ones, the promises to Australians that they were going to put the care back into aged care. They were going to put 24-7 nurses into nursing homes. Now, there is nobody on my side of politics that doesn't want to see older Australians get the care that they deserve and the support that they deserve. Uh, as they age. But you can't go out and make promises just to get yourself elected and then, once you're elected, try and double down on them even though you do not have the capacity to be able to deliver them because there simply aren't any nurses to fill your 
nursing commitment, then I think that is absolutely irresponsible, and then you absolutely create um, the kind of distress and uncertainty in a, such an important sector, one that's just come through the COVID pandemic under extraordinary pressure, but you don't seem to care about that. The other one is um, you know, we were very proud in, when we were in government for our track record um, because we believe that the pharmaceutical benefit scheme is one of the absolute core pillars of our health system. Being able to provide Australians with timely access to affordable medicines is something that we thought was absolutely an essential part of our health system, and that's why we prioritised it. So during our time in government, um, we moved to make sure that we listed every medicine that was, uh, was recommended by the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory um, Committee so that Australians could get access to that. What do we find right now, only a matter of months into this government? We have seen, first of all, um, the delisting um, of the pharmaceutical benefits scheme um, of a life-changing insulin drug um, for diabetics called Fiasp. Um, we saw the minister do a sort of a semi-backflip last week uh, when he agreed that he would actually continue the prescribing of it for those people that are already on it for another few months but then had the audacity to double down at the Pharmacy Guild conference last week and say, well, actually, it wasn't his fault because he, he hadn't actually had a request for ministerial um, intervention in this. I mean, like, really, these people have been talking to you for about nine months, Minister, asking for you to consider using your ability to be able to stop the absolute drastic price reduction that has been forced onto it by a mechanism. That's why you had the ministerial discretion in the first place, is because we knew that there would always be circumstances where there was an innovative component to a drug that wasn't based on the molecule that it was based on that would mean that it was going to be something that was really superior. This drug, Fiasp, is a superior drug, and we know that 15,000 um, Australians who rely on it, um, whilst they would have been chucked off it in a couple of days' time, they've now at least got it till the end of September. But what happens then? I mean, really, Minister, this is a very lazy way um, of addressing this, and we would call on you to actually honour the commitment of this chamber, um, where this chamber actually agreed and passed legislation um, that actually included an amendment that said that you would relist this on a permanent basis. So, um, so actually honour the promise and actually honour and respect the decision of this chamber and relist that medicine on a permanent basis. The other one is, you know, PBAC actually approved. Um, a drug called Trikafta for children between age between um, six and 12 who are um, sufferers of cystic fibrosis. Um, we found out a few weeks ago um, that the government had decided that it wasn't going to list it on the PBS. Um, if I do detect a little bit of a tone yesterday when asked in the chamber about this, um, Senator Farrell, um, speaking off the speaking notes that he was handed at the last minute, did seem to indicate that there were some ongoing discussions to see how this drug could be uh, listed as soon as possible, whatever that means. But you know, to have a government that only months into its reign is already taking life-changing drugs off the PBS and refusing to list drugs, drugs for, for six to 12-year-olds who suffer from cystic fibrosis, I mean, is an absolute tragic indictment of your inability to be able to manage a really, really important um, health system and the PBS. And the fact is that we knew that last time you were in government, by your own admission, on the public record, your health minister in the previous government, the Gillard Rudd uh, government, actually admitted that you had stopped listing medicines on the PBS because you couldn't afford to do so. Now, right now, we are, as I said, only a matter of months into this reign of this particular Labor government, and already we are seeing drugs taken off the PBS and a minister refusing to actually intervene, a minister actually seeking almost to mislead on when he found out about this problem, because we know that the company has been speaking to his office now for months and months, and yet he says he only found out a few weeks ago. And we've had a life-changing drug taken Your off time for has young expired. people. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I uh, rise to oppose this bill because it will do nothing to halt the deindustrialisation of this once proud manufacturing uh, nation. Uh, a deindustrialisation that's been happening at pace before our eyes uh, over the past decade. We produce less 
uh, manufacturing or fewer manufacturing goods than we did in the previous decade, the first time that's ever happened on record. Uh, we have uh, we no longer now produce enough steel for our own domestic needs, despite being the world's largest producer of the main components that go into making steel, coking coal and iron ore. Uh, later this year, uh, tragically, our, our last uh, major fertiliser plant, or at least a plant that produces urea, the most important fertiliser used in farming, it will shut later this year. Uh, so just after Christmas this year, we will be completely reliant uh, on other countries uh, to grow our food. And effectively, about half of Australian food production requires the use of urea, uh, and we will no longer make it in this nation. Again, even though the feedstock for urea uh, is natural gas, <laughs> we've got heaps of that. Uh, we're the world's largest exporter of liquid, liquefied natural gas, but we will no longer manufacture the important product of urea. Not to mention our blue too, that most people have become aware of, given the crisis we had there about a year ago. Uh, you need a urea to make ad blue uh, for the trucking industry too. So it's not it's not a good news story uh, for manufacturing, and we really do need radical action. To rectify that, I'll put on record at the start of this contribution that I, I don't think the former coalition government took this issue seriously enough and did not take sufficient enough action to try and turn things around. Uh, the main reason for the decline in our manufacturing industry, or I put two factors to it, is energy prices. We've heard uh, previously there manufacturers are paying more than double for electricity and 50 per cent higher for gas, and that, that's actually before the Ukraine crisis, uh, those figures. And that has killed uh, competitive manufacturing in this country, given that our labour costs are high. Uh, we just simply cannot compete if our energy costs are high too. Uh, we have to have make a choice. If we want to have dear wages, which I think we all do, and uh, it's a good thing that people get paid well in this country, if we want to have dear wages, we have to have cheap power prices. If we don't have cheap power prices, if we have dear wages and dear power prices, we'll end up with no jobs. And that's what's been happening in the manufacturing industry, with 300,000 manufacturing jobs lost over the past few decades, a pace that has been increasing. The other big factor that goes into this decline uh, is the uh, complete free ride we have given to the Chinese Communist Party on, the en on their entry into the World Trade Organisation. When they entered the World Trade Organisation over, just over 20 years ago, in 2001, they made commitments uh, to the world that they would become more transparent in the subsidies, they would remove massive energy subsidies from their industries, and they have done nothing. They've actually doubled down on those over the last two decades. Yet we sit back and seemingly take no action uh, against this complete abuse of the international trading system. And there's no, no surprise, or should be no surprise, then when they steal our jobs. They steal our jobs. Why do we now import 50 per cent of our steel needs? Uh, that wasn't the case 20 years ago. We had steel plants. We had enough steel plants to produce enough steel for Australia. Now we only have two steel mills left, and we import around about half our steel needs from overseas, mainly from China. Why does that happen? How can China compete against us? We're, we send them the coke and coal and the iron ore from here all the way, all the way through the Micah Straits to China. They, they turn and steel is not a particularly labour-intensive uh, process. They turn that into steel and then we import it back from them. We import it back from them. Why can they do that? Because they massively subsidise their own energy industry. On some measures put forward by unions in the United States, uh, uh, on some measures, the energy subsidies to, to the Chinese steel manufacturing approach 60 and 70 per cent of their production costs subsidised by the Chinese government. Why do we not take action against this? Why do we sit back and let this happen? Uh, uh, we should uh, be taking more action against that, and I'll have more to say about that uh, towards the end of my contribution. I did want to go to this bill, though, because this has a problem, and uh, because of that problem around declining manufacturing, I'd be I'd be keen to support things that would help, but this bill won't do that. This bill won't do that at all, because there is a smoke and mirrors financial trickery going on by the government here on this bill. They say the headline here is that this will be a $15 billion national reconstruction fund to help do, and the minister says it's going to build a fertiliser plant. Apparently, it's going to do all these things, all these promises. But let's look into the actual numbers here in the detail. And this is what has cost us in industry policy and manufacturing policy for decades. There is far too much focus on headline uh, BS, if I can say that, absolute rubbish uh, in headlines that sound good, $15 billion here, uh, $1.5 billion there. And when you look into the detail, it doesn't add up to much at all. Because what this fund will be, it won't actually be direct grants to build uh, a urea plant or anything like that. It will simply be a loan facility the government will allow, or an equity injection, they'll, they'll, they'll 
they'll take investments into manufacturing through this $15 billion fund. And obviously, like anybody making an investment, you expect a return on that investment, you expect a return of the capital and with interest, as the government will do, uh, from this fund. So it's not, it's, not, it's not a free kick for the, the manufacturing industry. Let's look at what the actual benefit will be from $15 billion of loans or equity. Well, currently the 10-year government bond rate is, is, uh, is, is uh, 3.3 per cent. Uh, at the moment, it's fallen a little bit in uh, the last couple of months, uh, but 3.3 per cent. Even if the government only required that return, and typically in other funds they've required a little bit more to, to have some adjustment for risk, but let's be fair, and I'll be very generous to the government and say that the, they'll, they'll lend out at roughly the 10-year bond rate of 3.3 per cent. Well, that would mean that, would mean that um, the interest on $15 billion that the manufacturing industry would have to pay would be $484 million uh, a year. How much would that save them? Well, they could go to the market, of course, and borrow money. And the triple B interest rate, which roughly would be a lot of these manufacturing companies, would be rated around that. Triple B interest rate is currently 6.5 per cent. And that their interest bill on, on $15 billion a year would be uh, just shy of a billion dollars, $984 million. So $484 million if the government lends the money and $984 million if they, lend, if they uh, borrowed from the market, it's, it's $500 million a year. And for an industry that invests, the manufacturing industry, despite our deindustrialisation, actually invests uh, uh, nor needs investment of capital expenditure of $10 billion a year, this is not a big saving. It's not going to do much. $500 million is not going to do much. And in fact, it's actually less than the $1.5 billion the former coalition government put aside that this government's uh, scrapped in to replace this, this amount. So we've got to drop this rubbish, this, as I say, this media, um, industry policy by media release, where we think we put out a media release and it's going to make a difference because the number looks big on that. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a perverse episode of utopia here where people think, oh, let's just put a big figure on a whiteboard and that will solve all the issues. It's not going to do that. It is not going to rekindle an era of industrialisation in this nation based on the very figures, those very clear uh, figures alone. Uh, we have to get serious if we, if we want to rebuild manufacturing in this country, so I don't want to support a lame attempt uh, to distract from the real issues that face manu Australian manufacturers. Uh, I think doing so would, uh, would, be, uh, would cause uh, uh, to give false hope to the manufacturing industry and also mean that the, the bureaucrats here and, and the government more broadly would just put their pens and say, oh, it's all done. We've passed a reconstruction fund. Our work here is done, and uh, we don't have to actually tackle the real issues that face Australian manufacturing, fix those uh, and, and, uh, and through that actually uh, make sure that we rekindle investment. We did have a serious look at this in the Nationals Party a few years ago uh, during the COVID crisis. Do you remember we were going we to make things again after COVID? Do you remember all that? Do you remember we were uh, going to become a, we didn't want to become reliant. We didn't want to be reliant on China and all this stuff. And we're going to make things. So we thought, okay, well let's let's have a serious attempt at making a contributions debate of becoming a manufacturing country again. So we produced a nine-point plan uh, from the Nationals Party on this uh, to do this. We spoke to lots of people in the industry. So we didn't have any particular uh, uh, sacred cows around trade policy or or energy policy. We just wanted the best for Australian manufacturers and. Um, as I said, I, I think if we were serious here in the Nationals Party, we ticked off on this saying that if we're serious, we need to take action against China for its illegal uh, trade policy actions. Uh, and these are, these are not just the actions they've taken against Australian exporters in the last few years post-COVID. As I mentioned, these are the massive energy subsidies uh, that they get away with blue murder through trade policy, and we take no action. Uh, we can, under WTO rules, uh, institute a proper inquiry into Chinese energy subsidies to their manufacturing industries. And if that study came back that those subsidies were against WTO rules, which almost certainly they would, uh, uh, would be, uh, then we could take what is called countervailing action against them and protect our own industries. Why don't we do that? Why don't we stand up for Australian jobs uh, and, and put an end uh, to the abuse uh, that China has engaged in on manufacturing for the last couple of decades. It's obviously not just affecting our nation. Those jobs are stolen from all over the Western world. And we now have a situation where almost the entire renewable energy supply chain is controlled by China. Uh, uh, and, and we're constantly told we've got to transition to these new energy types, but all their solar panels, their wind turbines, the rare earths uh, uh, that go into so many uh, renewable energy uh, technologies, batteries, are all, all made now lithium processing. All, all come through through China again, thanks to these subsidies. We have to take action against this. And as I say, the Nationals Party, we were putting aside 
yes, possibly decades of perceived wisdom about free trade, but it is not free trade when another nation does not abide by the rules, which China has not been doing. Um, we also need to recognise that uh, a rekindling, a reindustrialisation of Australia is not going to come through government investment. As I went through the figures before, the $15 billion here doesn't mean $15 billion, it's a few hundred million. It's not enough. It's not enough. As I said, we're about $10 billion a year is invested in manufacturing today, and that's in a climate where we're declining. Uh, our, our manufacturing is declining. We need more than $10 billion a year. We probably need to double that if we're serious about regrowing Australian manufacturing. It's just not going to come from Canberra. We, are, we do not have $10 billion a year here uh, to put into manufacturing. Thank you, Senator. Uh, you are in continuous with your contribution. Uh, we will now proceed to two-minute statements, and I give you the call, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much. Social media has played a significant role in shaping and influencing our world, especially in the last decade. TikTok is a large social media conglomerate that has recently been under fire for good reason. Uh, TikTok got a real boost during COVID lockdowns and has been widely adopted mostly by teenagers and young adults. Uh, approximately 7 million Australians now use the platform. It is posing a new threat, however, that we have not seen from a social media platform yet. TikTok is owned by a Chinese company, ByteDance, which is headquartered in Beijing. If any of those opposite are unaware, the CCP is frequently putting displays of aggression towards Taiwan and constantly exploiting its economic power to coerce and interfere in sovereign countries. And the CCP's national intelligence law came into effect in July 2017. This law requires Chinese citizens and entities to provide full cooperation with CCP intelligence agencies and keep it secret. The US, UK and New Zealand governments have taken action by restricting the use of the platform and there's now a push to ban the app right across the US. There are genuine concerns with the amount of data that the app can access on your phone, uh, possibly even your location, and I seriously urge caution to TikTok users. Delete the app, possibly, is the only way that you can possibly uh, prevent uh, access to your data. And uh, I recommend, uh, I commend, I should say, my colleague, uh, Senator Patterson, for the work that he's doing as the Shadow Minister for Cybersecurity to raise awareness on this issue, a very, very important issue. You can't take national security too seriously. Uh, this is a very important issue, and I urge the Australian government to act as promptly and as, uh, as, as thoroughly as they possibly can. Thank you. Senator Walsh, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, and I rise to speak on the choice that the people of Aston have this Saturday. Mary Doyle has spent her career fighting for working people, and I know she would be an incredible addition to this parliament. And can I note just how grateful we are in Victoria to have had the Honourable Leader of the Opposition visit four times ahead of the by-election? Because there is no better campaigner for Labor in the seat of Aston than Mr Dutton, known friend of my home state. His record indeed is very well known the leader who likes to refer to female journalists as mad witches, the leader who, when Minister for Health, was voted the worst in 40 years. We welcome him to Victoria, and we welcome him to metropolitan Melbourne in particular, where the Liberals hold just three seats in a region home to 5.2 million people. I was honestly surprised to see the Leader of the Opposition out and about so much, given his known phobia of my home state. After all, this is the member who said we were too scared to go out to restaurants at night. I certainly hope he's not missing out on some of the quality food in Bayswater and Roeville uh, because he's eating in his hotel room in fear instead. I know Mary Doyle and the people of Aston see Mr Dutton's disdain for our state and our community, a leader who is always angry, always negative, always against the policies that the country needs. This is the leader of the Noalition that continues to vote against Australian manufacturing, against lower power bills, against secure jobs. The people of Aston deserve a member with a positive plan for a brighter future, and I wish Mary all the best. 
Thank you, Senator. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I want to talk today to a petition entitled Bring Back Nurses, Physios and Allied Health in Aged Care Homes. Stop Taking Our Jobs. This petition on change.org has reached over 20,000 signatures. Support for allied health care is something that I've focused on in my time as the Greens aged care spokesperson. I recognise that Labor has taken important, significant steps to improve and support the aged care sector, and we welcome that. However, there is so much more that needs to be done. And in the same way that we have with climate, we've shown the value of having Greens in Parliament that can be pushing the government to go further and faster to deliver what's really needed. A critical area in aged care is support for allied health care. And sadly, we have heard too many stories of people missing out as funding models have changed and providers have cut jobs, hurting residents. One story shared on the petition said, my dad had care from physios when he was in an aged care centre 10 years ago. Every resident should have the benefit of physiotherapy to help with their mobility. I'm certain that Australians expect a high level of care, not limited hours for enrolled nurses and others, and we all want the recommendations of the Royal Commission introduced and adhered to. So the Greens believe that the government should start by providing additional funding to the sector. There has been some additional funding, but more is needed. People who need physios should be able to access that physio support. We are still short of the benchmark that's required for the sector that the sector is calling for. We need to see additional funding. We need to see mandated minimum levels of care and reporting about how much physio and other allied health services residents in aged care homes and in home care are actually receiving. We need to see an end to restrictive practices. Overall, we need to see better support for residents through allied health and other methods. Thank you, Senator. Senator Davey, you have the call. Thank you very much. Today, I'd like to acknowledge the great work that the Australian Rural Leadership Foundation does and has been doing over the last 30 years, established to help promote, guide and uh, encourage leadership in rural and regional uh, Australia. Uh, they've done excellent work with both short course programs and longer term uh, scholarships. I particularly want to talk about a new, uh, develop, a new leadership program that they've developed in conjunction with the Regional Australia Institute, the Leading Australian Resilient Communities Program. Just recently it brought together 20 people from across the rivers to Plains region of northeastern Victoria and southern New South Wales for a five-day leadership program. They graduated in Rutherglen, Victoria last month, and I congratulate, congratulate each and every one of them. Together, they worked on developing leadership skills, building networks to share their knowledge, sharing expertise and contacts so that they can all go home and make an impact in their regions. The four groups that came together presented their community projects to stakeholders, supporters me and media at the graduation with projects focusing on digital connectivity, addressing mental health concerns amongst youth, youth engagement in life skills and food security in the event of natural disasters. The benefits of these programs cannot be overstated. They are a win for regional people and they are a win for regional areas. The rural um, and regional Australia needs strong leaders, and the Foundation has over 2,000 members of their alumni spread right throughout Australia, providing valuable and broad resource expertise and capacity to lead and inspire into the future. Thank you, Senator. Senator Grogan, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I wish to rise and speak to the inquiry into Australia's human rights framework which was referred to the Joint Standing Committee of Human Rights by the Attorney-General earlier this month. In my role as a member of that Human Rights Committee, I am delighted that we are reviewing how our human rights inform our legislative process. I am proud to sit on this committee alongside my Labor colleague and chair, the member for McNamara, who has advocated so strongly for this review. Human rights are a central part of our society and help us effectively maintain social cohesion. All people are entitled to respect and opportunity and to participate in the social, cultural and economic life of our nation, free of any hatred or harassment. 
Labor is committed to defending the principles enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, both at home and abroad. This commitment is central to what Labor stands for and what we have always stood for. To advance this commitment, in 2008 the Federal Labor Government conducted a nationwide consultation to consider whether human rights were sufficiently protected and promoted in Australia. In 2009, the National Human Rights Consultation Report made 31 recommendations, including a whole-of-government framework for human rights and the establishment of the Joint Committee on Human Rights. This year, the Albanese Government has committed to reviewing the effectiveness of this framework through the scrutiny process of the Human Rights Committee. This government takes protecting human rights very seriously and understands how important upholding those rights are through transparent governance. Unlike those opposite who have continually compromised the rights of Australians through disastrous policies over the last nine years. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Senator Cox, you have the call. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I want to talk about sea country and how important that is to First Nations underwater cultural heritage that needs to be protected. Recently, the Joint Select Committee on Treaties examined the UN Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage and supported the ratification of this convention. First Nations people have been on this country for 65,000 years and we've lived through significant changes in water levels. This means a lot of our cultural heritage is now underwater and indeed some of it has always been underwater and rising sea levels will mean more sites will be submerged. Further, much of this cultural heritage is intangible, so our current methods of identifying underwater cultural heritage applies to shipwrecks and planes and in fact does not apply to our underwater cultural heritage. One of the recommendations of the Jukun report was that Australia ratify the UN Convention for the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage. And the government has committed to this recommendation, but we do not yet have a timeline. This must be a priority for the government if they are actually serious about protecting and preventing further incidences of damaging and destroying our cultural heritage. Only one out of 8,000 cultural heritage sites are listed as underwater in Australia and protects it under First Nations cultural, underwater cultural heritage protection, and that is the Brewarrina fish traps. This is absolutely shameful. This is our culture. These are our ancestors, our story and our connection, and this is why we fight so hard to protect it. And we need a government that is taking that seriously and making a commitment as soon as possible. Senator Cox. Senator Rennick. Uh, why has the Queensland Health Government withdrawn funding for its award-winning COVAX research program studying the safety and efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccines? This program is the creation of 27 highly skilled researchers, health professionals and administrative staff. They were supported by multiple partners, including 12 health service agencies, five universities and two private pathology services. COVAX was strongly supported by Queenslanders, rapidly enrolling more than 10,000 participants, both vaccinated and unvaccinated, from 85 per cent of postcodes across the state. Countries like Australia are uniquely placed to investigate vaccine efficacy because their diverse population was, until late in the pandemic, relatively free of the COVID-19 virus. The COVAX team didn't just collect the standard data. Participants provided information on environmental and social determinants of health and biospecimens of blood and saliva that have been used to derive genomic, transcriptomic and proteomic data sets that will shed light on how the novel vaccines impact the immune system. Studying immune response is a vital part of assessing vaccines, and Quovax work is consistent with similar studies completed on other vaccines. That the research, uh, on other vaccines. The research is particularly important because two new vaccine delivery platforms were used, modified messenger RNA and vector DNA. It is particularly important because the original trials of these vaccines were meant to last two years, but the placebo group was vaccinated only after two months. The study and the biobank have enormous international significance. Yet instead of answering vital questions about why Australia, one of the most highly vaccinated countries in the world, had such high excess mortality and so many cases of long COVID in vaccinated people, the study is being forced to close down. 
All Australians deserve answers to the questions these vaccines Senator have raised. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Polly. I rise to speak about children's television industry in Australia, the amazing work they do and the need to support Australian content and stories. Australia has so much to be proud of when we consider children's television. Amazing production showcasing amazing writers, animators, directors and actors. Bluey, Kangaroo Beach, Itch, Scouts Honour, The Wishmas Tree and My Seven Life. My, my year seven life. I'm amazing how much local talent that we have. All the ama amazing locally made shows. I attended the Parliamentary Friends of Australian Children's Storytelling this week, celebrating Australian content of children's television shows and ensuring Australian content is seen at home and around the world. The industry has had a tough time in the last 18 months as many industries have and most Australians. What this industry needs, above all else, is a government that is supportive of its right to create Australian content for Australian kids so their content can flourish in Australia and elsewhere. The Albanese government supports Australian content, understands children and Australian kids deserve to see Australian content on our screens. I grew up watching Australian content on television screens. Now the next generation should not be robbed of this opportunity. A commitment to Australian content quota is good policy. I've spoken several times in this place about media and Australian content and how important it is to our way of life. What we cannot overestimate is the amount of economic benefit that's brought to local regional areas in my home state of Tasmania and in fact around the country. We are world leaders. We produce some of the best children's television there is around the globe, but we should also be allowing our children to listen Your to our accents. Expired. Senator McKim. Two sitting weeks ago, it was my pleasure to join colleagues to launch the Parliamentary Friends of Hazara Group. I'm honoured to be a co-chair of this group, along with Mr Andrew Charlton and Ms Kylie Tink from the other place. And I look forward to working with them and all members of the Parliamentary Friends of Hazara to raise issues of concern to Hazara people and to magnify Hazara voices in this place. The Hazara have faced many generations of religious and ethnic persecution, the seizure of lands, enslavement and genocide in their beautiful home region of Hazaristan in central Afghanistan. And about one in four Hazara have been forced to flee their homelands and they are now scattered in a great diaspora around the world, uh, including 60,000 who now call Australia home and who enrich our community and contribute massively to our country. But persecution is not what defines Hazara people. They are a culture of musicians, poets and artisans inspired by a rich oral history and a connection to place. Since the fall of Kabul to the Taliban, the persecution of Hazara in Afghanistan has ramped up again. Now is not the time for Australia to turn its back on Hazara people. But the Labor government has quietly abandoned the processing of refugee applications for potentially thousands of Hazara people trapped in Afghanistan, many of whom have family here in Australia. As a leading immigration lawyer recently told SBS News, Labor is wiping its hands off the Afghan problem. And make no mistake, this is an abrogation that will cost lives, including Hazara lives. I commend the group to the Senate and look forward to working to raise the voices of Hazara Thank people you, in this Your place. Your time has expired. Senator Narapinja Price. I rise today to acknowledge Ian Quinn, affectionately known as Quinny by those of us lucky enough to have known him. Quinny was a proud Australian and a good man. He sadly passed away earlier this month at 76. Quinny, originally from Swanburne in Perth, lived the life of an adventurer, described by his family as reading like an Indiana Jones movie script, travelling the world and really living in history. It was a wild ride and a story that only he could tell. With only two minutes, I could barely scratch the surface. But it was a good life that led him to his wife, too, in Bangkok, 
and then brought them together to the Northern Territory in 1992. In the Territory, he bought five acres at Howard Springs, expanded his property and then bought five more at Berry Springs. Quinney continued to expand and set up Two's Garden, a 400-hectare mango farm at Acacia Gap, 45 minutes south of Darwin, with 65,000 mango trees processing more than three million pieces of fruit just last year. But the mango farm, though an incredible achievement of Quinney and Two and a major contribution to the country, is not the only thing Quinney will be remembered for. Quinney will first and foremost be remembered as a loving husband, father, grandfather and friend. He'll be remembered for his commitment to family, for the friendship, love and commitment he offered. He'll be remembered for the things he loved and the impact he had as a surfy, a crayfish hunter, a self-described scuba dive junkie, a farmer and, above all, in my mind, a really good mate. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Demonising those who question the left's radical gender ideology can have severe consequences. The lies and misinformation about the motivations of conservative parties, Christian organisations and women's rights groups who have challenged the left on their gender politics is leading to hate and violence. We have seen it here in Australia where peaceful pro-women events are being disrupted by aggressive counter-protesters looking for a fight. We even saw a radical, racist Australian senator charge the podium of a peaceful gathering here in Canberra. There is no doubt this hatefulness contributed to the violent attack in New Zealand on a peaceful women's rights event. These lies increase the chance that very unwell people, obsessed with gender ideology and confused about their own identity, will commit violent acts as a way of retaliating against those they perceive as their oppressors. Senator. We have seen this in Australia and New Zealand, and now with deadly consequences in the USA. A 28-year-old female has committed a mass shooting targeting teachers and children. At least six deaths have been confirmed. The alleged shooter apparently self-identified as a man. The extreme left say this sort of person needs compassion and gender-affirming care to reinforce their delusions. These hateful attacks against concerned conservatives and Christians and women's rights need to stop before we see more innocent people die. To ask a question or to seek an inquiry is an act of compassion, not prejudice. Let's stop the lies and hate and start asking questions so we can develop solutions that will work and help people in Thank need. Thank you. Your time has expired. Senator Stilljohn. Yeah. Trans rights are human rights. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the trans community is a wonderful, yep. vibrant yep. community that should be celebrated here in Australia. And it enrages me that Order. it is even Order. Senator something. Still John, just reminding all senators, it is disorderly to interject, and it's not helpful when you're interjecting, and then the senator has to yell. So I remind everyone of the standing order. Senator Stilljoy, please continue. It enrages me beyond almost my ability to articulate that in 2023, the basic human rights of trans people still need to be asserted and reasserted and defended against those who would undermine them, on those that would erase them, on those that would block them out of our community. Now, in the week when the community was preparing for the uh, day of trans visibility in Australia, now this effort by those who would raise the trans community took a very, very serious turn as a notorious international transphobe toward this nation, and many in this place sat and said nothing. In fact, some cheered them on. Some organised and facilitated the rallies, the organised gatherings. Shame. 
Well, while many in the community, many in the community organised to push back, to stare these bigots down and to proclaim that in Australia love is love is love and that the trans community should be celebrated. And with strength and unity, this community ensured that every single place this vile excuse for a human being and their supporters raised their head, they were pushed back upon. And I am so glad to say that they were sent packing in New Zealand. The Greens will always fully and unwaveringly back the trans community because trans human rights are non-negotiable. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. I have a Senator payment. Deputy President. Over the weekend in New South Wales, we saw yet another example of how Australians have had enough of Liberal governments. They have had enough of the excuses, the scandals, the boring talking points and the deliberate attempts to divide us as a nation over issues that should unite us. Now, it is probably not the best idea for me to be giving pointers to those opposite on how to connect with everyday Australians, but even after only 10 months in government watching my incredible Labor, uh, Labor colleagues, I think there is one attribute that stands out. Australians want their elected representatives to be honest about the challenges we are facing, but also show a pathway to a better future. And that is exactly what the Albanese government is doing by taking real action on climate change, getting wages moving again, fee-free TAFE, um, to create skilled workforce for the future and tackling the cost of living with cheaper medicine and early childhood education. Now, luckily, with the upcoming referenda to establish an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to parliament, there is an opportunity for everyone, regardless of political party, to show Australians that they are open to change, that they are ready to restore justice and walk hand in hand with First Nations people on our journey towards healing and reconciliation. We are proud to support the Uluru Statement, Voice, Truth and Treaty. I call on Peter Dutton to get off the fence and support the voice, because this should be above politics. A huge congratulations to Chris Minns, New South Wales Labor and all the incredible Labor volunteers who have made this possible. We wouldn't be here without you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I'll just remind you that you need to refer to people from the other place with their correct title. Senator Hume. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I rise to draw the attention of the Chamber to information recently published on a candidate that the Greens and Labor are supporting at the Aston by-election. I am deeply concerned by these reports because if they are true, then on Saturday Labor and the Greens will ask the voters of Aston to put their preferences to a candidate who has advocated for murdering infants, who has defended terrorists and who says the Unabomber did nothing wrong. Oh. Mr Owen Miller is the Fusion Party candidate at the Aston by-election, and today, as pre-poll is being conducted in that seat, the Labor Party and the Greens have preference. Mr Miller, third on their How to Vote cards. They have decided that Rashina Campbell, an accomplished lawyer and representing small and local businesses, an elected city councillor, is a less worthy choice than this man. Today, the Labor Party and the Greens have revealed what they really think of the people of Aston. They are political fodder, preference generators, Shame. who should be treated with order. less respect than choosing their next representative. This candidate, this candidate, preferenced by Labor and the Greens, should be condemned for his yeah. appalling views, and Labor and the Greens can condemn those views today. For example, the candidate, preferenced by Labor and the Greens, said in a tweet that I think abortion is murder, but it should be legal anyway, even months after birth. Sad but realistic. He supported that opinion. He supported that opinion, the, the opinion that terrorists were right. He said that their motives are justifiable. He preferenced, pre the man preferenced by Labor and the Greens has written an article saying what the Unabomber got right that to consider the Unabomber a crazy person is intellectually dishonest. He has also said 
that he believes he agrees with the Unabomber that many modern humans lead meaningless lives. The level of disrespect that this candidate has shown for human life is only matched by the level of disrespect that Labor and the Greens show for the people of Aston. Take this Thank man you, off Senator, your how to vote cards. Preference him last. Expired. Senator Pocock, D David. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to report that my community has lost another general practice. Last week, Hobart Place General Practice announced it would be closing its doors. This practice is less than four kilometres from this chamber, an eight-minute drive. Uh, it's quite literally in the backyard of this building, and this is a practice that has been serving our community, uh, and many of them feel like they have nowhere else to go. They are supporting a large number of people living with drug dependency who cannot afford gap fees and cannot afford public transport to outer areas. We already have an enormously, extremely low proportion of GPs per capita, one of the lowest in the nation, uh, one GP for every thousand people, compared to places like Queensland and New South Wales that have 12 per thousand in Queensland and New South Wales. Uh, there's a lot of work to do in this place, and I urge the government to focus on primary care. Thank you, Senator Pocock. The time has expired. Senator McDonald, we'll move to question time. Senator McDonald. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Does Australia need to increase gas production to meet export and domestic demand while lowering gas prices? Thank you, Senator McDonald. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank, um, thank the Senator for her question and her interest uh, in this uh, topic, of course. <clears throat> um, the important thing, I think, about um, particularly the, the safeguards bill, but the issue of ongoing uh, supply, of, uh, uh, supply of gas is that <clears throat> we are moving to transition out of uh, fossil fuels and into um, uh, renewable uh, fuels. In fact, uh, you'll have heard the Prime Minister say this week that he wants Australia to be a uh, renewable superpower, a renewable energy superpower. Um, Minister the Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. On relevance, I had specifically asked about whether or not Australia needs to increase its gas production. Uh, yes, thank you. I will um, direct the minister to your question. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, um, <coughs> pre uh, President. Um, um, so the, the, the really difficult thing here, um, Senator, uh, is that <coughs> you've got to ensure there's ongoing investment uh, in gas production, particularly in this, uh, in this country. Uh, while, while, while you do that transition uh, to renewables. Now, what, what might that transition look like? Well, it might be hydrogen. As you know, the South Australian government is, um, the South Australian government is uh, uh, leading Minister the way. Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Macdonald. President, I don't have much time. Specifically on relevance, does Australia need to increase its gas production? Uh, thank you, Senator Macdonald. The minister is being relevant to your question. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, um, President. And if you could just let me um, finish what I'm uh, talking. Well, it's an, uh, you might call it uh, waffle, but it's an important, it's an important, it's an important issue because to <clears throat> to get that transition. Uh, from uh, fossil fuel to uh, renewable fuel, we have to ensure that there's continued investment in coal and gas. And it's the it's the it's the objective it's the objective of this government to ensure that we. Um Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Macdonald, first supplementary. I'm going to have another go. By how much does Australia need to increase gas production to meet export and domestic demand while lowering gas prices? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, <coughs> thank you President, and uh, thank, uh, uh, thank the Senator for her uh, first uh, supplementary uh, question. Um, of course, between um, 2014 and 2021, uh, East Coast uh, gas production increased by 300 uh, per cent. 
Um, and that's, of course, um, despite problems like uh, access to the uh, Narrabri uh, gas, uh, gas supplies. Despite um, supply going up significantly, the prices paid by Australian households and Australian industry also went up by 420 per cent in real terms. <clears throat> yeah, 420 per cent, uh, Senator Pratt, over that uh, same period of time. The former, the former government, <coughs> that's the government that you were... <coughs> uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Macdonald. President, on relevance, what is the uh, increase that is required? Um, the minister is addressing your question. Uh, I'll refer him to the latter part of your question, which was about prices. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, <coughs> thank you President. Um, now the former government was warned on at least a dozen. Well, you can't, you can't, you can't understand. Thank you, Minister. The, the time for answering has expired. Senator Macdonald, second supplementary. Given the ACCC and the Australian energy market operator have identified a need to increase gas production, what government policies, inclusive of the proposed safeguard mechanism, will deliver the required increase in gas production? Uh, thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister Farrell. Well, I, in my first answer, uh, Senator, yes. thank you, uh, President, for <coughs> um, that, and uh, thank uh, the Senator for her, um, her second supplementary qu question. Um, <coughs> I've explained to you in my first answer, uh, Senator, that the, the trick here, the trick here, is to ensure that there's sufficient investment uh, in gas and coal to allow for, uh, main, uh, for well, well, the whole, the whole of government, the whole of uh, government, Minister, the whole of government. I thought I have a Senator, Minister Farrell. Minister Farrell, resume your seat. Resume your seat. I have a, a Senator on her feet, Senator Macdonald. President, no tricks. What is the government's uh, policies to provide for increased gas production? Uh, thank you, Senator Macdonald, and I'll again draw the minister to your question, Minister Farrell. So, thank you, President. Um, unlike, unlike the former government, we have got we've got a rounded policy to ensure, firstly, uh, that we secure our uh, electricity supplies in this country, including putting down, as I've spoken many times, including putting downward pressure on uh, electricity prices, but ensuring that all of our investment policies. Um, are directed to making that transition that even Thank your you, government— Thank you, Minister. The time your... for answering has expired. Senator Grogan. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister update the Senate on the progress that the Albanese government has made in taking the country forward on climate action? Thank you, Senator Grogan. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President, and I thank Senator Grogan uh, for the question and also for her strong advocacy in the area of uh, climate policy over many years. At the last election, the Australian people voted undeniably for action on climate change. The Albanese government has a mandate to deliver this climate action, and I welcome the fact that we have been able to secure additional parliamentary support for the safeguard mechanism reforms. After a decade of inaction from those opposite, that's right, they created the problem, hid the problem and then opposed to any solutions. Correct. Correct. After a decade of inaction, we can finally put Australia on a credible path to achieve net zero by 2050. Yeah. Just remember that those opposite agree with net zero by 2050. They just can't agree with any credible path to get there. The safeguard mechanism, as agreed by a majority of this chamber later this week, um, and we are deeply appreciative of the work that has gone in from crossbench members in working with us, including the Greens party and Senator Pocock, Senators Lambie, Tyrrell and Senator Thorpe, who have worked uh, collegiately as is required by this chamber, to land in a sensible outcome. And it really is for those opposite to explain why they dealt themselves out at the earliest opportunity, without even having a discussion. This uh, passage of the Safeguards Mechanism Bill will allow policy certainty for the first time after 22 failed energy policies, announced 22, couldn't deliver one of them, business and investors uh, 
have been after this policy certainty for some time. The jobs, the new industries and the opportunities that will come from having a credible path to net zero should not be underestimated by this chamber. And I thank those who have engaged willingly with the government on these negotiations. Thank you, Minister. Senator Grogan, first supplementary. That's great news, Minister. Great news. Um, it's, can the minister now update the Senate on the importance of the reforms to the safeguard mechanism to new facilities? Thank you, Senator Grogan. Minister Gallagher. And I thank Senator Grogan for the question. The safeguard mechanism reforms are about strengthening the economy and ensuring industry can compete in a decarbonising world. These are landmark reforms that will reduce 205 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions to 2030. Those emissions reduction will be delivered even with new facilities. Under the reform safeguard mechanisms, new facilities will need to meet international best practice. They will need to ensure emissions decline over time. New gas fields supplying existing liquefied natural gas facilities will be treated as new facilities. And with respect to the Beedaloo Basin, our, the Albanese government is committed to working with the Northern Territory government to implement recommendation 9.8 of the Pepper inquiry. The safeguard framework will help deliver the commitment to scope one emissions, and given the cross-jurisdictional nature of scope two and three emissions, the government will refer scope two and three emissions to the Energy and Climate Ministerial Council. Thank you, Minister. Senator Grogan, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, can the minister tell us what the reaction has been from business, climate and industry groups to the confirmation of parliamentary support for the safeguard reform mechanism? Thank you, Sen Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. And I thank Senator Grogan for the supplementary. And yes, I can. Support from senators to help uh, that pass the safeguard mechanism reforms has been widely welcomed, from the Australian Conservation Foundation to the Australian Industry Group and the Climate Council and the Business Council. The Business Council said these reforms were tough but achievable, and we think that's right. We have a policy which is ambitious but achievable, and uh, the work that has gone into getting that balance right and seeking support from this chamber has been uh, considerable. Mr Innes Wilcox of the Australian Industry Group said that industry will view the announced deal with some relief that pragmatism and reasonable compromise have prevailed. Now business and government have to get on with the large task of implementing this reform and supporting transformative investments in industry. Sensible response to good, sensible policy reform that those opposite have rejected and disengaged from for over a decade now. Thank you, Minister. Senator Dunningham. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. He does. The Greens yesterday stated that their deal on the safeguard mechanism has, quote, secured a pollution trigger for the first time in history on climate pollution. Can the Minister confirm that the government has agreed to adopt this climate trigger? Oh, thank you, Senator Dunningham. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Dunningham for his uh, his question. And uh, of course, I can let the Greens uh, speak for themselves on uh, their uh, their side of the uh, their side of the uh, agreement. What 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 I want what I want to do what I want to do is recognise the support that this agreement has got. Uh, both from conservation groups all the way, all the way to uh, to uh, business uh, groups. Just uh, to give one example, uh, Jennifer Westacott uh, from the Business Council. Business welcomes progress towards uh, ending Minister the Farrell. impasse. Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Dunningham. President, it wouldn't surprise you to know I'm about to take a point of order on mm -hmm. direct relevance. And while I'm appreciative of all the glowing endorsements he seems to have manufactured, I asked a specific question. Can I have an answer, please? Uh, thank you. You asked particularly about um, the Greens' position on a number of matters, and the minister has been relevant to that. Minister, uh, Senator Birmingham. Uh, on, the, on the point of order in your ruling, President, uh, uh, Senator Dunningham did not ask about the Greens' position. The question he asked was, can the minister confirm that the government has agreed to adopt this climate trigger? Uh, thank you. Um, Senator Birmingham, he, the question started with uh, the Greens. It went to safeguard mechanisms, it went to climate pollution and a climate trigger, and then uh, it asked the government's position 
I believe the minister is being relevant. I will continue to listen carefully, and if not, I will draw him to the question. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, President. Uh, and uh, um, what, I, what I can say is that uh, we're not uh, amending the EPBC Act. Uh, what we're doing is saying that uh, when a, a project is approved under the EP EPBC Act, their emissions will be assessed against the safeguard mechanism targets. The two processes remain completely separate. It's about sensibly sharing relevant information to the safeguards mechanism scheme. The scheme uh, does not give scope to the minister to reverse environmental approvals, and while the government already has accountability through the annual climate uh, change uh, statement, we are happy to add additional transparency and accountability um, to make sure the intention of the reforms are met. And I might add, <coughs> I mentioned uh, uh, Jennifer Westacott, um, the AI group um, made a comment about this, uh, <coughs> this uh, deal that uh, you don't like, uh, Senator Dunningham. He says, he, he says it's a good deal. Innes Wilcox says it's a good deal. Uh, the, <coughs> the treatment, no, 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 um, uh, thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Dunningham, first supplementary. Thanks, President. On the 3rd of August last year, uh, the Prime Minister and the Minister, uh, Minister Bowen were asked at a press conference if they would agree to the Greens' demands to use the safeguard mechanism to stop certain coal and gas projects. The Prime Minister's response was, quote, no in a word. Minister, why did the Prime Minister say one thing about this issue and then do completely the opposite? Uh, thank you, Senator Dunningham. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Dunningham for his, uh, his first, uh, first question. Uh, se sorry, first uh, supplementary question. Um, the opposition have only got themselves to blame for the position that they now find themselves in. They, they, purport, to be, they purport to be a party of government. They went to the last election with a policy of uh, net zero by 2050, um, we're progressing. We're progressing that because we also took that policy uh, to to the people. We're progressing that, and at every point in the in the process, the opposition is opposed to trying to deal with this issue of decarbonising decarbonising our economy. Um, we haven't heard a single word from the opposition about how they intend to decarbonise uh, the economy. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Dunham, second supplementary. Indeed. Thank you, President. On 6 September 2021, Mr Albanese said that if the Labor Party won office at the next federal election, quote, we will be supporting our own policies going forward at the election. We won't be in a circumstance whereby any minor party tells us what to do. In signing up to a dirty deal with the Greens on the safeguard mechanism, why has the Albanese government once again broken a promise that Mr Albanese made directly to the Australian people. Why? Order. 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 Minister. Minister Gallagher. Order. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. And uh, thank uh, Senator Dunham for his uh, second uh, supplementary question. Now, look, last week we had the opportunity to deal with the referendum machinery bill. And to the credit of Senator Hume, uh, the leader, um, <coughs> uh, Mr Dutton, uh, you engaged in that process. You engaged in that process. You engaged in that process, and as as a result, as a result, you were participants in that process. Now, what you haven't done, uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat, Senator Dunham. Uh, President, direct relevance. I asked him why they broke a promise. Could he uh, tell us uh, why? Thank you, Senator Dunham. I will direct uh, the minister to your whole question, Minister. Thank you, President. Thank you, President. Now, you you had an opportunity. You had an opportunity this week. You had Order. an opportunity this week to engage in the process. You took the decision. You took the decision to deal yourself out of that process and. And if you continue to do that, you, if you continue to do that for the rest of the term, 
you will be even more irrelevant uh, than you, you are Minister right Farrell. now. Minister Farrell, the time has expired. Order on both sides of the chamber. Order. Senator Rice. Thank you, President. My question is to Senator Watt, the Minister for Agriculture and Forestry. Firstly, I seek leave to table a photo of a Tasmanian devil that was burnt to death in a post-logging fire. That is a deliberate fire that burns what is remains um, of native thank forest you, after Senator logging. Rice. I'll see if leave is granted. Uh, generally, and this was explained to the chamber last week, generally material is circulated. If you want to circulate it, I'm assuming the minister will make a decision later. Yep. Uh, thank you. Please ask your question. Um, minister, Tasmanian devils are endangered, and yet logging operations signed off by your government are killing Tasmanian devils and destroying devil habitat. Minister, is this good enough that this destruction of these, these endangered species are happening under your watch? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Rice. Well, of course, I can't comment on that particular uh, issue, having not been given the courtesy of being provided with those documents before the question was asked. Uh, but what I can say is that the Albanese government supports a sustainable forestry industry, as I have said on a number of occasions. Uh, you well know, Senator Rice, that the forests in Tasmania are managed under joint state and federal regional forestry agreements, uh, and, uh, and that is the system that has, has been in place for a very long time. It is underpinned by strong environmental standards. And when those standards are not met, then appropriate action is taken uh, uh, to in, for environmental protection reasons. Um, now, as I say, uh, I can't comment on the particular issues that you've raised because you haven't raised them with me before. Um, but we do recognise that it's important that we have a forestry industry in Australia that is environmentally sustainable. It's one of the reasons why our government went to the election making a significant commitment to expand the forest plantation estate. Uh, in fact, as you may be aware, Senator Rice, already about 80 per 87 per cent of the logs harvested in Australia are from plantation estates rather than that, with the remainder being from native forests. Um, and we do think that it's important to have strong environmental standards that sit beneath those regional forestry agreements, uh, and, and that, is, that is a position that we will continue to take. You would have seen uh, that in response to the Samuels review, Minister Plibersek uh, made, made the point uh, that the new national environmental standards will apply to RFAs. Uh, that position was not just accepted but, but welcomed. Uh, by the forestry industry associations, in addition to environmental organisations, and I think that that shows that the Albanese government gets a, that gets the balance right between ensuring that we can meet our timber needs while also protecting Thank the environment. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Rice, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Minister, your so-called sustainable forestry is clearly unsustainable. It's abundantly clear that in Tasmania, in Victoria, in New South Wales, in WA, that logging our native forests is hurtling our threatened wildlife towards extinction, cremating Tasmanian devils in post-logging burns, destroying habitat of swift parrots, lead beaters, possums, greater gliders. Minister, why won't you end the regional forest agreements that allow this destructive logging? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Rice, for sharing your opinions uh, with us. Uh, but uh, as I say, Labor will always support a sustainable forestry industry. We do want sustainable forestry jobs. We need, uh, as a society, we do continue to rely on timber-based products. Uh, the jobs that the forestry industry creates, particularly in regional Australia, including in Tasmania, are important to regional economies. Uh, but forests are also valuable for their carbon storage, their native habitats, uh, and we understand that we do need strong environmental protections that sit beneath our forestry industry. As I said, uh, only in last December, Minister Plibersek announced our government's plan to reform Australia's environmental laws because those laws are broken. Uh, the, the, Graham Samuel found as much in his review that was commissioned by the former government. Uh, those laws don't protect our environment and they're frustrating for business to negotiate. Uh, and that's why uh, new environmental standards will apply to RFAs as they will to many other uh, aspects Senator of business. Senator Rice, second supplementary. Thanks, Minister. Minister, does your so-called sustainable forestry 
include allowing endangered species to be killed? If not, and given you won't end native forest logging, what are you going to do to ensure that Tasmanian devils and other precious wildlife are protected and not being killed in logging operations? Uh, thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Watt. Thanks, President. Thanks, Senator Rice. Well, as we have come to understand from the Greens, uh, they always insist on action to occur yesterday without thinking about the consequences. Uh, the Greens have no plan uh, for. We haven't heard Senator Rice or anyone from the Greens tell us where we would obtain timber products that we would need if we were to abolish native forestry immediately in the way that she calls for. We haven't had any word from the Greens about where the jobs would come from to replace the jobs abolished. But that's okay because the Greens never have to think about these things. They're not a party of government. They can go out there and make outlandish claims uh, that, that do not, um, that, that do not. Order. Well, there's a couple of parties who are definitely not part of the government over there, and we hope to keep it that way for a very long time. The, uh, but the Greens don't have to think about these issues. What Labor is trying to do, as a party of government, is get the balance right between uh, ensuring we have the timber that we need ensuring that regional communities are supported by jobs while also having strong environmental protections in place. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Uh, yesterday, the Minister outlined how the former government's tricky approach to budgeting has put several government programs and services at risk after July 1. Can the minister update the Senate on how the former coalition government's budget would have impacted the national institutions here in the capital, which house and protect our national stories and culture? Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Walsh uh, for her question and again for her support for important uh, national cultural institutions Order. here in the Across territory. The chamber. Uh, that, as, as um, Senator Walsh said, uh, house and protect our national stories and culture. Labor's budget in October last year was the first step in cleaning up the budget mess that had been left behind what by the mess? former government. A mess left by a tricky former government that deceptively trapped the budget with $4.1 billion worth of fiscal traps and funding cliffs for essential programs and zombie measures. Since then, we have only uncovered more evidence of these traps, these funding cliffs, for programs that Australians rely on and treasure. We have also uncovered chronic underinvestment in the key cultural institutions that Australians treasure and are actually crumbling around us, literally Shame. crumbling. Shame. And those opposite did nothing. Those collecting institutions are there to make sure that the most precious items of the Australian story are kept safe, are kept publicly available and are kept safe forever. But the previous government did not intend to keep these precious items safe or intact forever. The previous government only intended to care for them until June the 30th this year. What did they then do after that, I wonder? Just let the gallery sink into the lake? Let the tarp on the roof of the gallery just stay there, forever flapping in the breeze in, on the library, I should say? Additional funding runs out for the Maritime Museum on the 30th of June, for the Portrait Gallery on the 30th of June, for the National Museum on the 30th of June, for the Bundanoon Trust on the 30th of June, for the National Film and Sound Archive on the 30th of June, for the National Gallery on the 30th of June, for the National Library on the 30th of June, and for Old Parliament House on the 30th of June. And then we have other programs, which I no doubt will come to in my next answer. To one of Senator Walsh's uh, thank excellent you, Minister. questions. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Order uh, on my <clears throat> left. Senator Walsh. Thank you. Thank you, President. Uh, and I was very pleased to visit the National Library with uh, Senator White, who took a group of us there last Monday. It is truly amazing. Minister, how would the former government's tricky approach to budgeting have put Australia's online treasure trove at risk? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Walsh for advocacy for Trove. And it is a program that I have received significant representations on since taking on the role of uh, the Finance Minister. Trove is one of the Australian government's most visited online services, with more than 50,000 visits a day, and yet again, like the list that I went through before, was chronically starved of funds by the Coalition. Australians from every state and territory use Trove to research and find their family history, and it's a tool that helps Australians to get to know themselves better. 
But not only Fair does Trove brown. attract more than 50,000 visits a day, it's got over 1,500 dis digitised newspaper titles and 900 partner institutions. But under the coalition's proposal, their arrangements, it would run out of funding on the 30th of June this year, leaving thousands of Australians unable to research family history, undertake that important work, a job. But this is Fair what we are uncovering line by line as we work Thank through you, Minister, the, the government's, for former government's budget. Order across the chamber. Senator McAllister. Um, Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Minister, as more Australians operate their daily lives online, the role of the e-safety commissioner is becoming even more crucial. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the former government's approach to this government agency would have left Australians more at risk online, and how the Albanese Labor government will take a different approach? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Uh, minister. Well, again, I, thank you, thank you, Senator Walsh, and I understand why those opposite don't like this because we're calling them out for the way that they put their budget uh, minister together. Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. Order, order. Minister, please continue. Thank you. We're calling them out for the way that they put their budget together, which was these terminating measures, fund things for a year, don't fund things properly, Order. have a fiscal cliff and leave it for someone else to worry about, just like in energy policy and all those other areas. Actually kick the can down the road and actually w let somebody else deal with it. Well, we start, I'll take the interjection from Senator Birmingham. We started cleaning up the mess in October. $4.1 billion. We started Order. cleaning up the mess Minister and we'll Gallagher. continue it in this budget. With all dealing Minister Gallagher, Minister Farrell. Point of order, uh, President. Uh, I can't even hear the uh, minister's uh, answer, and I'd like uh, I'd uh, I'd like the opportunity to hear her uh, very fine answers to these uh, issues. Thank you, Minister Farrell. I ask the minister to resume her seat because there is too much disorder in the chamber, particularly the front bench on the left side, but not only there. I would ask senators, all senators. To listen respectfully and silently, Minister Gallagher, please continue. Thank you. And on the on the important e-safety commissioner, their base funding of 10.3 million has never been increased since it was established in 2015, and it's facing a fiscal cliff of 23.3 million from the 30th of June this year. This is how they budgeted. They were budget vandals, and Thank we're you, cleaning Minister, up the Minister, time has expired. Senator David Pocock. First question. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister. In recent years, we've seen scandals across the public service, robo-debt, mismanagement of procurement and home affairs, continual blowouts in defence projects and the recent questionable contracts in Service Australia and the NDIA. Now there is a change in government. Is this government, uh, and please for the answer, this government, not the last government, satisfied that the ANAO has an, has an adequate budget to ensure Commonwealth departments operating legally and ethically. Thank you, uh, Senator Pocock. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you, uh, Senator Pocock, for his uh, interest uh, in uh, this issue. And he has uh, <coughs> he has uh, gone through in uh, some significant detail all of the scandals that. Um, that uh, the um, uh, the um, all of the scandals that uh, beset the uh, the previous uh, government, um, the of course the the budget for the ANOA, um, of course would ANAO um, is um, is going to be the subject uh, of um, uh, of budget uh, discussions and of course. Um, you will know in a very short uh, period of time uh, what the uh, budget position will be for all of these, um, these organisations. But can I say I have had some dealings with the, uh, the organisation uh, and, of course, um, we saw through the uh, sports rorts uh, organisation the good, work, the good work that they did. Um, since coming to office, um, I have had responsibility, uh, Senator uh, Pocock, for um, um, the uh, the PEM system, and the PEM system was supposed to uh, uh, computerise the way in which, um, for instance, our 
um, travel allowance payments were made. We discovered, we discovered very quickly on coming to office. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Um, Senator Pocock. So, point of order, uh, President. Uh, relevance. Um, my question was about the ANAO, not the PEMS system. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Pocock. The minister has referred to the ANAO, but I'll remind him of your question. Thank you. Minister Farrell. Um, the, the point of reference, um, <coughs> referencing the, uh, if you'd let me finish the, my uh, question, Senator uh, Pocock, the point of reference of uh, the PEMS system is that I have asked the organisation to investigate why it is that a, uh, uh, a project uh, that was meant to um, simplify and speed up the way in which uh, these payments were made uh, has not done that, has not done that, and continues and continues to cost Thank the, you, Minister. Uh, Australian the time public for answering has millions expired. Millions of millions. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, President, and, and thank you, Minister. Has the government been approached by the Auditor General or any ANAO executive to request additional funding? Thank you, uh, Senator Pocock. Minister Farrell. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, President, and thank you, uh, Senator uh, Pocock, for his uh, first uh, supplementary uh, question. Uh, these are, of course, uh, issues that uh, the finance uh, minister, uh, of course, is particularly um, uh, concerned uh, uh, with, and uh, my um, understanding is that uh, she has uh, received some uh, some representations uh, in this uh, in this regard. Of course, that wouldn't be um, un uh, unsurprising because. Um, in the lead up to the preparation for um, a budget, of course, uh, these will uh, all of these issues uh, <coughs> will uh, no doubt be uh, considered uh, by uh, by not only the finance minister but of course the uh, the treasurer in the preparation for the uh, uh, the budget that's coming up uh, in uh, in May. Thank you, Minister. Senator. Pocock, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Thank, thank you, Minister. Uh, it's my understanding that the ANAO has completed just 16 out of 42 reports for this financial year, so that means there are 26 to be completed in the next three months. Uh, outside of the, the budget process, in principle, does the Labor government support full, fully funding the ANAO to ensure that it can undertake its vital task in our democracy? Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, um, Senator Pocock for his second, uh, second supplementary uh, uh, question. Uh, look, of, of, of course, um, we in opposition relied very heavily on the, uh, on the work that um, the ANOA uh, uh, did. Um, I know ANAO, yep, um, did in, uh, uh, in opposition. Um, of course, they did have the resources to do very thorough investigations, and of course, uh, we um, we we um, we uh, we saw the results of the uh, sports rorts uh, uh, investigations and the scandal that was associated uh, with that, which regrettably cost uh, Senator Mackenzie her uh, her ministry. Um, but look, we we um, we we um, we. Order. Order. Order across the chamber. Order across the chamber. Order across the chamber. Um, Senator Smith, I will just I'm not sure the minister has concluded. I will check. Um, Minister Farrell, have you concluded your answer? I think I have run out Time's of time. Up. Thank you. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, President. My question is also to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. The February 2023 tax expenditures and insights statement reveals $67 billion of franking credits was distributed by Australian companies in 2019-2020. Can the minister tell the Senate how many billions of these funds from franking credits went to Australian charities and non-profits and how many charities were the beneficiaries of this important and necessary franking credit income? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, Senator Smith, Smith for his um, for his uh, question. Um, 
Um, I personally don't have the breakdown of uh, uh, franking credits that uh, went to the organisations that uh, um, you, uh, you referred to, um, but I am uh, happy to make some inquiries to see whether or not uh, that information uh, uh, can be broken down or um, uh, does exist in, uh, uh, in some, uh, some place um, so that I can uh, come back to you uh, with, uh, with a, uh, an appropriate answer to your, uh, to, to your question. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Um, Senator Smith, first supplementary. First supplementary, indeed. Can the minister explain to the Senate then how the government's changes to franking credits will apply to the income earning investment of charities? Uh, minister Farrell. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you uh, President, and thank uh, Senator uh, Smith for his, um, his first supplementary uh, question. Um, my um, understanding of uh, this issue is that there, there, there is, uh, is no change, um, but I uh, will um, follow that up with the, uh, uh, the finance uh, minister to confirm that that is uh, the case. I, I, do say, I do say this, that, um, given, that, given, that we, given that we are fortunate in the Senate to actually have the fi finance minister uh, present, then um, of course these questions uh, might be might be better directed uh, towards the uh, the finance minister, and uh, that would uh, save uh, save me having to come back uh, with answers uh, to you. But um, can I suggest that it might be more appropriate in the future that those sorts of questions be directed to the minister who uh, is responsible for Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Smith, second supplementary. Noting that Senator Farrell is the leader of the government in the Senate, and this is the government's policy, the national charity sector is fighting to meet unprecedented demand because of the Albanese government's mismanaged cost of living crisis. How much will your franking credits broken promise cost Australian charities? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Smith for his uh, second supplementary uh, uh, question. <clears throat> um, I completely reject. I completely reject uh, the uh, the uh, accusation in your uh, question that um, the issues that uh, charities um, are dealing with um, at the moment have anything to do with the policies of the Labor government. It's this Labor government. It's this Labor government that's putting that downward pressure on the cost of living. How many times, how many times in the last week and a half, how many times in the last week Order. and a half Order. have I explained the downward pressure that we are putting on things like electricity price? How many, how many times? Uh, Minister how, Farrell, how many times? How many Minister times Farrell, have I talked? Please resume your seat. Order. Minister, please continue. Thank you. They don't want to listen. They don't want to listen to all of the things. They don't want to listen. They don't want to listen to the ways in which this government is putting downward pressure. And, Thank you, Minister. And that ought the time be, for answering has expired. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Skills and Training. TAFE teachers in Tasmania are paid $60,000 a year at the moment, but the tradies who should be teaching these apprentices earn upwards of $100,000. Last week, when I asked about Tasmanian TAFEs using Cold War-era Soviet Union equipment to teach your electrician apprentices, the minister representing the Minister of Defence said, and I quote, we have revitalised the TAFE industry in this country, end quote. How does the government explain how a TAFE operating on coal bore equipment has been revitalised since you've been in government in nine months? Uh, Minister Watt. Uh, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Lambie. Uh, I can assure you, Senator Lambie, that in the Albanese government, you have a government that is an incredibly strong supporter of our TAFE system. Yeah. Uh, and that is a contrast to what we have seen over the last 10 years, where we saw 
uh, a government ideologically opposed to the public provision of vocational education and training. Uh, and if you needed any evidence of that, all you needed to do uh, was look at the—I think it was four billion dollars—that was ripped out of the TAFE system by the former government. Until just before the election, they realised they had a political problem and started throwing a few extra dollars at it. So there is no there is no doubt that in your home state of Tasmania, in my home state of Queensland, and in every state and territory across the country, our TAFE system has paid the price for being starved of resources for nearly 10 years by a Liberal and National government that was ideologically opposed to it. Uh, and I take the interjection from I'm not quite, quite which saw government, uh, opposition senator trying to blame state governments. Well, you'd be talking about a Liberal state government in Tasmania, so I'm not quite sure how that helps your argument. Um, but, but, Senator Lambie, I agree with you that our TAFEs do Order need more investment. On my left. Uh, they do need more investment when it comes to capital equipment. They do need more investment when it comes to teachers' wages. They do need more investment when it comes to places uh, for TAFE, and that's exactly why the Albanese government went to the election with a commitment to do so. And we, I think it was out of the Jobs and Skills Summit, we committed to provide 180,000 new fee-free TAFE places. Uh, for in skills uh, that are in demand. I'm sure a considerable portion of them flow to your state of Tasmania, but this is an ongoing job. Uh, again, unfortunately, this is one of the various messes that we have inherited from the former government. It will take time to repair, uh, but at least we now have a government in Australia that is philosophically committed to our TAFE system and making it the centre of our vocational education, education and training system. Thank you, Minister. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Don't worry, I'm coming for the Tasmanian state government over this. Due to significant cuts by the previous government, Australia has lost the capacity to train apprentices. We all know that. Every year we have had fewer and fewer apprentices entering the workforce. Electrical apprentices in Tasmania are practising wiring equipment that isn't up to code. How does this government hope to achieve its housing policy and build much-needed homes in Tasmanians with so few apprentices in the construction industry? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Thanks, Senator Lambie. And ag again, Senator Lambie, I agree that our TAFE system has been starved of resources for far too long and that this is something that we do need the current federal government to be committed to, which is exactly what we are. I might say, Senator Lambie, I have a personal interest in this now, with having a year 11 son who's undertaking a school-based apprenticeship in the construction trade, and I want to make sure that he gets the same sort of opportunities that you're looking for kids in Tasmania to get as well when they're considering trade careers. Uh, as I mentioned, our government is investing significantly in the VET and TAFE system. In fact, we're investing $921.7 million over five years from 2022-23 to strengthen our VET system and address skill shortages. Uh, that includes $864.6 million over five years uh, to provide the fee-free TAFE places that I was talking about, as well as significant funding uh, in infrastructure and technology to support our TAFEs as well. Thank you, Minister. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. I was just wondering if you could tell me how much money, if you have passed over any money to the state of Tasmania since you have been in, in government, how much has actually been allocated to our TAFE system for its revitalisation and how much money has actually been spent, if you know that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Um, thanks, Senator Lambie. I might need to come back to you with the precise figures, but what I do have to hand is uh, the funding that's provided, being provided to each state and territory under the new 12-month national skills agreement that we negotiated with the states and territories last year. The figures that I have here are that for that 12-month agreement, uh, the Commonwealth contribution to Tasmania is $13.5 million. The bulk of that uh, is in those fee-free TAFE places. Uh, I'm pretty sure, Senator Lambie, that this would be the new funding that's being provided in addition to whatever existing funding there was in place. Uh, but $13.5 million in total from the Commonwealth, of which $9.9 million is for fee-free TAFE places, uh, $0.5 million for student support, $0.6 million for data infrastructure, $2.5 million for the TAFE Tech Fund Tranche 1. Uh, and, and we would expect uh, that as time goes on, that additional funding will be increased because, as I've said, the Albanese government understands that the TAFE system is the centre of our training system. <laughs> Thank you, system. Minister. The time has expired. Senator Polly, first question. Uh, President, my question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. 
The 2023 Why Australia report launched today reinforces why there is no better place in the world to do business than in Australia. How does the Australian government plan to attract further international investment and will this investment create more Australian jobs? Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and uh, thank um, <coughs> Senator Polly. This is uh, the second question from uh, <coughs> Tasmanian Senator today, and uh, I know you've got a great interest in this uh, area. The Albanese government has a simple message for international investors. We are open for business. And today's release of the Why Australia report highlights this fact. Our strong economy, talented workforce, renewable energy resources and open trade and investment policies make Australia one of the best places to do business in the world. Australia's reputation as an open, stable and globally connected economy makes us a leading destination for innovative start-ups, uh, research organisations and global investors. Investors are fuelling our growing technology sector, which is valued at over $167 billion and the third largest contributing sector to our GDP. Our supportive innovation ecosystems help spawn incredible innovations like Google Maps, Wi-Fi, the black box flight recorder and, of course, uh, the uh, terrific uh, cochlear implant. And our growing skilled work workforce means Australia is in an ideal place for international companies to expand their operations. But our government wants to go even further. We have an ambitious plan to become a renewable energy superpower and a nation that makes things again. These plans will help attract even more international investment here to Australia. More high-quality international investments mean more and higher paying jobs here in Australia. More jobs in the industries of the future and in regional uh, Australia. Unlike the previous government, Australian jobs are a top priority for the Albanese Labor government. And I call on all of those opposite to support our legislation Thank you, to the strengthen the safeguards mechanism. Senator Polly, first supplementary. Yes, President. Uh, Minister, how has the last decade of policy uncertainty and inaction under the former Liberal National Government impacted international business investment in Australia. Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Polly, Polly for her uh, first uh, question. The Albanese <coughs> Labor government uh, knows that the international investors crave certainty, but unfortunately, unfortunately, after a decade of Liberal National Government. That's the last thing international investors got. Instead of a government that they could trust, they got a decade of infighting and political divisions which prevented any meaningful action on important matters impacting investment, like a plan to tackle climate change. Thankfully, our government is taking a responsible approach to policy that delivers what investors need most – certainty and stability. We've ended the climate wars by charting a sensible path to net zero through our safeguards legislation. This gives international businesses a clear and predictable framework to invest in the renewable industries Thank of the you, future. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Polly, second supplementary. President, how would cross-party support for the safeguards mechanism and the National Reconstruction Fund give business certainty to help attract game-changing investment in Australia's domestic industries. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and thank uh, Senator Polly for her second uh, supplementary question. Uh, <coughs> we're providing Australian industry and the economy with a stable, ambitious policy uh, environment for investment in decarbonisation of our domestic industries. Yesterday's announcement by the Prime Minister and the Energy Minister uh, it was welcomed by the Business Council of Australia and the Australian Industry Group because they know our safeguards mechanism policy will help us attract game-changing investment into the future. Beyond providing certainty on, uh, on emissions, uh, we are providing certainty on government investment in the industries of the future through the $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund. 
If senators in this place are serious about attracting international investment in the industries of the future, I encourage them to support our legislation for a stronger safeguards mechanism and the National Reconstruction Fund. Thank you, Minister. Senator Van. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Minister, have all of the 90 Bushmasters promised by Australia to Ukraine on the 8th of April and 27th October 22 been delivered? Thank you, Senator Van. Minister Farrell. Um, thank you, uh, President, and thank you, uh, Senator Van, for, uh, for that question. Um, off the top of my head, I uh, don't know the answer to that question, but I will uh, make some inquiries after question time uh, with the, uh, with the uh, Defence Minister to get uh, a confirmation uh, of where we are um, on, that, uh, on that issue. Um, Australia, of course, has been very supportive of the, uh, not only the people of Ukraine, uh, but the government uh, of, the, of, of the Ukraine in this uh, terrible fight uh, that they now have uh, with the, uh, the, the, uh, the Russians. Um, I don't think, <coughs> outside of the uh, NATO uh, um, members, there's been a stronger supporter of the people of uh, Ukraine. Oh, uh, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, Senator Vane. Um, Minister, you know that's not true, Senator don't Vane, you? what is... Why point of order feet? is misleading the Senate. Uh, that's not a point of order, Senator Van. Um, please resume your seat, Minister. Did you wish to continue? Yes, thank you, um, um, uh, uh, President. Um, um, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, the uh, significant scale of Australian military assistance means that uh, we are still delivering items and will continue to do so over the uh, coming uh, months. Uh, for <coughs> context, uh, the uh, scale of our support includes over 100 vehicles and uh, heavy artillery. We have uh, already flown more than 30 uh, C-17s and uh, Ukrainian uh, Anto Antonov's uh, flights with assistance uh, from Australia. Uh, delivering uh, items from uh, <coughs> the other side of the world of course, uh, as you might uh, appreciate, is uh, an immense uh, logistical effort. Uh, but this government is prepared um, to continue to do that. Uh, of course, uh, one of the first things that uh, our Prime Minister did on um, becoming Prime Minister uh, was visit, uh, visit Kiev and uh, visit uh, the, uh, the, the, the President uh, of Ukraine. Thank you, Minister. Rest assured... The time for answering has expired. Senator Van, first supplementary. Minister. What promised Australian assistance, military assistance, for Ukraine remains outstanding? Thank you, Senator Van. Minister Farrell. Um, well, uh, again, uh, Senator Van, I'm uh, very happy to, uh, uh, <coughs> very happy to uh, consult with the, uh, uh, <coughs> the Defence uh, Minister um, after uh, question time and uh, get uh, an answer uh, for you on that, uh, on that question. But, can I, can I say this, um, as I started to say before, uh, the people of uh, Ukraine, the government of the Ukraine, uh, have no uh, greater supporters than the Australian, uh, the Australian government and the Australian people. Um, we have uh, demonstrated, both through the visits that uh, our uh, Prime Minister has made to Ukraine and uh, by the ongoing military and uh, other forms of support uh, that uh, we continue to deplore the actions of uh, the, Soviet, the, uh, the Russian uh, government uh, under uh, uh, Putin, uh, and, uh, and we continue to ensure that we Thank support you, Minister, the people the of Ukraine. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Van, second supplementary. Minister, given Australia's proven ability to previously manage diplomatic representation in difficult environments like Kabul and Baghdad. Will the government reopen our embassy in Kiev? Thank you, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank, you uh, um, uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Van. Um, the situation in Ukraine remains extremely uh, complex and challenging. Uh, in light of uh, rigorous safety and security assessments, the embassy continues to operate remotely from uh, Warsaw. 
DFAT is keeping this decision under review. The Embassy is managing Australia's interests effectively in Warsaw, including the, uh, the provision of consular services. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there's nothing that we will do that uh, seeks to uh, politically uh, influence uh, this, uh, this decision. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestries, Senator Watt. Minister, we know that low wages was a, de a deliberate design feature of the previous Liberal government's economic architecture. But it also turns out that funding cliffs was also a design feature of the previous government. Order. Minister, could you Order. please explain to the Senate why it is also important to provide long-term funding certainty for essential biosecurity services and how this protects our $76 billion agricultural export trade? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you very much, Senator Giacconi. Well, you would think that it goes without saying that providing funding certainty for essential government functions like biosecurity is a core government responsibility. And you would think that, and certainly the Albanese government gets that. We understand that you need to protect the Australian agriculture industry from biosecurity threats that could wipe out our production and exports and drive up grocery costs for Australians. And that's because we are a responsible government. Biosecurity is critical for the future of the regions and our $76 billion agricultural export trade. Strong biosecurity means our farmers can get their produce, produce into overseas markets, building economic resilience and creating tens of thousands of jobs in our regions. In our first budget, the Albanese government invested $134 million in new biosecurity measures like extra frontline staff, 20 new detector dogs and, and stronger defences against foot and mouth disease and other emerging threats. Unfortunately, though, as we keep hearing, the Albanese government also inherited a series of budget booby traps left by a government that was all announcement and no delivery. Short-term funding in emergency management, in health, the arts, communications, national security and now biosecurity as well. The Liberals and Nationals were addicted to announcing programs that they didn't get around to funding. As we keep hearing, their record of providing short-term funding for essential services like biosecurity was appalling. Because of the member for Maranoa's incompetence and Senator Mackenzie before him, biosecurity funding falls off a cliff over the next two years. In fact, it falls by 20 per cent on the 30th of June this year and another 25 per cent on the 30th of June next year. That's right, the funding engineered by Senator Mackenzie and, and Mr Littleproud falls off a cliff by more than 40 per cent in two years. We are cleaning up the mess by the Liberals and Nationals in biosecurity you, because that's what good governments do. Has expired. Senator up thank you, President. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. It's quite uh, shocking to learn about that development. We know that strong biosecurity is good for Aussie farmers, important for food security Order. and essential for trade. Minister, could you please outline to the Senate the risks to regional Australia of making short-term funding decisions for essential biosecurity services? Minister Watt. I'd be delighted to. And there are risks. There are severe risks to our biosecurity, our agricultural industry and grocery prices as a result of these short-term funding decisions that were made for biosecurity uh, as there were in so many other areas. It's no wonder, with the former government's record around short-term terminating measures for budget biosecurity, that the National Farmers Federation consistently called out the coalition for their failure to deliver sustainable biosecurity funding. But of course, rather than listen to our peak farming organisation and actually deliver, the Nationals' leader, David Littleproud, resorted to name-calling, labelling the NFF ignorant and sideline critics. Fortunately, in the Albanese government, the adults are in charge. We are working oh, with yeah. our farmers and we are working with our agriculture sector to fix our biosecurity system once and for all. In addition to the investments we made in our first budget, we're laying the foundations on traceability, something that was too hard for the National Party to deliver a fit-for-purpose modern system Thank to protect you, our Senator. livestock the time industries. Thank you, Senator. answering has expired. Senator Ciccone, second supplementary. Thank you again, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. Um, funding for biosecurity, it's fair to say, was left in a complete mess by the former Liberal National Government. Complete mess. What happens when governments don't plan for the future by making long-term investments in essential biosecurity? I'd appreciate your thoughts on that, Minister. Uh, Minister Watt. 
Thank you, Senator Giacconi. And of course, we did begin the job of fixing up this mess in our October budget, but of course, it is so big, it is so big that it's going to take even longer. Because we know that the Liberals and Nationals Order. announced programs but didn't Order. even fund them, even on issues important Minister to their own Watt. constituencies. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Order on my left. Minister Watt, please continue. President, the Liberals and Nationals announced programs but didn't even fund them, even on issues important to their own constituencies like biosecurity. And when you don't make long-term biosecurity investments, you leave Australia's farmers and our agriculture industry at risk. Senator McGrath. Now, I was very noticed uh, and I was very concerned to read an article just this week or in the last few days from ABC reporter Kath Sullivan, which reported that Australia's sniffer dogs haven't been sniffing for queen bees and were not on the beat when the deadly varroa might arrive last Year. Now, why would that be? Well, Senator you don't want to read in the article for several years. The then government had stopped training sniffer dogs to detect queen bees that might carry the varroa mite. That is the legacy of the coalition government. That is the risk that they are prepared to put biosecurity to because of this terminating measures that thank we are you, having Minister, to fix up. Your time has expired, Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, I regrettably ask that uh, further questions uh, be placed on the notice paper. Uh, and I also uh, seek uh, leave to move a motion uh, relating to the hours of meeting and routine uh, of business uh, this week. Is leave granted? No. Leave is not granted, Senator Farrell. Uh, then, uh, pursuant to uh, con contingent notice standing in the name of the Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Wong, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion relating to the hours of meeting and routine of business this week may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. And I move that the question uh, be now put. Uh, Senator Birmingham. President, President, what we have here is an attempt from the government um, to guillotine. It's guillotine, Senator President. Senator the government Birmingham. is seeking to guillotine Senator its Birmingham. own guillotine because they Senator don't want to have debate. I'm calling you to order. Order on my left. Order on my left. Senator Birmingham, I. Senator McGrath and Senator Gallagher. Order on both sides of the chamber. Senator Birmingham, I, you stood. I gave you the call, and then I, you didn't call a point of order. I asked you to sit, and I, and I would ask in future when I ask you to sit that I should not have to ask a leader of a political party to sit three or four times. So the question is, so the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator, that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the question be put. The ayes shall move for the right of the chairs, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart to tell her for the ayes and Senator Askew to tell her for the noes. Order. There have been 33 ayes and 27 noes. The matter is res resolved in the affirmative. So I'm now going to move the um, motion to suspend standing orders as moved by Senator Farrell. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No, uh, ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Farrell to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes shall move with the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urk as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes.
Order. There being 33 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, I move that a motion relating to hours of meeting and routine of business uh, this week uh, may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. And I move that the question uh, now be put. So the question is. Uh, so the question is. Uh, Senator Farrell, uh, Senator Birmingham, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. President, can I seek clarification here? Is the uh, outcome of the government's motion that the opposition is denied any right to speak at all to its substantial variation of hours for the rest uh, of the week? Senator, is that, uh, is that what the government Birmingham, is seeking to do, Senator to deny Birmingham, any dissent or disagreement? Order. 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 Order on my left and right. Order across the chamber. The motion is moved by the minister is that the question be now put, and that's what I intend to do. So the question is that the question be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question, as moved by Senator Farrell, that the question now be put be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 33 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Minister Farrell. Uh, um, President. Pardon, Minister, I now put the question. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Farrell um, be agreed to. That's the motion he read out prior to the question being put. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
lock the doors. So the question is that the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 33 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Minister. Um, thank you, President. Uh, I move the motion as circulated. So the question is that the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. The uh, division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 33 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I believe we're now going to taking note for a few short minutes. <laughs> Senator uh, Smith, I'll just wait for the deputy. Senator Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of all questions. Given to, so all answers given to all questions asked by coalition senators. 
Just a few months ago, uh, we heard how Labor was dragging its feet when it came to delivering on some fundamental election commitments when it came to the charities and not-for-profit sector, dragging its feet on the Productivity Commission inquiry that was aimed at, giving, uh, aimed at doubling uh, giving by 2030, dragging its feet on its building capacity, building community uh, policy. I'm pleased to say, uh, under a little bit of pressure from this chamber, we've now both seen the announcement of the Productivity Commission inquiry and we've seen some further detail in regard to the building capacity, building community initiatives. So why is it that, having dragged its feet on providing some certainty about what the future for the charities and not-for-profit sector might look like under this government, is it now seeking to pull the rug from underneath those charities that earn an income through franked dividends? Very, very important question. And it's not a suggestion, it's not a guess on my part or on the coalition senator's part in terms of what is happening here. Labor is either consciously trying to rip money from the charities sector through its franking credit credits plan, or it's designed a policy which will inadvertently hurt charities and rip not just a billion, but possibly two billion dollars worth of franking credit revenue from charities in Australia. Is it a conscious decision or is it the consequence of poor policy design? Now, Senator Polly, I can see you here looking uh, enthusiastic at my con contribution. I only have to direct you to page 52, to page 52 of the Tax Expenditures and Insights Statement document. It says at page 52, in 2019-20, around $67 billion of franking credits uh, were Senator distributed Polly. by Australian uh, companies. Senator Smith, is a point of order. Oh. Senator Polly. I ask that uh, the senator be required to withdraw his uh, assertions that I was enthusiastic about his contribution, knowing the history of his government. It's, uh, I'm not sure he needs to, to withdraw, but, put your, but I would ask that you direct your, um, your comments to the House through me. President. Senator Polly may not have been enthusiastic, but she was paying attention, and I thank her very much for that. So, paragraph 3 at page 52. You might like to grab it up on your iPhone, Senator Polly, before you make a contribution this afternoon. It says, in 2019-20, around $67 billion of franking credits were distributed by Australian companies. Around $17.2 billion of these were uh, claimed by 3.1 million residents on their individual tax returns that year. With the remainder, think about that, with the remainder, $50 billion, with the remainder flowing to other local entities, including companies, superannuation funds, and C H A R I T E S charities. The government's own document released as part of the budget honesty process. So why is it then, why is it that this government feels that it needs to pick on charities? Slow to deliver their election commitments, slow to deliver the Productivity Commission in inquiry into doubling giving by, giving by 2030, and now hidden at page 52 of the tax expenditures statement, Labor's plan to make it harder again for charities. But just think about this for a moment. A little while ago, they announced a Productivity Commission inquiry to double giving by 2030. And here at page 52 is a plan that will make it harder for charities to earn income. Peter robbing to pay Paul. This is crazy. This is inconsistent. At a time, and this is the most serious point, at a time when Australian charities and the not-for-profit sector needs to be supported in our community more than at any other time in recent history. Uh, Senator Polly, that concludes uh, take note because we have, to, we have a hard marker with a motion previously moved in the Senate. So I'll put the question. Those of the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Pursuant to order, I call on Minister Watt to provide an explanation. Senator, uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. 
I have been made aware of an administrative error that occurred when tabling the order of uh, production of documents number 144 earlier this month that led to certain documents not being produced. As a result, I will now table a number of additional documents, including correspondence to and from organics industry organisations and myself or my office regarding a domestic organic standard or regulation. That's it. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise to um, take note of this explanation by the minister um, and thank him for tabling some documents which I'm yet to actually see. I was hoping to table the letter. I hope one of these documents tabled is the actual letter from Organics Australia around, um, around standards, etc. And I want to walk the Senate through some of the issues. This minister has form on being called over and over back to the Senate, either to explain to the Senate for his own behaviour or that of his department, or on behalf of Senator King, the, the minister he represents. On the 8th of February, the Senate agreed for an order of production of documents number 144, requiring Minister Watt to table documents relating to a domestic organic standard or regulation for Australia. The order was responded to on 5 March, nearly a month later, with 20 documents. On 8 March, Australian Organics Limited put out a statement and published a letter sent to the minister on 14 December last year. This letter to the industry body should have been tabled by the minister, as set out in Order H of the order passed by the Senate. The minister failed, failed on 5 March in that 20 different documents tabled in this place to actually table a letter he had had in his department in his hand since the previous December. It begs the question of what else hasn't been tabled and undermines the confidence in this process. When the majority of senators in this chamber join together to actually order the government to produce documents, the casual disregard that this government's ministry has towards this chamber beggars belief after barely 10 months in office. It's an absolute contempt of the Senate from this particular minister to comply with an order. Ten short months have shown a complete disregard for the orders of the Senate, and ministers have frequently failed to comply. And the pattern is emerging from this government and this ministry, this executive. Whether it's on the voice and tabling uh, you know, advice from Solicitor General, as previous Labor governments have, when the public is asked to determine a referenda question so people can have confidence in the process, whether it is complying with orders of the Senate around transparency and accountability. Minister Watt, this government, a pattern is emerging, a set of standards and behaviour is being set. And this particular minister has been called to provide explanations for not responding to questions on notice, for failing to comply with orders of the Senate no less than six times. This will be the seventh in just 10 months. In just 10 months, ministers across this government have been called to give explanations nine times. If this is the standard the government wants to set, Senator Roberts pointed out that the last time Labor was in government, they complied with just 35 per cent of orders. This should be a red flag because it shows that colleagues on the crossbench are equally dissatisfied with ministers in this place for their willful disregard that they have shown for the standing orders for more than a century of procedure and convention. Ministers will do well to remember that not complying with an order of the Senate may lead to censure, contempt or other penalties under the Parliamentary Privileges Act. Standing Order 206 outlines a penalty for willfully disobeying the orders of the Senate is that the senator may be ordered to attend the Senate and be, may be taken into custody. For further resolutions on parliamentary pre privilege agreed to by the Senate on 25 February 1988, deal with matters con constituting contempts at section 6. And I quote, without derogating its power to determine that particular acts constitute contempts, the Senate declares 
as a matter of general guidance that breaches of the following prohibitions and attempts or conspiracies to do the prohibited acts may be treated by the Senate as contempts. Ministers must establish that the public disclosure of documents in question would be prejudicial to the public interest. This minister did not do that. In fact, he forgot to put a document pertinent to the order, essential to the order, that he'd had in his possession for in excess of two and a half months with the 20 other documents. And now he casually stands up and says, oh, I forgot one. Well, what else have you forgotten? What else have you forgotten? So the Senate is left questioning what other orders has this minister and others willfully not complied with. The government is now on notice. This minister is now on notice. The Senate is not a game, some you know, casual sand pit you can toss around uh, you know, toys and sand in each other's eyes and walk off unscathed. This is a serious chamber. It is here to hold the executive government to account. It is something we all, whether you've been had the privilege to serve in executive government or not, take seriously. And the first 10 months of this government and this executive shows that the Anthony Albanese government has a casual disregard for the orders of the Senate, for the role of the Senate in our democracy. And we ask them to do better on behalf of all Australians. Uh, Senator Davey had the call, and then I'll give the call to Senator Scar. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. Sorry, I, my apologies. I didn't see that. I too rise to take note of uh, yeah. the um, failure of the minister to comply with an order of the Senate, and also the absolute um, pathetic explanation that he has provided as to why and how this happened, without an, a skerrick of contrition on his part. It is a serious and damning reflection on Australia's Minister for Agriculture when he fails to support a very important agricultural industry that are keen to grow their markets both domestically and internationally. But then, when uh, the industry is trying to work with the government and the Senate is trying to work with the government, we are hampered because of the Minister's carelessness, disinterest or worse. Because the motion today uh, and the reason for calling the minister revolved around a legal technicality of what has or hasn't been tabled. But when something as glaringly obvious as a letter to industry from the minister, which I hope he's tabled, like my uh, colleague Senator McKenzie, I haven't yet had a chance to see what was just tabled, but I am aware that this letter exists because the industry has told us this letter exists. The industry has now published this letter on their website. When something as glaringly obvious as that didn't make it into the original pack of uh, tabled documents, it begs the question what else is being hidden. And it begs the question about the minister's commitment. But I also want to raise the minister's apparent oversight in, a, as an assessment of where this industry sits in the minister's order of priorities and the importance of his, that his department places on it be it by the minister's instruction or just his omission. We're not talking about a little niche industry here. We're talking about an industry that in 2021 contributed over $2 billion to the Australian economy. We're talking about the opportunity for that industry to grow, for that industry to have easier access to overseas markets. And to do so, they need regulation and accreditation. And this is what the industry has been calling for, and this is what the industry was working towards. The global market size of organics is estimated to be worth over US $208 billion, and it's estimated to grow 
to a, around $654 billion by the year 2030. Our lack of domestic regulation in Australia is undermining efforts by that industry to improve market access for organic exporters. Our target markets, quite rightly, question the equivalence of our organic production systems when there is no domestic organic regulation in place to provide them with some assurance of our market integrity. Only domestic legislation will provide the necessary regulations required to adequately protect organic consumers and producers and provide the insurance needed for improved export market access. Australia will miss out if this Labor government doesn't get off its proverbial and realise they've made a serious error of judgment in putting this important industry on the back burner. I've been working with the industry and been chasing answers for the organics industry through Senate estimates and uh, through my advocacy since I was elected. And I was pleased in 2020 when the then Minister for Agriculture, someone who didn't uh, ignore the industry, when David Littleproud commenced investigating whether the regulatory framework for our organics industry was fit for purpose. Then Minister Littleproud established an industry working group who in turn and through the process uh, had the department commission a consultation paper to be conducted by PricewaterhouseCoopers with a cost-benefit analysis. The coalition commitment at the time, and it was ongoing right up until the last election, was that we were working towards implementing a domestic standard as a, as a result of the work through the industry working group. I asked the industry whether that working group has been reconvened since the election, and I was told by them no. I followed this up with uh, questions to the department in November last year when I asked questions about the, uh, the PwC report. And the minister's department advised at the time they were considering the findings and would engage across the public service and maybe with industry as needed in providing advice to government. Fast forward to March and again at estimates I followed up and I was told that um, we're still waiting. I was also advised, confirmed to me by the department that the industry working group had not met since the election and had not seen the PricewaterhouseCoopers report or the consultation reports that had been bandied around other bureaucratic agencies. When I asked when something might be coming, I was advised, and I quote, the policy consideration is ongoing. I don't have a time frame. I am able to provide the committee at this point. So that shows to me Minister Watt does not support an organic standard um, which he announced in the media in March this year. And Minister Watt's reason relates to the cost-benefit analysis by PricewaterhouseCoopers that I'm not sure how much we've seen, but I'm advised it is flawed and it was a cost-benefit analysis only of the domestic industry and didn't consider the export potential of the industry. Minister Watt, I don't understand the lack of conviction or interest in an industry that has the potential for such growth. The industry doesn't understand the disrespect you have shown them. The organics industry has been calling for the implementation of a domestic organic standard for years. This is not, I know we're the party of, we like to have a light touch regulation, but this is something the industry has been calling for because with a domestic organic standard, it can actually compete in export markets. 
with a regulated and accredited product and standard. I urge the government to work with industry and get issues about cost, benefit and other concerns that may have been raised in the PricewaterhouseCoopers report sorted out so industry can grow and prosper. There is an existing industry working group that you can go to, that you can consult with, to make sure that you smooth over all of those issues um, that were apparently raised. When we are seeing organics producers not being able to access markets like South Korea because we don't have an equivalent standard that other governments can compare their domestic regimes to to make sure that there's balance, then that is shame on us, particularly when we've got industry who are so willing to work with the government to ensure that we can do so. And the disrespect that the minister has shown by his laissez-faire attitude to producing the documents has been reflected in his treatment of the industry. And I implore him to actually change his attitude towards the organics industry, change his attitude towards orders of the Senate, and um, start commencing the real work. Thank you. Senator White. Uh, Deputy President, I rise to take note of the explanation given by the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. From the outset, let me start by saying that our government is keen to work with the organics industry to open new trade pathways for organic products. But I just, you know, you had 10 years. Um, but I just want to put a few facts on the uh, table about this issue, given some of the hyperventilating that we've seen from the senators opposite. The former government commissioned a number of reports into a potential domestic standard for organics between 2020 and 2022. These reports were not released publicly by the minister at the time, and no changes to domestic regulation were ever made by those opposite. Are we surprised? No. However, on 6 March, um, Minister Watt released the two cost-benefit analysis reports that the organics industry had been seeking access to. These reports examine the costs and benefits of a regulatory scheme and are now posted on the department's website for all to see. The most recent cost-benefit analysis commissioned by the former coalition government found there is no option for regulating the domestic organic industry that is supported by industry and shows a net positive impact over 10 years. It also indicated the cost of extra regulation as requested by the industry may be too big a burden for smaller players in the industry to withstand and may end up being passed on to consumers at the checkout. An additional report commissioned by the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry has found that 53% of consumers do not search for the phrase organic when purchasing a product. 48% of participants stated that the government certification would not change their buying habits. We acknowledge the organics industry has done a lot of work on this issue and those involved are keen to see progress. But we must be methodical in our approach as the introduction of an economy-wide domestic regulatory scheme would be a significant change to our regulatory landscape. This would no doubt come with a range of potential benefits and opportunities for the sector, but it will also come with costs to business, which would then be passed on to consumers. At a time when consumers and business are facing costs, a cost of living pressures, we are conscious of our responsibility to not add to that burden. I really am surprised that the Nationals are so keen to add to household budget pressures, uh, and given the opportunity they had to release this information uh, under the previous minister, they just chose not to. The uh, Albanese government has been in constant contact with the industry throughout the whole process. The minister was pleased to attend their inaugural conference last year and has met with producers and industry bodies. We will continue to engage meaningfully with the organics industry going forward. In the meantime, the Albanese government is working hard to increase export opportunities for the organics industry and non-organics agricultural products. The Australian government is committed to expanding, expanding and diversifying access to export markets in support of industry's ambition to grow the agriculture uh, sector to $100 billion 
$1.6 in farm gate value by 2030. Australia, Australian exports, uh, exports around 72 per cent of agricultural production each year. This is expected to be worth $74.8 billion in 2022-23. We are committed to supporting our exporters to pursue opportunities in new markets through our trade diversification plan. This plan has four main pillars, delivering an export market and uh, product diversity a diversification strategy, two, building economic ties with India, as demonstrated by the Prime Minister's recent trip to India, when we, where we agreed on a two-way agricultural trade to provide new market access for Australian Hass avocados to India and access to Indian okra to Australia, three, revitalising our trade with Indonesia and four, supporting greater regional trade cooperation. This is a good plan that acknowledges our place in the world and brings amazing agricultural products and industry uh, to the world stage where it belongs. I know, and this is something Mr Watt has consulted on and brought the industry along with us, because that is actually how Minister Watt runs his portfolio. He's consultative, he listens and is extremely hardworking. I think uh, it was uh, Senator Stuhl who was in this place yesterday talking about the feedback he had been getting from the agricultural uh, industry in Western Australia about how Minister Watt has conducted himself in this role. And that feedback is entirely positive. I can say the same from a Victorian uh, point of view. Um, not so long ago, uh, as I mentioned in Question Time last week, I was up in Tatura in northern Victoria, near Shepparton, at the International Dairy Week conference. The overwhelming message I got from the in that industry conference was how glad the dairy industry is that there is someone in the agricultural portfolio who listens to them and asks them what they think. And they recognise how hard Minister Watts works from the minute he uh, has worked from the minute he's sworn in, particularly when, uh, if you look most recently, the Australia biosecurity uh, that was threatened, and particularly in those industry, who's, who, industry who deal with livestock, where there were many concerns about the incursions of foot and mouth disease in Australia. <laughs> This literally happened as soon as we got elected and Minister Watt immediately got to work. And now we have a biosecurity strategy that is going to set up Australia for the long term in this place. I might say that it occurred despite a dec decade of multiple National Party agriculture ministers dropping the ball on biosecurity. I was shocked to learn in the last round of uh, Senate estimates how the Nationals had cut the uh, Detector Dogs program at Australian airports. Less and less dogs picking up less and less threats. I was even more shocked to learn that under the National Party's watch, the Detector Dog Program wasn't training uh, dogs to detect queen bees, and it ha that has been happening since 2015. Uh, as the Minister mentioned in question time, and as was, was reported on Landline this week, um, queen bees um, that are brought into the, the country are not detected by dogs and are at serious risk of carrying varroa mite. Varroa mite is a nasty parasite which devastates honeybee populations and destroys hives. And guess what? After the Nationals cut the detector dog program and cut the detection of honeybees at Australia ports of entry, we've had an incursion of varroa mite. Cause and effect, one might say. At the end of 2022, after Senator Watt became minister, the detection of queen bees was added back to the list of things that dogs smell for. But of course, of, because of how irresponsible the coalition law, uh, was, it was too late. We now have varroa mite incursions we are still dealing with in New South Wales. Um, I, 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 uh, and as uh, we have talked through many question times and often, uh, this is a case of cleaning up the coalition's mess after the last decade. Um, this, and this varroa mite incursion is a very huge mess. It costs money, it costs livelihoods, and it costs industry and productivity. Uh, and Minister Watt is cleaning this up and fixing it. And, uh, um, and, and for that, he needs to be congratulated. And we have also had revelations about the coalition basically bankrupting the, the entire Department of Agriculture. The department has been forced to cut staff, limit programs, and cut travel because the former national ministers refused to do anything about the fact that the cost of delivering the department's essential services and policy responsibilities outstripped the revenue coming into the department. Imagine that, letting the very department sim that symbolises your reason to be in politics go bankrupt because you uh, haven't got 
the time or can't be bothered to do anything about it for a decade. It's completely shameful coming from the party that claims to be there for rural and regional Australia, as we've heard again, yet again today. But someone who is not lazy, who does the job, who works hard, who addresses the issues when, when they come to him is Minister Watt. I back Senator Watt's explanation here today and for all the reasons I have mentioned, believe him to be entirely responsible and effective as a minister and he will continue to be. Effective as, uh, more effective than the sum total of the ministers that have proceeded in, in the coalition. The motion moved today is nothing more than a silly attack on uh, Senator Watt for the very, very reason he's doing so well in his job and the Nationals can't handle it. Finally, again on the matter of organic standards, we acknowledge the organic industry has done a lot of work on this issue and those involved are keen to see progress. We are being methodical in our pro approach and I have full confidence in Senator Watt as the Minister who will make sure there is a good outcome and it is achieved. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, Senator White referred to the need to consider the feedback, the feedback with respect to the Minister of Agriculture's performance. Well, I've got some feedback and this feedback isn't from a senator in this place. This is from the industry. And let me quote. This is what the industry, the organics industry, is saying about Minister Watt. I quote, Minister Watt ignores evidence, yep. experts and industry with captain's call on domestic regulation. End quote. That's what the industry is saying. There's some feedback. There's some feedback for Minister White. Senator White, there's some feedback. Minister Watt ignores evidence, experts and industry with captain's call on domestic regulation. There's some feedback on the, in relation to this very issue which we're debating today in relation to the minister's failure to promptly comply with an order for production of documents that was issued with the order of this Senate. The order of this Senate, an important check and balance in our Australian democracy. And the minister came in, the minister came in after after the Australian Organics Limited actually referred to, referred to a document which the minister had not tabled, had not tabled in compliance with the order for production of documents, the minister then comes in to this place after that had been disclosed, brought to this chamber's attention by the industry, and we said, well, hang on, they're referring to a document from the minister, and the minister didn't include it in the order for production of documents. What's going on? So we call the minister in to provide an explanation, and then, oh, I, administrative oversight. I forgot a few documents. I forgot a few documents. They just happen to be some of the most relevant documents in relation to the subject of the order for production of documents. I forgot a few documents. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. It doesn't exactly instil confidence in relation to this minister and his ability to comply or his desire to comply with orders for production of documents. And we've seen it here before in this term of government. Six times before this occasion, the minister has had, has had to be dragged kicking and screaming into this place to explain why he hasn't provided documents which the Senate has requested and ordered. The process should not work that way. The process should not work that way. The minister and his department, the ministers responsible for the department, should comply with the orders of this Senate. The minister should comply. And these documents which have been tabled today, this is where they are. We got them half an hour or so ago. These are the most important documents in relation to the order for production of documents. They're not collateral documents. They go to the heart of the very issue. They go to the heart of the issue. And these are the documents administrative oversight. We forgot to give you the most important documents, the most important documents identified in the order for production of documents. Give us a break. Goodness me. It's, it's absolutely astounding. And this is about opportunity. This is about opportunity. As Senator Davey said, the organics food industry is worth hundreds of billions of dollars and has the potential to increase by hundreds of billions of dollars. And if Australia does not have an appropriate standard to give our own Australian consumers confidence with respect to whether or not a food is truly organic to an appropriate standard or not, that is going to hurt our ability to export, take advantage of the opportunities overseas with respect to organic food. That's what we're talking about here. And this is an opportunity worth hundreds of billions of dollars. And it is not good enough. It is not good enough in relation to an issue this important 
the minister want to ignore evidence, experts and industry with Captain's call on domestic regulation? The words of the industry itself. The words of the industry itself, not my words. And with respect to the reports that Senator White referred to, the biggest omission in those reports is that they don't actually consider the export opportunity itself. They don't consider the value of the export opportunity itself. They're only looking in a very limited way with respect to the internal regulation of the industry without taking into account the great opportunities for, uh, for organic food on the world stage. I'm proud that in the previous term I served in a government which set a target of $100 billion, $100 billion of agricultural production and exports. And Australia is leading the way in terms of agricultural production and, and uh, exports. We need to do better on this. The minister needs to lift his game and listen to the industry in relation to the opportunities in this space. I put the question uh, to the motion moved by Senator McKenzie. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Who deferred motion? Senator Birmingham? It's a point of order, President, if I can seek some clarity as to why we aren't resuming the debate to take note of questions from question time. Um, Standing Order 72 provides uh, for uh, 30 minutes of uh, debate following question time on, uh, on questions without notice for a motion to take note. I know we have just dealt with the motion. I know we have just dealt with the motion that provided for Senator Watt to attend at 3.30. Uh, that motion indicated that Senator Watt's attendance in a subsequent take note debate shall have precedence over other business until determined, uh, but it did not extinguish any other business. So, President, uh, I would have interpreted that motion to provide for an interruption to the take note of uh, questions, uh, not, uh, not for uh, an early um, closure of that debate. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I'll just take some advice. Uh, Senator Birmingham, I'm relied that we have consistently applied the term hard marker that all business then ceases and moves on to the next uh, part of the business day. The only time that we don't do that is when we use the form of words um, the debate is interrupted for a first speech. Other than that, it's always uh, the hard marker applies, so taking note uh, ended at its usual time. So I believe um, we are now putting the deferred motions from oh, beg your pardon, placing of business. My apologies. So is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Uh, Senator Urquhart. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator. I move Urquhart. that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senator Ayres from the twenty eighth. 30th of March 2023 on account of ministerial business. Senator Billick from 27th to the 30th of March 2023 for personal reasons and Senator Wong for today for personal reasons. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Askew, did you have any um, leave? No? Okay. Um, we skipped over uh, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Uh, leave is, is leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator. I Thorpe. move that leave of absence is granted to myself for the 24th of March to the 27th of March for personal reasons. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Thorpe be agreed to. Those without opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, I'm going to go back to notices of motion because we. Oh, you've got another. Another placing. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. I move that the following general business orders of the day be considered this week at the time for private senators' bills. Uh, number five, Defence Amendment 
uh, Bill 2020 on Wednesday 29th of March 2023. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Roberts. Uh, thank you, President. I wish to give notice that I'm withdrawing notice of motion number 179, standing in my name for tomorrow. Thank you, Senator Roberts. If that is all to do with um, rearranging, I'll move back to notices of motion to be given for another day. Are there any of those notices of motion? There being none, I'll move on. I'll call the clerk. President, there have been no postponement notifications lodged and committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 11 of the order of business. Thank you. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Um, I now move to formal business. I oh, beg your pardon. I now move. Oh, Senator Rice. President, look, I seek leave to table a non-conforming petition. Is leave granted? Yes. Yeah, it is usually done in documents on which okay. I believe yeah, there will be no documents. But we don't have documents, documents. today, so I'm uh, I think we're yes. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So a, a number conforming petition about bringing back nurses, physios and allied health in aged care homes. Thank, Thank you, you. Senator Rice. So we'll now go back to the deferred motions. So the question is that the motion move but uh, well, in the uh, I think it's the one move. I have a script here. I remind senators that yesterday two votes were deferred relating to business of the Senate notices of motion moved by Senator Roberts and Senator O'Sullivan. I understand it is now suits the convenience of the Senate to hold those votes now. If there's no objection, I will deal with the first vote on the proposed reference to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee moved by Senator Roberts. So the question is, is that motion agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Oh, there's only one voice there, Senator. Uh, Senator Roberts, you are, it's disorderly to call out from your chair. Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. We called for a division last night and it was to be deferred till today. Yes, you still need two voices, Senator Roberts. So Do the Liberals know that because they're supporting uh, the motion? Senator Roberts, it's, please don't call out across the chamber. Um, there aren't two voices, so please resume your seat. So the motion. I will put the question again. Um, so the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? Uh, there was one voice. So, okay, my apologies. <laughs> so, division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Yes. I do remind senators you are required to vote in the way that you've called.
Ah, yeah. No, she can't go. Lock the doors. Senators, we're dealing with the deferred motion as moved by Senator Roberts, so it's a reference to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Cadell as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 30 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, I will now deal with a closure motion moved by Senator Brown concerning a proposed reference to the Finance and Public Administration References Committee. So the, the question is that the question now be put. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Ring the bells for. One minute.
order. I lock the doors. So the question is that the question be now put. The ayes should move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Cadell as teller for the noes. Order. There being 31 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now am putting the question that the order that the motion proposing a reference to the Finance and Public Administration Committee moved by Senator O'Sullivan be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. no. I'm going to put the question. <laughs> so, the eyes have it. The eyes have it. We now move to formal motions, and I advise senators there may be further divisions. I'm now going to deal with business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator Steele John. Senator Steele John. Thank you very much, President. Um, I ask that business uh, of the Senate notice of motion number one uh, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Steele John. I move a motion related to the reference to the Community Affairs Committee of an inquiry into ADHD. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Steele John be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I'll now go to uh, business of the Senate number 207, standing in the name of Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. Excuse me, ma'am. Ma yeah. Excuse me. Thank you. I ask that general business notice of motion number 207 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Roberts. Thank you. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 207, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. We now move to Business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thank you, President. I, I seek leave to amend business of the Senate notice of motion number two relating to a referral to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Reference Committee to change the reporting date to 7 December 2023. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion as amended being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Shoebridge. I move the motion in relation to FOI as amended. So the 
Uh, Senator Chisholm. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Affairs References Committee already has a full workload. The Senator is encouraged to have a meeting with the Attorney General to discuss any concerns about the FOI system that can be considered by government rather than adding unnecessarily to the workload of the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee. The government is committed to the effective operation of the Freedom of Information Act 1982 to ensure it meets its objectives of improving open government and the Attorney General would welcome the opportunity to, dis to discuss this important issue with the Senator. So the question is that general business notice of motion number two, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Order. Lock the doors. So the question is that business of the Senate motion number two, as amended by Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Cadell as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 43 ayes and 19 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'll now move to business of the. Oh, um, so we're now dealing with um, general business. Notice of motion number 206, standing in the name of Senator Bragg. Senator Askew. Um, on behalf of Senator Bragg, I ask that general business notice of motion number 206 be withdrawn. Thank you. Senator Urquhart. Um, thank you, President. Um, in relation to Senator Roberts' to, uh, notice of motion number 207, um, I would ask that that be put again because we um, wanted to divide on that. So I would ask that the question be put. Is leave granted? I uh, leave is granted. So the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, the noes have it. So we now move to general business notice of motion number 208, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith. The general business notice of motion 208, standing in my name, be withdrawn. Oh, thank you, Senator Dean Smith. Uh, we will now move to general business notice of motion number 209, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham. Senator Cadell. This motion number 209 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Cadell. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 209, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 209, standing in the, the name of Senator Birmingham, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair. The noes to the left eye appoint Senator Cadell as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 44 ayes and 20 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, I advise there's one further motion. So I'm calling general business notice of motion number 210, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham. Oh, you got it? Senator okay. Cadell. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, on behalf of Senator Birmingham, I ask that general business number 210 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Cadell. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 210, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham and moved by Senator Cadell, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Ring the bells for one minute. One minute.
lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 210, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham and moved by Senator Cadell, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Cadell as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 44 ayes and 20 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, in accordance with the order agreed to earlier, I will now put the second reading questions on the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill 2023. So I'm dealing first with um, the Greens amendment on sheet 1896. So the question is that the second reading amendment on sheet 1896 Revised, moved by Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Dr Dawes. So the question is that the second reading amendment on sheet 1896 revised, moved by Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Pratt as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the noes. Order. There being 34 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now move to um, the amendment as moved by Senator David Pocock. David Pocock. So the question now is that the second reading amendment on sheet 1914 revised, circulated by Senator David Pocock, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Order. I lock the doors. So the question is that the second reading amendment on sheet 1914 revised, circulated by Senator David Pocock, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Pratt as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the noes.
Order. So the question. So the eyes are 34 and the nose uh, 30. The eyes have it. We we'll now move to um, the amendment as moved by Senator Thorpe. So the question now is that the second reading amendment on sheet 1916, circulated by Senator Thorpe, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Uh, the noes have it. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Four minutes. Four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that the bill be now read a second time. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Pratt as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the noes. Order. There being 34 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to establish the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is, oh, yes. Yes. The question is that the bill stand as printed. And this is when you look over to your right and some of the So I'll just hold a second there, Senator Farrell. We'll just get the microphone on. Senators, can I just ask, can you please uh, leave the chamber if you're not participating at the moment? And I'll go to the Minister, Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I uh, table two supplementary explanatory memoranda relating to the government's amendments uh, to be moved to this bill. <coughs> Who's seeking the call? Uh, uh, Senator, Senator oh, sorry, Senator Farrell. I to move amendments one to eight on sheet uh, UC140 together. Is leave granted? Yes. Leave is granted. I move the uh, amendments, uh, Chair. <coughs> Thank you. Senator Farrell. Uh, <coughs> We thank the Senate Economics Legislation Committee, the Senate Scrutiny of Bills Committee, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights and the many other stakeholders, including members of this place, that have provided <coughs> their valuable feedback on this bill. In response to this feedback, <coughs> the government moves the following amendments to the bill. Uh, firstly, in respect to functions of the board, <coughs> While investing to diversify and transform Australian industry is the core objective of the NRF, we also recognise there are several important considerations that the board should have regard to in performing its functions. That is why we propose further amendments to clause 17 of the bill to make it clear that the board must have regard to a number of other important matters that have informed our design of the NRF uh, from the outset. 
transforming Australia's industry and economy, attracting private sector investment, not crowding it out, Australia's greenhouse gas emissions reductions target and decarbonisation, creating secure jobs and a skilled and adaptable workforce, enhancing resilience in the Australia's uh, supply chains and encouraging the commercialisation of Australian innovation and technology. Our proposed amendments to Clause 75 <coughs> require the corporation to develop policies on how environmental, labour, social and governance matters need to be considered in relation to its investment functions and powers <coughs> and also its uh, subsidiaries. This represents modern investment best pr practice and we thank those stakeholders who raised these issues. By introducing these amendments, the government reaffirms that one of the most important outcomes of the National Reconstruction Fund will be the creation of secure, well-paid jobs in these key industries that builds upon our national strengths. The fund will revitalise and strengthen our local supply chains to ensure that we have our own industrial and manufacturing capabilities. <clears throat> By legislating the core functions of the board to include the creation of secure jobs, we are emphasising one of the biggest benefits uh, our domestic manufacturing industry provides and will continue to provide opportunities for Australians to make a meaningful, high-skilled contribution to our nation's uh, future. Nearly 85 per cent of the jobs in manufacturing are full-time. When we proposed the National Reconstruction Fund in March 2021, Labor said we're doing this to rebuild secure work. <coughs> uh, when he announced the Inflation Reduction Act in August uh, 2022, itself a huge investment in the manufacturing capability in the US, President Joe Biden said that it would lift up American workers and create good paying union jobs across the country. Uh, union jobs is universally recognised language for secure, safe, high skilled, well paid jobs. That is exactly what this government is doing with our reconstruction, National Reconstruction Fund, creating jobs uh, communities can uh, build around, especially in regional, remote and outer suburban Australia. We are investing in businesses so that they can invest uh, in their workers, developing uh, the skills that we need to meet any challenges that the future may have in store. But we're only going to get to <coughs> there by working together, government, business and their people. We all have a common goal, an Australian industry that will lead the world. This can only be achieved if everyone has a voice which can be heard and a stake in the success of our collective effort. Finally, in response to comments by the Scrutiny Committee, we also propose a minor amendment to Clause 90 to make clear that the CEO may only delegate their powers and functions to senior staff. This amendment brings the clause into line with the CEFC Act and will not significantly change the operations or the functions of the NRF. I therefore commend the bill to the Senate. <coughs> Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And the government will not be supporting. Uh, so the opposition will not be supporting the amendments moved by the government. Uh, I do know that, unfortunately, this is going to be subject to the committee stage to a guillotine that is going to kick in at 8 p.m. And I do know Senator Hume, Senator Scar, uh, Senator Brockman, uh, and possibly other Senator Wenick. We do have a number of questions uh, that we would like to endeavour to get through uh, in the short time the uh, just under three hours that we have available. Just in terms of the Board Appointments Minister, um, as the bill currently stands, Section 19.1 states that the ministers will, by written instrument, appoint board members. There is, however, no process stated for which these appointees will be selected from. Could you just take us through what process would the minister enact to ensure that merit-based appointments do occur?
Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, uh, Senator Cash, for your, uh, your question. Um, <clears throat> there will be a, um, the, the, the normal processes that would apply when uh, consideration of, uh, of board membership. Obviously, um, <clears throat> uh, it will be a merit-based um, board uh, appointments. Um, and obviously, when you're dealing with something like the National Reconstruction Fund, uh, emphasis will be on the people with those skills that might uh, best uh, be capable of uh, implementing this uh, much needed and very ambitious uh, project. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. When you state that normal processes uh, will apply, could you please outline to the Senate what those normal processes are? And when you say that the minister will ensure that people um, have the appropriate skill set, how is that going to occur? Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Chair. The minister will select uh, from a list of candidates prepared uh, by the department um, the school's uh, metrics, um, taking into account uh, uh, the qualifications uh, listed in the bill at section uh, 19, subsection 2. Senator Cash. Uh, will this skills metric be made public? Yes. Minister. Senator Cash, um, that uh, skills metric is uh, is already in the bill. Senator Cash, referring to, uh, just in terms of the board positions themselves, will they be publicly advertised? Minister, no. <laughs> Senator Cash, on what basis will they not be publicly advertised? Minister. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the government has decided not to uh, publicly uh, advertise them. <coughs> Senator Cash. On what basis did the government make the decision, given all of the comments uh, that were made in particular prior to the election in relation to transparency and integrity by this Prime Minister, by the Attorney General and by other members of the government, that you will not be publicly advertising these positions? Minister. Um, <clears throat> Senator Cash, you really have got a cheek um, talking about uh, transparency um, when uh, the former Prime Minister did not reveal to the Australian people uh, that there were, uh, that were, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, if you don't realise, uh, Senator Henderson, the seriousness of what the former the uh, former Prime Minister did, and, and I might say some of the comments of your uh, current uh, female uh, <coughs> um, uh, bench, um, shadow uh, bench. Um, <coughs> look, the former government didn't even tell oh, Senator the. Farrell, just, oh, Senator Farrell, please take a seat. Senator Henderson. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, um, a point of order. I would ask Mr. Um, Senator Farrell to withdraw that denigrating comment about women on our side of the chamber. Uh, women on our side of the chamber have been subjected to some pretty horrendous treatment in recent days, and I would ask Senator Farrell that's most improper to um, reflect on women on this side of the chamber in that way. I would ask him to withdraw it. Uh, I'll, I'll, sorry, uh, Senator Minister, I'll just, uh, I, was, I was listening careful to the backwards and forwards and uh, Senator Farrell, it might, uh, you, you got pretty close to, I think, uh, some concerns that were raised, but it might help the Senator if you just ex uh, explained or maybe you finish your sentence because you didn't quite finish it and then if necessary I'll ask you to withdraw, but I'll, at this stage I won't. I was, um, thank you, Chair. I was complimenting women on uh, your side of the uh, bench, but if there was anything I said, I uh, unreservedly uh, uh, withdraw. <laughs> Senator Cash. Uh, we've established that, despite statements by the now government prior to the election, uh, and in particular even in relation to uh, the political commentary that the minister himself made in answering this question to reflect on the previous government, we have still established that under this government, in relation to the National Reconstruction Fund uh, board, 
the board positions themselves will not be publicly advertised. Can you then advise, will board positions themselves undergo a selection process, including interviews? Minister. My understanding is that there will be discussions uh, with the uh, candidates, but not formal interviews. <coughs> when you say discussions with candidates, have any of these candidates already been identified? Yes, sir. No. <laughs> when you say discussions, who will be having those discussions? Minister. The department. Will the minister be involved or the minister's office in any of the discussions? Minister. The, um, my understanding is the advice will go from the department to the minister and then the minister will ultimately make a decision. Senator Cash. Is the minister bound to, uh, bound to accept the recommendations from the department? Minister? No. Does that mean that the minister does not in any way need to accept the recommendations put forward by the department and on that base the minister could themselves put forward their own selection? Minister. I've already explained how the process is uh, going to uh, work. Um, there's a matrix. Um, the department will... Uh, will um, <coughs> Uh, propose uh, some names that will come to the minister, uh, and uh, the minister will make a decision post um, the receipt of, uh, of those names. It's very important to understand, because obviously there are other processes that will be gone through when these names are announced. The minister is not bound to accept the recommendations put forward by the department. I just want to confirm that means that the minister may themselves appoint anyone they like. Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, look, this is uh, standard practice uh, in terms of uh, the appointment of uh, board members uh, and um, uh, what, uh, what will happen here is consistent with what happens uh, typically in the appointment of board members both under the former government and, uh, and this government. Senator Cash. Uh, under section 19.2, it lists the experience or expertise relevant to being appointed. How was the conclusion reached that a person with experience in industrial relations was a qualified person for the purposes of a bill that establishes a quasi-bank for the manufacturing sector? Minister. I thought that would be an absolutely uh, fundamental feature of a uh, project as, as large <coughs> and uh, as ambitious as the National Reconstruction uh, Fund. Um, as I uh, said in the uh, <coughs> address I gave at the uh, um, start uh, today, um, we're looking uh, for uh, well-paid uh, jobs in this, uh, in this sector, um, high-skilled, well-paid uh, jobs, uh, and I would have thought um, the wonderful unions in this country who have contributed um, over decades to the creation of those uh, wonderful well-paid jobs um, would be in a very important feature of, uh, of any uh, board that um, sets out to be as ambitious as, uh, as this particular project. Senator Cash. With all due respect, I didn't mention unions, so I do find it interesting that you jumped straight to that. I actually mentioned qualified persons as defined in the Act, but it is interesting. And the problem I have with your answer and your natural inclination to talk about unions is in relation to the next question I have for you. Why was the decision undertaken then to include section 19.2.1, where it states any other experience the minister considers relevant is a suitable parameter for a board appointment, given in particular you said there was a skills matrix. Yes. Thank you, uh, Chair. 
Um, look, I don't think there's anything uh, for you to be concerned about there, um, Senator uh, Senator Cash. No, <coughs> um, the uh, the minister um, is a very very sensible fellow, and uh, if there are skills which um, he believes are obviously uh, vital for the success of this uh, project, let's let's understand this is an ambitious project. It's all about um, building things in Australia again. I can I was here very sadly on the day that your government, Senator Cash, pushed Holden out of this country. Um, this government is about uh, rebuilding Australia, rebuilding Australia, uh, making up for 10 years of neglect uh, in this sector um, and uh, getting back um, secure, hopefully full-time, uh, jobs uh, for Australian workers um, <clears throat> in, uh, in what will be um, you know, one of the great transformative uh, projects uh, of, this, uh, of this country. Um, and uh, rest assured that uh, the fellow to do that is uh, Mr Husick, the, uh, uh, the minister who's looking after this. And uh, I have the greatest confidence that the board he will select um, uh, will have all the requisite uh, um, talents and skills and abilities um, to make a success of this National Reconstruction Fund. Um, just before I give the call to Senator Cash, we'll just finish here with a couple lines of questions and then we'll go to Senator Norman Payne. Is that all right? Senator Cash. Uh, just, just in terms of the Minister's comments, with all due respect, Minister, I know you're enjoying this, I know you're smiling, and, that, and that's fine, I accept that. But for the fact that you're actually now a Minister of the Crown representing the government, I remember when I was on the other side and you used to ask questions and you demanded and expected an answer and we would do our very, very best to provide you with those answers. It is a great shame that you now treat the opposition and the people of Australia, quite frankly, with contempt. You do not even make an effort to try and answer any questions, whether it's in question time or whether it is now in the committee stage where we're subject to a guillotine in two and a half hours, two hours and 40 minutes, to try and understand better the way this bill will work. So based on the answers you have given to me, that there is no process basically stated for which these appointees will be selected from, other than there's a skills matrix, that the government will make recommendations to the minister. The minister doesn't have to regard any of those recommendations. Hang on, hang on. The minister will make recommendations to the minister. Uh, you've admitted that, with experience in industrial relations, goes straight to unions. Uh, any other experience? Well, the good news is the minister is the right person for the job, and we should just trust them. So, basically, in relation to this line of questioning, this leaves board positions open to anyone the minister may choose. Is that correct? Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Um, look, I thought I was being exceptionally uh, helpful by providing all of the information, and I uh, <coughs> completely reject your categorisation of my answers as uh, not answering your, your question. There are provisions in the bill as to how um, uh, appointments uh, will be made. There's a skills matrix. Um, there will be a selection process done by the department, not the minister, by the department. Names will, names will come up to the, uh, to the minister and a final process will be taken to select um, the, uh, the, the, the best possible board members um, to run what is a very ambitious uh, national reconstruction uh, fund in this, uh, in this country. Um, and I don't think there's anything that, uh, in saying, uh, saying all of that, uh, which is inconsistent with past practices uh, in terms of significant boards of appointments of these types of boards, uh, but more particularly, um, I don't think I could be any clearer about how that process is going to work. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Alman-Payne. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. Um, 
I'd like to begin by thanking the government for the constructive approach that they've taken uh, in relation to the negotiations for the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill. Um, and I hope that we can continue in that vein as we uh, proceed to discussing upcoming bills on housing. Um, the Greens took a policy for a manufacturing fund to the election, and we strongly support public investment in rebuilding manufacturing in Australia. Uh, and the amendments that the Greens secured in the House will ensure that the National Reconstruction Fund will be focused on creating high quality jobs across a diverse economy, particularly in regional Australia. Uh, we note that the previous government uh, did try and use public money through the Clean Energy Finance Corporation to fund coal and gas, uh, and they were unable to do so because of the guardrails that have been put in place on that bill. Uh, by Greens and Labor, and we are pleased that we now have the same assurance uh, that the NRF won't be used to fund the climate crisis. Uh, with respect to the government's uh, amendment on sheet 40, I wish to indicate that the Greens will be supporting that amendment, uh, which, amongst other things, means that the board must have regard to the Paris climate targets when making investment decisions. This is absolutely essential in a climate crisis. We also welcome the additional amendments which require the board to have regard to the desirability of creating secure jobs. A thriving industry base relies on the reversal of the trend of casualisation and insecure work. We support viable industries driven by good jobs and powered by renewables. Uh, at this point, I also want to first shadow that we are also in support of the amendment uh, by Senator Pocock on sheet 1895. Uh, we are not just in a climate crisis, we are also in a biodiversity crisis with the sixth mass extinction underway. So the Greens welcome this amendment from Senator Pocock and any consideration the NRF has towards biodiversity loss. Uh, during the inquiry into this bill and also into the National Energy Transition Authority, the importance of taking a regional development approach to decarbonising our economy and the value of creating renewable energy industrial precincts uh, was relayed by a number of witnesses. Uh, my question to the minister is, can the minister confirm whether the NRF will be able to create industrial green energy hubs within existing industrial areas? And if so, can the government provide examples of places where renewable energy industrial precincts could be developed using funds from the NRF? For example, would the NRF be able to invest in the development of green energy hubs in existing industrial zones in places like Gladstone, Townsville and the Hunter Valley? Minister. <coughs> thank you, uh, Senator uh, Orman Payne, for your contribution and um, thank uh, you for your support um, of this uh, and sensible engagement. Um, uh, with the government uh, about uh, this uh, this project, and I think your uh, um, your party's role is in stark contrast to the uh, the opposition um, <clears throat> in how one might go about getting constructive um, changes that uh, you'd like to see into uh, important pieces of federal uh, legislation. Um, <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> I should, you know, should congratulate you on the, uh, the approach that uh, you have taken in these discussions, uh, open-minded, genuinely interested in uh, making uh, the NRF bill better and security, securing positive outcomes for manufacturers and industry sectors um, that add value to Australian resources. Um, I've seen the report that the senator uh, references and the point uh, I would make is that uh, coordination across government is going to be vital to the uh, success of this uh, terrific project. With the uh, NFR rewiring the nation, powering the regions, as well as other government investment vehicles like the uh, North Australia Infrastructure Facility and Clean Energy Finance Corporation, we are confident that we're getting the right tools in place. That said, of course, the NRF board will determine investment decisions independently. Senator Hanson. I wish to take the minister back to the fact of um, how this board is going to be appointed. And you've actually made reference to the fact the department will be actually picking people who go onto the board, not the minister. 
Um, will the department be advertising for people to put the names forward who may have the experience and knowledge to actually apply for the, for the positions? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, Senator Hanson, thank you for your uh, question. I think you might have um, misunderstood what I, what I was saying there. So I'll just uh, run by the, the process again. Um, so <clears throat> the bill itself sets out um, a schools metric for the sort of people that um, the government believes is necessary to make a success of this uh, of this uh, new new body. Um, the department will then um, make us an assessment about those um, people with those relevant skills, and then we'll um, submit to the minister a list of the people that they believe have the appropriate skills. Um, to do uh, that job. <laughs> Senator Hanson. Minister, I, th I find it very hard to believe that a department will actually have a list of names on hand who they think that will fill this. You know, all jobs must be advertised and on a fair and you know, democratic basis um, that they should be able to apply for these positions. So where are the names going to come from in the first place? You know, um, someone's got to present those names. So it's either got to be the minister or the department is going to present these names. Why isn't this opened up to the best eligible people around the country who may apply for a position to work on the board? Why isn't it open for anyone to apply for this? Minister. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Chair. Well, look, there's nothing, nothing unusual about the process that's uh, going on here, Senator, um, Senator Hanson. Um, it's um, a practice that uh, governments adopt in terms of uh, the selection of the best people who um, we believe um, will be able to, uh, to do the job of uh, setting up this body and making a success of it. Um, I, I think you need to reference uh, particularly uh, section uh, 19.2 of the bill, which sets out a metric of the sorts of skills uh, that uh, a person is going to need uh, to be able to do the best for the country in terms of this new uh, new body, uh, and I think when you when you look at that matrix, you see the range of skills that um, people will be looking for. I think you should have some confidence that the department will be able to find the people um, that are best suited uh, for this job, uh, and uh, and uh, give those list of names to the minister to make a final determination as to who will be the best people in this country to do that job. Senator Hanson. Thank you. Minister, if we have set in place <clears throat> laws in this country where the corporations and organisations and businesses must advertise for jobs and can't just put a list of names forward who want it, that is against the law and you have, must um, you must open it up for people to apply for these positions. Why do you think that you or this government or this new department has the right to actually put in place people who they think um, will do the job. That's not complying with the laws of the nation. That's you impose on corporations and other businesses to follow the guidelines. Why do you think that you can actually do whatever you want to do? The Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, look, I don't believe what is being proposed here, uh, with due respect, uh, Senator Hanser, is contrary to the um, uh, to, uh, to the law. Uh, I think it's worthwhile noting that uh, Treasury does keep lists of people who have the skills and abilities to meet the uh, skills matrix that uh, is, in the, uh, is in the bill. And of course, it's the bill itself that's setting out the criteria for the selection of these people. So um, anybody who's interested and thinks they've got the skills, no doubt, you know, they can. Uh, make contact uh, with the department and say, "Look, have a look at me. I've got these. Um, I've got these qualifications." But as I said, Treasury does have um, uh, a list of uh, people who have skill sets um, in the uh, skills metric uh, that is set out in the legislation, and I'm very confident, uh, Senator Hanson, that the um, best possible people, the most skilled people. Uh, in this country, to build this, uh, to build this new organisation, this ambitious uh, organisation, 
uh, will be selected. And when you see the final list, um, you'll have great confidence that um, the best people in this country have been selected to do that job. <coughs> uh, Senator Hanson. Question. Um, just tell me, uh, people whose names are maybe on that list um, for the bill, would they be union reps? Uh, the minister. Look, I um, I hope so. I hope there are some uh, union representatives uh, on the uh, on the on the board because, of course, um, one of the objectives of this uh, or key objective of this uh, new uh, new fund is to uh, ensure that uh, we get um, uh, high-paid, well-skilled uh, jobs. So, uh, um, but. Just because they're on the list doesn't mean that they're the people that the department is going to select and the department may decide that the particular skills that um, a union official or for that matter a representative of uh, business might have with uh, skills in industrial relations um, may not be the best people to, uh, to be on the board. Um, let, let's wait to see that process, uh, process work. I, um, I'm very confident that the department um, will come up with the best possible names um, of people who, uh, uh, who will do uh, the job that we want them to do to start rebuilding Australia, uh, high paid, um, <coughs> secure, um, important innovative jobs in this country is what we need. We've had 10 years of uh, inaction under the previous government. We're about to start building things in Australia again. Of course, you're well aware of the submarines that we're going to uh, start building uh, in due course. Um, we, this government wants to build things in Australia like we used to do, like we used to do in uh, Elizabeth in South Australia, build terrific Holden cars, like we used to do in Victoria, build terrific Toyota cars. Um, we want to start building things in Australia again. Um, the people that are going to ultimately be on this board will be the people that will oversee that process. And I think when you see the final list of names, um, you'll be satisfied that we've selected the best people, um, the most qualified people uh, that this country has um, to, uh, uh, to run this fund. Senator Hume. Uh, yes, Senator Hume. I'll come back to you, Senator Ormontain. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, has the minister conferred with industry, in particular the manufacturing industry, on the impacts of higher energy prices that will result from the government's deal with the Greens and um, if that deal will impact the projects that could potentially be eligible for this fund? Look, I'm, I'm not sure how you link the passing of this bill with um, the issue of um, high electricity prices as we as we discovered after we came to office, of course, um, your government failed to disclose um, increases in, uh, in electricity, uh, electricity prices. Um, and uh, this government has been a government that's been putting downward pressure on electricity prices by caps um, on, uh, on gas, caps on uh, coal. And I, I pay tribute to the outgoing Premier of uh, New South Wales, uh, Premier uh, Perrottet, who, um, to his credit, uh, was prepared to join forces with the federal government um, to assist in pushing that downward pressure on electricity prices. So this is not a government that's interested in high electricity prices. We want pre prices lower. Um, we don't keep them a secret. We don't keep them under wraps. We don't change the dates for disclosure of them like the previous government uh, does. Uh, we acknowledge <coughs> the problems that are existing right around the world at the moment as a, re as a result of the terrible war between uh, Ukraine and, uh, and Russia. Um, and uh, we believe uh, in putting downward pressure on those prices, uh, but there's nothing in this uh, bill um, that uh, would in any way see uh, an upward pressure on, uh, on electricity prices. Senator Hume. 
So, thank you, Minister. But what I asked was whether the minister has conferred with industry since this deal was done, potentially on the impacts of this deal on the manufacturing sector and on the projects that might be eligible for this fund. And if you have consulted with industry, I'd be interested in knowing who in industry you have consulted with since the deal was done. And if you haven't consulted with industry, I'd be interested to know why you haven't consulted with industry. The, minis the minister. Uh, look, um, knowing uh, Senator, uh, uh, Minister Rahusik as I do, um, he's a great one for consultation. I don't think we've ever had uh, a minister in this space who uh, consults more uh, and talks with uh, manufacturers about all of the issues uh, which are currently uh, affecting, affecting them. I don't want to reveal confidential um, cabinet uh, discussions, but I think I can say this. Um, there's no, uh, no finer minister in this uh, space who is uh, prepared to uh, go into bat for uh, manufacturers. I'm sure uh, that he talks to them about a whole range of issues, including electricity prices. In fact, uh, I'm told that um, they frequently um, complain that uh, the previous government uh, completely ignored their, uh, uh, their issues uh, around uh, rising uh, electricity prices. And it's a breath, a breath of fresh air that you've got a minister who's uh, prepared to sit down with them, listen to their concerns uh, and take some action. And I might say um, those stakeholders that you refer to are very, very supportive of the legislation. And it's a pity um, that the uh, opposition have decided to deal themselves out of this process. Um, I've already gone through what I thought was a very good process last week in dealing with one piece of legislation that I know you were involved in uh, directly, uh, Senator Hume. Um, <clears throat> some of your colleagues could take uh, uh, a feather out of uh, your cap and follow the very sensible way in which um, uh, discussions should take place. Um, we, do, <clears throat> we do want the opposition to be involved in these processes the constant negativity and uh, saying no, I don't think um, does you uh, any, any good. Well, it is, it is frustrating, uh, uh, Senator McKenzie, that, that, that um, you, you sit there and you just keep saying no. If you really wanted, if you really Order. wanted, Order. if you really Order. wanted, if you really wanted to be an alternative party in of government and I'm starting to think now maybe things are so bad and you've lost so many elections uh, that maybe, maybe you've lost any hope of ever becoming uh, an alternative uh, party of uh, government. Uh, but if you are serious about being an alternative party of government, then one of the criteria, one of the criteria for that is engaging with the government of the day. Um, if you've, look, look at what the Greens did. You know, they, they didn't just roll over. Uh, Minister, resume your seat. Senator, Senator Brockman. The minister is performing as he does in question time. He is not talking about the bill. He is going off on a flight of fancy of his own. Could you please bring him back to the question and back to the bill? Thank you, Senator Brockman. Um, I'll go back to the minister and ask you to uh, turn your attention towards the question. Thank Again. You. Thank, thank you, Chair. I, I was just offering some helpful advice to a party that's just lost, uh, finally, government in every state in the country. So they've lost federal government. They've lost every. I'm just trying to offer them some advice on how, on how, on how they might, how they might want to re-engage, firstly, with the stakeholders who've got a vital interest in this issue and who are supporting. Who are supporting? Who are supporting the government in this regard? I've been answering your questions. Plus, plus, I'm trying to give you some advice, some help. Just trying to help you. I mean, I. <laughs> thank you, Minister Senator Hume. Thank you, um, thank you, Chair. Just for the minister's information, I have dozens of questions here that we would really like the answers to, and I am still on question one, and I've asked it three times oh, now. So I will go back. 
and remind you that the deal with the Greens was only done yesterday. It was only done yesterday. So can you confirm, not that Minister Husick is a good fella, because I'm sure he is, but that whether he has in fact consulted with industry since that time, since the deal was announced, or potentially whether industry was consulted before the deal was announced. And if it was consulted either before the deal was announced or since the deal was announced, who in industry did the minister consult? Was it a peak body? Was it an individual manufacturer? Was it somebody that would qualify for this fund? Who is it that the minister has spoken to since this deal was done? Thank you, Senator Hume. The minister. Uh, thank you, um, um, Chair. Um, the, um, uh, the minister frequently talks about uh, talks to um, stakeholders in this uh, this industry, gets their uh, views. I mean, for instance, only today I was talking to the Minerals Council about uh, their views on a range of uh, pieces of legislation. I think. You're conflating two different pieces of legislation here uh, um, with respect, Senator Hume. This is not a piece of legislation about the safeguards. We'll move to that later on uh, this evening after we've passed this, uh, passed this legislation. We're here talking about the National Reconstruction Fund, and I personally think that um, your questions ought to be directed to that fund and not conflating um, another issue. <coughs> The minister, uh, sorry, Senator Hume. For that patronising response. Yes, you're correct. There was a deal done with the Greens on the safeguards mechanisms, and that will have an effect on energy prices. There is no doubt about that. And I'm asking you Absolutely. whether that effect on energy prices that will not put downward pressure, as you continue to insist, but will in fact put upward pressure on energy prices, whether that will have an effect on the National Reconstruction Fund, on the manufacturers that are going to potentially participate in the National Reconstruction Fund and potentially those who may be eligible for this fund. Has the minister spoken to any of the manufacturers or peak bodies about whether higher energy prices be resulting from the deal that you have done, that your government has done with the Greens, is going to affect their eligibility for the National Reconstruction Fund? Thank you, Senator Hume. The Minister. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, the, the deal that we have done uh, with the Greens to decarbonise our uh, economy, set up the uh, safeguards um, for um, the, the future um, move to uh, zero emissions by 2050, um, is going to put downward pressure we're talking about moving to the cheapest form of energy, which is renewable energy. That's solar energy. I mean, <clears throat> you had a policy. You had a policy that you took to the last election of zero emissions by 2050. We've started the process. Um, do you have a point of order, Senator Hume? Now, four times, whether the minister has spoken to anybody in industry about whether higher energy prices caused by the deal that your government has done with the Greens is going to affect their eligibility for this fund. Um, Senator Hume, you've asked about Four times. You, you've asked about energy, you've asked about deals with the Greens, and I can't direct the minister how to answer, but I, 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 I draw him to to your question, the minister. Well. I mean, I, I don't think I can be any clearer, with all due respect, um, Senator Hume. The agreement, uh, the agreement with the Greens in respect of safeguards is going to put downward pressure. We're talking about decarbonising our economy. Uh, we're talking about a switch to a cheaper form of energy. Now, you don't have to agree with that proposition, and I can see uh, Senator Holly um, uh, Hume um, uh, um, Holly Hughes, um, 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 order. So, so um, um, 
I simply don't agree. I don't agree with your proposition. Res resume, I mean, your, resume your seat, Minister. Uh, yes, Senator. Tonight, to look at fifteen billion dollars worth of Senator taxpayer McKenzie, funding. Your, Can you, what is your point of order? It's incredibly frustrating to it, on relevance. Please draw the minister to the question. If he doesn't have the answer, it's okay. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Um, I, it, it is a wide-ranging discussion, and I have drawn the minister to the question, uh, and the minister uh, has the call. Thank you, Chair. Look, I can't be any clearer. I don't yes, accept. Clearer. I don't accept the proposition that the arrangement with the Greens pushes up electricity prices. The whole point of the agreement is to put downward pressure on electricity prices. But this is not this this is <laughs> I could say the same about your questions, uh, with due respect, uh, Senator McKenzie. Um, no, I, I I can't give you the answer that you want because I don't accept the proposition that you're asking me about. Um, Look, the minister frequently speaks with stakeholders in this area. I mean, I've, he, he, he's a bloke who goes out of his way to consult in a way that your government, uh, when you were in office for 10 years, nine years, you never, ever did. This is a bloke who consults, he listens, and he brings um, that, that knowledge um, to the cabinet table. Um, thank you, Minister. I'm just going to uh, deal with the call. So I know that um, Senator Almond Payne wants the call, and I also know that Senator Pocock has an amendment to move. I might just clarify, Senator Pocock. Sorry, we can't move the amendment. We're dealing with the government. We've got government. It's an amendment to the government's amendment, so I've, I've been advised that it might be convenient for the chamber for Senator Pocock to move his amendment to the government's amendment. But Senator Pocock, I have got Senator Roman Payne who wants to speak. So if you want to speak to your amendment, I'll I'll go to Senator Roman Payne before you. Um, we all have questions. Yeah. Senator Roman Payne. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I note the earlier substantial number of questions around the board and the appointment of the board. Uh, in that vein, then, I would like to foreshadow that the Greens will be supporting um, the Jackie Lambie Network Amendment on Sheet 1886, which expands the board membership from six to eight members. Um, we think that given the range of fields uh, set out in Clause 19 uh, of expertise that the board will require, that expanding out uh, the number of people on the board will make it far more likely that the board will be comprised of members who have a greater depth of expertise, credibility and standing in their respective fields. Uh, in that vein, also, we will be supporting Senator Pocock's amendment uh, on sheet 1909, which reduces the term of the board appointments from five to four years and brings forward the independent review from five to three. Uh, we think that reducing the term of board appointments from five to four years does create the right balance between consistency and flexibility. Um, we also think that bringing forward the independent review from five years to 2026 provides the opportunity to ensure that the fund is operating as intended reasonably soon after it becomes fully operational. Uh, also in relation to the board, then, the Greens will be opposing uh, the Jackie Lambie Network uh, Amendment on Sheet 1885. This is the amendment that requires the board to submit a strategic direction overview to the minister every five years and gives the minister the capacity to reject or not approve the strategic direction of the NRF. Uh, we think the Greens think that making it a requirement uh, that the minister approve the strategic plan given to, given to them by the board actually gives undue influence uh, to the government of the day over the NRF, and we think that it's important that the board can maintain a level of independence from the government, uh, and so hence we won't be supporting that amendment. The Minister. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Chair. Uh, can I uh, thank uh, Senator Orman Payne for um, her uh, clarity um, in respect of uh, those amendments? and indicate that the government will be supporting, as you are, um, the Lambie Amendment to increase uh, the number of members of the board from six to eight. 
Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I move the amendment on sheet uh, 1895, standing in my name. This amendment seeks to ensure that in performing its functions, the independent board of the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation must have regard to Australia's international obligations and commitments. Senator Pocock, sorry to interrupt you, sure. but the clerk's just advised me that um, you need to seek leave to move your amendments one and two together. Oh, sorry, I just thought it was the one amendment, my bad. Um, so if you just... Um, I seek, seek leave to move amendments one and two on sheet 1895, standing my name. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Pocock. <laughs> I move the amendments. Uh, apologies about that. Um, this amendment simply seeks to make explicit that the board will consider our international commitments under the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework and any such any subsequent global biodiversity frameworks in which Australia is a party. Uh, shamefully, biodiversity loss is something that Australia has been grappling with for decades. We go to conventions, we sign up uh, to uh, non-binding agreements, then we come back home and, and we, we don't take the steps necessary to actually look after our incredible biodiversity. As a mega-diverse country, uh, this is something that we should be putting in, in every new body that we set up. There should be a regard to Australia's biodiversity and the impacts that um, any activities will have. Uh, we've got a shameful record. We have a government that is committed to no new extinctions. I believe it's, it's a commitment that is welcomed by Australians, but that's going to take real work from, from all of us to, to actually deliver on that. So I commend this, this amendment. Uh, I believe it really is in line with uh, what the government have promised the Australian people that they will will do, and I would urge the, the Senate to support it and to begin to better look after this incredible content that we get to call home. The Minister. Thank you, um, Chair, and thank uh, Senator P uh, Pocock for his um, contribution. Uh, protecting uh, biodiversity is extremely important to the Albanese government. <coughs> Australia's history is full of, as he said, uh, too much uh, disrespect and uh, uh, destruction uh, for the biodiversity of this great country, uh, and we must uh, and we will do better. However, the best place for these issues to be dealt with um, is in the EPBC Act, and uh, that's why the government will be opposing uh, this amendment. Senator Hume. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, I, I quote from the IMF's staff report on the Report of Australia's Article 4 consultation around the inflationary risks that currently exist in Australia from the IMF's point of view. And it says that implementation of the below the line of below the line activity through newly created investment vehicles in brackets the National Reconstruction Fund, Rewiring the Nation and Housing Australia Future Fund should be phased appropriately and more broadly a proliferation of such vehicles should be avoided. Do you agree with that statement? Minister. Um, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank uh, Senator Hume for her question. Um, much of the current inflationary pressures are caused by uh, global factors, uh, including the uh, supply chain uh, restraints and, of course, the terrible war in uh, Russia and Ukraine. Investments uh, of the corporation will build capability, resilience and productivity in Australian manufacturing, improving the supply side of the economy and helping to place downward pressure on inflation. So um, we would suggest uh, the opposite, I think, of what uh, you were suggesting. Further, um, corporation investments uh, will be phased over time and avoid adding to the current demand pressure. Senator Hume. No, thank you, Chair. Minister, perhaps you might want to correct the record. Are you suggesting that the government disagrees with the IMF on what the inflationary risks for Australia, in fact, are, and that this fund is, in fact, creating an increased inflationary risk for Australia? Do you disagree with the IMF? Minister. 
Um, I'll just repeat um, what I said a, a moment ago. We believe, we believe uh, that um, in the way in which we've uh, crafted and designed this particular fund, uh, it will put downward pressure on, uh, uh, on inflation and, of course, do all the other terrific things that uh, we say it will do, which is to create uh, well-paid uh, jobs um, in, uh, in industry and start rebuilding this country. Senator Hume. Thank you, Chair. So, Minister, if you are disagreeing with the IMF, can I then ask, what is it, is it your contention then that you or your government are more qualified to assess Australia's fiscal position than the IMF? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, it's um, our contention that after the nine years of uh, neglect of uh, Australian jobs, where you sat back and um, essentially pushed companies like Holden's out of this country, uh, that we're going to start rebuilding this country. We're going to start making things again um, in this country, and we're going to do it in a non-inflationary way. Um, all of the things that you failed to do in your nine years of neglect of a government, um, we intend to repair. We intend to start that process of rebuilding, creating good, well-paid jobs in this country. Senator Hume. So, can I just confirm, then, Minister, you believe that the IMF is wrong? Minister. Thank you, Chair. I, I believe that uh, this bill is not going to uh, add to inflation, and on the contrary, it's going to. Um, rebuild, rebuild the Australian economy. We're going to start making things in this country, things like uh, <coughs> Senator Pocock would have been familiar with in uh, Elizabeth in South Australia, where we used to make um, terrific Holden cars. Um, we lost all that. We lost all that under, uh, under your um, government. We are going to start rebuilding this country and we're going to start rebuilding it with good, well-paid, innovative jobs. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, Minister, just in relation to the amendments that were moved by Mr Bant in the House, has the department asked for modelling from the department as to the impact that these amendments will have on industry? Minister. Thank you, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Cash for her uh, question. Uh, the NRF is first and foremost a manufacturing fund. It is uh, designed to grow our capacity and our capabilities to ensure Australia can once again be a country that makes things. It was never intended to fund the extraction of minerals or any, um, of, of any form. It was never intended to uh, log timber in any form. So when the Greens asked us to confirm that by including in the legislation, we were happy to put it in. <coughs> Senator Cash. Um, Minister, has the department briefed the minister on the impacts these amendments would have on the forestry industry? And I do note Senator Dunham um, is in the chamber, in particular in Tasmania. Minister. I that uh, question in my previous response. <laughs> Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, can the minister please elaborate on prohibited investments and how far-reaching these would be down particular supply chains? Minister. Yeah, um, as I said previously, um, the fund uh, won't fund uh, extraction or uh, or logging. Sorry. Senator Cash. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, could I just ask you to elaborate on what prohibited investments are? Perhaps we'll tackle that part of the question first. Take me through what prohibited investments are. Once we've established that, 
we can then go on to the impact potentially on supply chains. Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Chair. Uh, look, I can only repeat what I've said uh, earlier uh, now on the third occasion. It won't fund extraction and it won't fund logging. Senator Cash. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Chair. Um, the bill doesn't include grants to individuals or companies as a means of financial accommodation. Uh, just in terms of the policy rationale for this, on what basis was this ruled out? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Cash for her question. Uh, the corporation uh, will be a commercial entity generating a positive rate of return over time. Returns, <coughs> returns on investments uh, will be available for future investment by the corporation ensuring that the corporation can continue to provide targeted, transformative finance. Providing grants uh, would erode the corporation's capital value over time and would undermine the corporation's ability to deliver returns. Senator Cash. Can I just ask in terms of what consideration has been given to the fact that the NRF will actually operate alongside the CEFC and the EFA? What considerations were given in relation to that? Minister. I'm sorry, I just got slightly distracted no, no, no. by my colleague. Would you mind repeating that question? So what consideration has been given to the fact that the National Reconstruction Fund will operate alongside the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and the Export Finance Association? Minister. Chair, and thanks uh, Senator Cash for her question. <coughs> there are a number of existing investment vehicles across government, each uh, with distinctive functions and powers tailored to the delivery of uh, specific policy outcomes. <coughs> and you've just mentioned a number of them. Uh, the corporation, uh, guided by the investment mandate, will work closely with other investment bodies, uh, including the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and the North Australia Infrastructure Facility, to, un uh, to avoid unnecessary duplication. Senator Cash. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, just in terms of the three NRF priority areas, so renewable and low emissions technologies, evaluating resources and defence capability, um, that will actually overlap with the existing CFC um, or, for example, the EFA funds or facilities. How is that going to be addressed in practice? Minister. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Cash. Um, look, it's a manufacturing fund, and I um, referred in the previous answer I gave you. Um, the, the aim is to avoid duplication. So um, those other funds that you were referring to um, won't operate in this space, um, <coughs> and this fund won't operate in their, in their space. Senator Cash. Thank you, Chair. I understand you said that that is the aim, but I just need to understand how is it going to be addressed in practice when the fund is set up? Minister. Oh, thanks, uh, Chair. Thank Senator Cash. Um, well, look, that'll, that'll be part of the job of the board, I guess, to establish um, the guidelines to, to do that and for the people who are going to be working uh, in this space uh, to ensure that um, what I've just said, which is uh, no unnecessary uh, duplication, um, is in fact uh, carried out. And uh, again, I <coughs> have great confidence that uh, that will in fact be the case. Senator Cash. Okay, so now we've established it's going to be the job of the board, as you said, to establish the guidelines. Um, when will the board commence establishing the guidelines? Minister. When they're appointed. 
Senator Cash. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just in terms of the fund itself, will it provide an investment brokering service for proponents and other investors to complement and leverage the NRF funding? Minister. Thanks, uh, Chair, and um, <coughs> thanks, Senator Cash. To answer that question, I think we, we need a little bit more information, um, particularly about uh, what you mean by um, investment brokerage. Senator Cash. How about we start at the other end then? What is the process for withdrawing NRF funding from a proponent? In what circumstances can the NRF, NRF funding be withdrawn? Minister. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank uh, Senator Cash. Um, that would be a commercial um, transaction, and obviously. Um, being a commercial transaction, um, um, there would be um, terms in that uh, agreement uh, that would determine how that uh, issue might be dealt with. Senator Cash. Exactly. Um, just in terms of then the proponents themselves, Will the NRF assist proponents through other regulatory processes? So, for example, if they are in a medical or resources priority area, such as the TGA approvals or EPA approvals? Minister. No. <laughs> Senator Cash. Uh, just in terms of the NRF and what it purports to support. So we have transformation and diversification in Australian industry. When we talk about transformation and diversification, what range of metrics will be used when measuring transformation and diversification in terms of the achievements? Minister. Thank you, um, Chair, and thanks, Senator Cash. Look, these, these will all be matters uh, for uh, the board to uh, determine uh, upon its uh, appointment. <coughs> Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to return to some questions on forestry, if I may. Um, and in relation to uh, the general inclusion of forestry, what level of consultation occurred with the industry to include what has been included in this program? Minister. The um, <coughs> minister, uh, of course, uh, consults uh, very widely in uh, in the lead up to this uh, uh, legislation uh, coming forward, and uh, he made sure that he consulted with all of the people that needed to be um, consulted with before the legislation was uh, introduced. <coughs> Senator Dunningham. Specifically, was the forestry industry consulted on the provisions that are being brought forward in this bill? Minister. Uh, the minister uh, consulted uh, broadly and, and widely uh, to ensure that the bill reflected um, what uh, industry wanted, and of course, um, the bill that you have before you today does reflect all of those uh, all of those matters. 
Dunningham. Um, I can only infer from that that uh, there wasn't a direct consultation. You're saying broadly, but it's not clear to me whether there was actually a conversation between, for example, ACPA or the VFPA or TFPA and the government around what's in, what's out here. Um, we've already had a bit of a discussion about the prohibited uh, investments um, and indeed the Australian Greens press release that I read in Two Hansard the other day, which uh, and I, I know it was sort of touched on before as all well, this amazing level of cooperation that we're seeing be between Labor and the Greens, which is alarming on industries like forestry um, and more generally, but uh, power sharing government, yes. Um, but I would be interested to explore this prohibited investments uh, criteria. Uh, the three areas that have been outlined, the um, extraction of coal or natural gas, the uh, construction of pipeline infrastructure, or finance the logging of native forests. I think I heard you say earlier on that that was never the intention of the government. Was it then added in later on as uh, an internal amendment after, after a consultation draft or something? Yes, Dan. And uh, thank you, uh, Senator Dunningham, for your question. The NRF is uh, first and foremost a manufacturing fund. It is designed to grow our capacity and our capabilities to ensure Australia can once again be a country that makes things. It was never intended to, to fund the extraction of minerals uh, of any form and never intended to uh, log uh, timber in any form. Um, <clears throat> so when the Greens asked us to confirm that by including that in the legislation, we were happy to put it in. <clears throat> Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay, so uh, never the intention, so it's now in legislation. Uh, and if I look at the legislation in section 63, it, uh, I've already listed those uh, three areas there. Uh, it talks then, just past those three areas in subsection four, native forest does not include a plantation, and plantation means an intensively managed stand of trees that is created by the regular placement of seedlings or seed. The Subsection 3 is expressly prohibiting financing of native forest logging. Is plantation logging covered? Uh, is that something you can seek funding for under this bill? Minister. Uh, look. Uh, the, the, the words I've used are logging, um, Senator Dunham, and I think um, it's fair to say that that includes um, the sorts of logging that you're precisely asking questions about. And I don't think I can be any clearer that it's not the intention um, of the fund to fund logging. Senator Dunningham. So then I'd ask, Minister, why the bill only specifically references the logging of native forests and not plantations as well. If the government's intent is to, and you're being clear in your contributions here, why the legislation, unless it was just something to appease certain people one government shares power with, I, d I don't understand why you'd exclude that if it is something for which financing can't be approved. Minister. This was the... Uh amendment that the Greens asked for, but it was never intended um, that the, le the uh, legislation provide for logging in, uh, in any form. Senator Dunningham. So despite the legislation prescribing only a prohibited investment as financing of logging of native forests, the government is now indicating that it is also prohibiting investments in logging of plantation as well. And if that is the case, if the minister can confirm that that is the case, uh, when was industry consulted on that particular development? The, um, this is all about value adding manufacturing um, in this, uh, in this uh, country, um, the sort of value adding that uh, <coughs> Your government uh, failed to do, but this government is uh, is intent on uh, on doing. Um, and uh, you know, we intend to proceed to rebuild um, 
manufacturing in this country and uh, we, we're going to be doing it uh, by the use of, uh, of this fund. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so I, I just had a specific question was, when was industry advised that uh, logging of plantation forestry was also a prohibited investment, given we are now being told that that is indeed the government's position? Minister. Look, I indicated um, on now numerous occasions that uh, this uh, minister, Minister Husik, has uh, uh, consulted uh, widely before bringing this uh, bill to, um, to the parliament. Um, as I said, uh, I don't think there's been a minister who has been uh, so consultative uh, with all of the various uh, groups uh, that were needed to uh, be uh, <coughs> consulted about the, uh, about the legislation. Uh, and uh, I think what you see before you today is a reflection of a bill that matches the needs of uh, this country to start manufacturing again, start rebuilding the manufacturing sector that was so badly uh, treated by the former government. I've mentioned uh, um, what happened to uh, Holdens in South Australia and the disgraceful way in which uh, the former government chased that country out of uh, that that company out of this uh, this country. Um, this is a bill designed to reverse that nine years of neglect. It's designed to rebuild manufacturing in this country and it's been done both in um, opposition but now more particularly in government um, as a result of um, extensive discussion with all of the stakeholders uh, who needed to be uh, consulted before this legislation was presented to the parliament. Senator McKenzie. Thank you. I move that the committee now report progress. Question. question there's no debate. So the question is that the committee now report progress. Those for the question say aye. Aye. Against, no. No. I think the noes have it. Aye. Is the division required? Division is required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the committee report progress. Those, question, those for the question pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left of the chair. I point a teller for the eye, Senator Askew, and teller for the nose, Senator Shikoni. Honourable Senators, there have been 27 ayes and 33 noes. It is passed in the negative. Seeking the call, we are, but we we never left committee. Left chair. So, honourable senators, before I give the call to Senator Dunningham, we currently have before the chair the motion moved by Senator David Pocock, which is an amendment to the government amendment, which was originally moved on sheet UC140. The call goes to Senator Dunningham. Well, it's great to be back. Thank you, chair. Uh, so, look, we've. Um established the uh, fact that there was no consultation with the industry um, because there was no confirmation that specifically cons consultation occurred. I think we've also established the fact that there was no advice to industry that plantation logging was excluded even though it's not expressly listed in the legislation. So uh, yes, you might need that. Um, uh, but uh, which is uh, disturbing. But I do want to come to uh, the line of questioning that Senator Cash was uh, going down with regard to the supply chain. So uh, the logging of timber, native and plantation, is prohibited according to the government. 
Um, can I ask about the value add, and we'll start with native forestry. Uh, could you please step me through what applications might be supported or funded under this program for value add for native forest timber? Minister. Uh, the, um, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Dunham for his uh, question. The uh, Priority Areas Declaration will be a disallowable legislative instrument made jointly by the Minister of Finance and the Minister for Industry. The government has previously announced the seven areas of the economy that will be the basis of the first declaration to be made soon after the bill receives royal assent. The details of each area are still being considered, taking into account the comprehensive consultation conducted by the government in late 2022 and early 2023. Given that the government has not yet made a final decision on the drafting of the declaration, it is not possible for, to rule out uh, <coughs> rule out uh, particular projects or technologies in or out. <coughs> Senator Dunningham. So we don't know what will be supported other than this general nebulous concept that there will be value adding job creating projects supported. Um, <coughs> are there any other programs within government that would support the forestry industry uh, in the same way that this program is envisaged to do? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Dunham for his question. Um, the government is delivering a record $300 million uh, in measures to the forestry sector that will support the expansion of the plantation estate, modernise our timber manufacturing, and build forestry workforce skills. These measures include $112 million. Point $112.9 million accelerate adoption of wood processing innovative fund. Um, that's been uh, had strong interest, I might add, <coughs> with 84 applications received by the uh, 28th of February 2023 deadline. <coughs> $86.2 million in support over five years from uh, 2022 to 2023 through the support plantation. <coughs> Uh, establishment program, which is fully subscribed and will support the establishment of at least uh, 36,000 hectares of new plantations. The $100 million for the Australian uh, Australia-wide National Institute for the Forest Products Innovation, $10 million for the Forestry Workforce Training Program, and we're also taking steps to remove the water rule that will provide further incentives for plantation and farm forestry participation in the Emissions Reductions Fund. Senator Dunningham. Uh, so two questions flowing on from that. Uh, one, I presume that anything the forestry industry is eligible to apply for under the programs you've just mentioned, particularly the uh, Forest and Wood Innovation Grant Program, would preclude them, or they wouldn't be able to apply under this program? So if I could have confirmation of that. Uh, additionally, in relation to the commitment that the, a, and the, well, the Labor government will reserve $500 million for agriculture, forestry and fisheries out of the National Reconstruction Fund, the commitment that was made prior to the election, can I understand how that figure was arrived at? Thank you. Uh, 
Minister. Uh, uh, Senator, uh, it, it wouldn't necessarily prohibit um, an ap application um, under uh, under this fund. What was your second uh, question there? I just uh, down down the, <clears throat> the second one. A commitment was made by the then opposition, now government. Uh, that $500 million out of the NRF will be reserved for ag, fish and forest. I'm just wondering how we arrived at that dollar figure, given the lack of clarity around um, consultation and, of course, how, what sort of projects would be eligible. Minister. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank uh, Senator um, Dunningham. I, uh, look, I reject the suggestion that there was lack of consultation. I think I've made it very clear that uh, Senate, um, Minister Rahusik has been one of the great communicators of, uh, of this country uh, and this government, and uh, he, uh, he extensively uh, consults um, and discusses uh, with uh, the manufacturing uh, industry in this country. Um, uh, as to your specific question, well, of course, that was a, an election commitment. Um, that we made in the uh, lead up to the, uh, the last election, and uh, as we've done in all of our other uh, election commitments, we've honoured those election commitments. Um, we are bringing them to the parliament, and it's just a pity that uh, the opposition have decided uh, not to engage uh, and uh, try and uh, um, progress what the Australian people voted for. Uh, namely an Albanese Labor government, uh, and try and progress um, what we took to the Australian people, which uh, they voted for, um, and try and have a sensible input to try and improve the legislation if you think there are ways in which um, it is, um, is deficient, as the Greens have done. They've, they've come forward and said, look, as Senator Pocock has done, he's looked at the legislation and said, look, um, yes, he's giving me a big smile there. <coughs> uh, <coughs> happy fellow. Yeah, we'll give him a wave. There we go. little wave. Um, so so um, the opportunity is there. It's, it's still there. still there, an opportunity. If you... If you really seriously want to be a party of government, if you seriously want to be a party of government ever again, and look, I know Saturday's result, I was looking at you all today and yesterday and the sad faces when you'd started to think that wall to wall uh, Labor governments, uh, state, 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 and state and, uh, state and federal, uh, and uh, no, no, no prospect. No prospect of resurrection uh, for the for, for the party, um, and it must be must for a part you know the the born to rule party um, to be in a situation uh, a situation like that. But there's still a chance, Senator Mackenzie. There's still a chance. There's still a chance if 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 there are some people if there are some people on the other side uh, who can. Um, push the issue of engaging with the government about our policies. Uh, if you've got ideas uh, that you think can improve this fund and do what we want to do, which is revitalise uh, manufacturing uh, uh, <coughs> uh, in this country, recognise that the last nine years were wasted years in this respect, recognise, recognise that you've now got an opportunity to make up for those nine wasted years, make a contribution. Make a contribution by supporting the uh, the proposition that we start building things in this country again. Um, but but do it constructively. Do it constructively. Take the opportunity. If you're that interested in uh, the forestry industry in uh, in Tasmania, uh, come and come and. You know, come and discuss with us how you think uh, any of our policies, and I've listed a whole um, host of them before, very significant uh, investment uh, in, the, uh, in the forestry industry. Come and talk to us about it. <clears throat> our door is always open. Um, our door is always open. We, we like Tasmania. 
We love going down there. I, you know, the talk about forestry products. I went to the Wooden Boat Festival uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, <coughs> it 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 was a terrific event. Terrific event. Um, record numbers. Record numbers uh, at the uh, at that event. So come and talk to us. If you've got suggestions, start engaging this negativity, this idea that you sit back there and say no, no to everything. It's not, it's not going to endear you to the Australian people. It's not going to endear you to the Australian people. Senator Dunningham. Yeah, I mean, that was highly unusual, I have to say. Quite the um, ramble around the backyard there on those issues. But look, if I can just, there's a couple of things. One, you can't improve the unimprovable, this bill, uh, which is why we've arrived at the position we've arrived at. And the alarming pattern that seems to be emerging here where the Australian Labor Party go to their natural bedfellows, the Australian Greens, and do deals as they do. One thing I wanted to point out, colleagues, as I ask a question shortly about the prohibited investment list was something that struck me as passing strange. Here we are on one day dealing with two bits of legislation, the one before us now about revitalising the economy and creating manufacturing jobs, highly well paid ones, highly skilled, etc. Uh, to refer to the minister's comments. And then, on the other hand, we've got a bill coming up which is going to tax the life out of manufacturing in this country. So the government says, oh, we're going to help you get jobs, we're going to bring industry here, we're going to restart manufacturing, but we're going to tax the life out of it. How does it work? What, what's going on with this inconsistent, incoherent government policy? Well, I, and that is a great question, um, Senator Scar, and I'm sure you'll be able to ask the minister in a moment what could possibly go wrong. But I, I want to ask my final question because I know other colleagues have questions too. And the final question I have is with regard to the prohibited investments list, we stumbled upon one which is also prohibited, and that is plantation logging. Are there any other sectors of the economy? Are there any other minerals to be extracted? Are there any other types of investments that are prohibited that are not expressly listed in the legislation? If so, I think it would be a great time to tell the Australian community what they are, because I don't want them finding out after applications open and suddenly they can't apply. I think you need to be upfront with Australia. Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you Chair, and thanks uh, Senator Dunham for his, um, his question. Look, I've already answered that question. I think I've answered it two or three times. Please refer to my previous uh, answers. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, with respect to the deal that Labor has done with the Greens this week, I think the Minister needs a glass of water. He's been on his feet for a while and you've got a long time to go. Um, the deal that you've done with the Greens will see 84 that 84 per cent of the 215 um, facilities that are going to be penalised under this deal are actually located in rural and regional Australia. Can you outline for me how this fund will assist them to deal the with the sustainability issues as a result of your deal that you've done the safeguard um, mechanism with the Greens? Senator Scar. Mr. President, a very important question from my colleague Senator McKenzie, but, but I must draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Ring the bells.
got the bells. We have quorum. Senator McKenzie, would you like to ask the minister a question? Thank you for your indulgence there, Chair. Uh, minister, given the deal that you've done with the Greens to severely impact 215 um, facilities across the nation, 84 per cent of which are located in rural and regional communities, um, not just providing national product and um, benefit, but underpinning the social and economic uh, wealth of these regions. I want to understand how this fund will now be used, and if it is envisaged to be used, to really um, sustain those you know, companies and facilities that are going to be severely impacted by the safeguard mechanism deal that you've done with the Greens, and how will that interact? Will there be specific weighting to those um, businesses that have been severely impacted? How are you going to ensure the sustainability of the existing manufacturing uh, facilities in rural and regional communities, uh, given the deal that you've done with the Greens will see higher energy prices and electricity in this country? And will therefore, I know you'd like to have, you've said it all afternoon, downward pressure with a hand movement doesn't make it happen. The laws of physics still apply. The laws of economics still apply. And what all serious economic commentators are saying about the deal that you've done with the Greens is that it will see an increase in energy prices, that your own head of the AWU, the fantastic young Daniel, absolutely states is critical to maintain employment in advanced manufacturing in this country whilst we uh, you know, move towards a more low emissions environment. So I want to understand the interaction and whether the, in, how the NRF is envisaged will change as a result of the deal that you've done and the consequential um, impact on rural and regional advanced manufacturers. Minister. Thank you, Chair, and thank uh, Senator McKenzie for her question. And uh, <clears throat> one thing we certainly do agree on um, tonight is uh, what a terrific fellow uh, Mr. Uh, Daniel Walton is, and uh, what a very fine organisation the Australian workers. Uh, they, well, let's let's deal with one issue uh, at a time. But um, no, uh, Mr. Walton runs a, a fantastic union, and. Um, uh, he's always focused on, on one thing, uh, in my experience, and that is uh, creating uh, good, well-paid jobs uh, for his members. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that um, I'm sure that uh, <coughs> uh, he'll continue uh, to do that um, as we uh, as we rebuild manufacturing um, in this uh, in this industry. Um, I simply don't agree. Look, two things about your contribution, Senator McKenzie. You're conflating two things. We're dealing here uh, with a piece of legislation that, for the first time in nine years, is going to uh, see the rebuilding of uh, manufacturing in this, in, in this country. Um, perhaps I shouldn't repeat it again and again and again, but I will. I sat and watched um, in this parliament uh, what you did to manufacturing, car manufacturing in South Australia at the Holden's factory uh, at, uh, at Elizabeth. And it was shameful. You hounded that, com that company out of, uh, out of this country and you did the same in Victoria Ford. With, uh, Ford. Well, with Ford, Toyota. yes, Ford, Toyota, Toyota. Uh, Ford and Toyota. <coughs> so you... And, and look, let me, let me tell you, at, at, at Elizabeth, um, there were plenty of workers who lived at Elizabeth, plenty of, plenty of workers, plenty of workers. Well, every, 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 
every, every country in the world subsidises its car industry. I might, uh, I, I might have every country in the world subsidises their car industry. You can't look, you can't look at one one industry. But, but what I'm, what I'm going to say to you, um, uh, Senator McKenzie, and it'll come as a shock. Lots of those people that worked at um, um, uh, Elizabeth at, at, uh, at, at Holden's actually lived in the country. They lived in the places uh, like uh, Kapunda, like, uh, like Clare, like Freeling, like Balaclava. Um, so they were, in fact, um, they, you know, they might have been working in an outer um, South Australian uh, suburb, but they, in fact, were, were living in the, in the country. So um, um, they benefited by, by, by manufacturing. Now, this fund will benefit people in, the, uh, in regional Australia. Um, and can I say this? The corporation will strategically invest in high value adding projects in priority areas. A number of these priorities have a strong regional presence, such as the value add in resources, the value add in agriculture, defence and renewables. It's anticipated that this will drive scale and growth, creating higher value jobs in regions. Investments including the targeting of emerging opportunities will help regional areas diversify their economies and workforce opportunities. I saw over the, the period of the last two or three years just what your government did to um, rural industries. Let's have a look at what you did to the barley industry um, as a result of the, uh, the uh, uh, bans uh, by, uh, by by China. Let's have a look at what you did to the. Let's have a look. Let's 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 have a let's have a look at what you did to the, the wine industry over that period of time. Um, you you claim you claim the nationals. Of course, the nationals are not even in government anywhere in the country, as far as I can tell. Is that right? Is that right? Not 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 not, not even in Tasmania. Uh, at least the Liberals are in government down there, um, but you're not in government anywhere. And, and one of the re can I put forward this proposition? One of the reasons you're not in government anywhere in the country is because you've abandoned the people that you claim to represent. I've seen you um, uh, abandon the uh, the uh, barley growers. I've seen you. Senator Brockman, point of order. With all due respect to the minister, and I accept these are wide-ranging debates, but the minister is showing contempt for the chamber by not answering the question and not talking about the bill. It cannot go on. Senator Mackenzie's question was quite wide-ranging, but minister, I'd ask the minister that you come to the point. Thank you, uh, um, thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Um, so look. This, this, uh, <clears throat> this legislation does exactly the opposite of what you say it does. It does create those high-paying uh, jobs. You're conflating the issue of the, uh, the scapeguards uh, mechanism. And, but particularly, I reject your proposition that that's going to push energy prices higher. Um, the idea that we move to a decarbonised economy, which even the Nationals signed up to at the last uh, election. Now, maybe you're crab walking away from that um, issue, but you signed up. You signed up to net zero by 2050. Um, and what the safeguards legislation, and we're going to get that to later in, in the night, um, what that does is um, <coughs> start moving us to a renewable superpower. We're going to um, create hydrogen. We're going to... Senator McKenzie. I appreciate the minister's capacity to you know, waffle on and remind me of Uncle Arthur, uh, um, who I used to view in my youth. I like, this is a serious issue, minister. You might think that it's not a, we're get to the, it's a point of order. I'm sorry. Of yes, you're right. You're right. This can is in committee. You can, take, you can take the call if, in about three minutes. So then, then you. If can he make doesn't know statement. the answer, can he just sit down and let me ask my next question? Well, that's not a point of order either. Uh, Senator Cohn, 
Thank you, um, Chair. Just on a point of order, um, under the Senate laws, personal reflections are very disorderly. And regarding the remarks that you made about Senator Farrell, I would ask Senator McKenzie to withdraw those remarks about Uncle Arthur. Senator McKenzie. Here we go. Are you going to take I up? unequivocally I, withdraw. Uh, thank you for um, taking up the invitation. Any harm to the minister. Minister, do you have anything to add, or shall I give the call to Senator McKenzie? Senator McKenzie. Thank you for your assistance, Chair. Um, Minister, you, you say that we're seeking to conflate two issues, but there is no way when you are seeking to bring before the Senate $15 billion loan facility for advanced manufacturing and consequently don't want to talk about the sustainability of advanced manufacturing, which relies on affordable energy. Now, all sides of parliament have agreed um, on a net zero position. It's about making sure that you don't destroy whole communities, industries and regions on your way through. That's all. And the deal with the Greens has seen certain communities and certain industries will be significantly impacted. And you can't crab walk away from that. You can't pretend that what one ministry does in government won't impact on another piece of legislation. So my question remains in I've got 15 minutes, Senator Preamble. Preamble, happy. This is called the committee stage, in case you didn't remember. And this is where the opposition and crossbench senators get to have a say and get to ask the government questions about the impact of the legislation they're bringing before here. Would they don't like get to, to do it in the other Senator. place. They get to do it here. It's called democracy. Um, my own uh, Premier, Daniel Andrews, not a fan of democracy. Uh, you, uh, Senator Ciccone, would have to agree with me on that. But the government has shown their complete disregard for democratic principles of our system in, in uh, the way their ministers treat uh, OPDs, the way their front bench disregards genuine questions from the opposition and, and crossbench, and the way you're treating the committee stage for this particular bill. There's been genuine questions that community, industry, regions, the opposition themselves want answered, and you've just made a mockery. There was, about, there was a wonderful window of about maybe seven minutes, uh, Senator Cash, where the minister was relevant to the question and giving detailed answers according to the public service ripping out their bits of paper and making sure he had his talking points in front of him. So I am very happy to put on the record the opposition absolute affront to the way this minister and this government has treated the Senate. It is just indicative of how we've uh, seen the last 10 months. My question remains, Minister, how many regional um, communities will benefit? Is there a weighting in the assessment for uh, this money that will be provided to rural and regional um, communities or regional capitals? How will they be identified and how will that be weighted in the assessment of projects that this fund will uh, seek to deliver on? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank uh, Senator uh, McKenzie for her question. Look, I can only repeat what I've already said. The corporation will strategically invest in high value adding projects in priority areas. A number of these priorities have uh, a strong regional presence, uh, such as value adds in resources, value adds in agriculture, uh, defence and renewable, many of which um, are in, uh, in country, uh, country Australia. It's anticipated this will drive scale and growth, creating higher value jobs in the regions. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, Senator McKenzie. Targeted to which regions, Minister? Minister. Australian regions. Senator McKenzie. Oh, honestly, Australian regions. Well, I would hope you wouldn't be investing in overseas regions <laughs> with uh, these dollars. Can we narrow it down, Minister? Because the last time the Labor Party was in government, your own regional growth fund funded uh, major projects in capital cities. So when, you, when the Labor Party said regions, 
I would like to have some confidence that it means the, a third of Australians that actually don't live in capital cities in this country will benefit from the Labor Party's bill. Minister. Well, I'm one of those people um, who lives in regional uh, Australia. Um, good on you. Good on you. Friends, uh, friends like you, I don't need enemies, uh, with your respect, uh, Senator. <coughs> um, the uh, corporation uh, will make investments across all Australian states and territory. We expect that the uh, corporation's investments in priority areas, such as the uh, value add in resources, value add in agriculture, defence and renewables, will have a strong regional impact. Growth in these sectors will help regional areas diversify their economies and workforce opportunities. Senator McKenzie. Sounds like the preamble to the Regional Accelerator Fund, the $2 billion um, that was in the March budget that you axed. Um, with respect to a question you answered, uh, Senator Dunningham, on the water rule um, around forestry, what research has been done by the department on the impact of removing that rule in the Murray-Darling Basin? Minister. Minister. Uh, Chair, look, I just um, struggle to see the relevance of um, the uh, question to, um, to this particular uh, bill. If you could sort of explain to me how uh, your question relates to this particular bill, I'll uh, attempt to answer it. Senator McKenzie. I was referring to a response that you gave to Senator Dunningham about the forestry industry, and you spoke about uh, removing the water rule under the EPBC Act. And so I am in increasing plantations um, or, or farmland under plantation. So my question is, has there been any research? You've made a, a statement here that you're going to do that. I would like to understand, and this is a fund that's going to be uh, investing in forestry processing, I'm assuming. I want to understand the impact of the removal of the water rule on the Murray-Darling Basin. Over two million people live in the basin. They're very, very concerned about the Labor Party's uh, water policy thus far, and I, I think it's beholden on the minister to tell the chamber what research has been done about the impact of this decision. Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, look, I, I still fail to see the relevance uh, to this particular bill of that question. However, since you have uh, raised uh, the issue, we have a fine Minister for Agriculture, and uh, I'm happy to arrange a uh, briefing for you uh, in respect of uh, these, uh, these issues uh, as uh, uh, it relates to the, uh, the Murray-Darling. Uh, Murray Senator McKenzie. Um, in respect to following on from the questions uh, earlier about level of consultation with stakeholders and in industry, um, has Dan Walton or the AWU specifically been consulted on the impact of the deal uh, with the Greens for the safeguard mechanism and its impact on advanced manufacturing and electricity prices? Minister. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank uh, Senator McKenzie. Um, look again, you're conflating a bill, a bill that we're dealing with. Look, you ask me the questions, and then you constantly um, interject to stop me answering the question. What's the, what's the point of asking me the questions if you want to give the, give the, uh, give the answer yourselves? Um, look, you're conflating two issues. Later on tonight, you'll have all night. Um, Senator McKenzie to ask questions about the other piece of legislation. We are dealing with the, uh, with the, um, <coughs> the National Reconstruction Fund bill at, at the moment. Um, uh, as I said earlier today, the um, uh, Minister Husick is a wonderful communicator and a wonderful consultant. I'd be, uh, I'd be amazed, I'd be amazed uh, that uh, he didn't consult with uh, industry, all, all, uh, all stakeholders and, uh, and, and unions who might have uh, an interest uh, in this area, and 
um, business organisations. Um, earlier today, I was reading out um, statements of support uh, uh, for uh, for our uh, our changes by the business council, the AI, Hacky. They're all all on board. It's as I said earlier. It's a bit a bit of a pity that um, you know um, the coalition can't get on board and start productively uh, engaging with the uh, with the government uh, about these important uh, revitalization of the uh, manufacturing industry but um, I uh, I think if, if, if I know um, uh, Minister Husek he will have widely consulted with um, all of the relevant stakeholders who uh, would have an interest um, in this issue and unlike you uh, the opposition uh, the, all those organisations would have engaged, I'm sure, and given advice, uh, offered uh, suggestions, positive suggestions, uh, that would have made this bill in its construction even better than what it was when we produced it as a policy in the lead up to the last election. Senator McKenzie. Um, it's understood that you've said the fund will support developing the capabilities in train and shipbuilding supply chains. Can the minister provide a guarantee to the Senate that the government's deal with the Greens will not place restrictions on investments in relation to the manufacture of trains, carriages, train parts and associated manufacturing supporting the rail supply chain, where those investments may also end up supporting gas, coal and resource industries? Minister. Minister. Um, look, you've um, put a whole lot of. Yeah, 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 yeah. You step it out. I think that would be easier rather than me give you the wrong answer in respect of one particular product. Senator McKenzie. Okay, so we have. Trains, carriages, shipbuilding. Is my understanding this fund will be um, assisting in supporting those types of um, industries? Is that correct, Minister? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, if uh, any of those uh, areas you've just mentioned uh, meet the uh, priority area of the, the fund. Uh, then uh, there's an opportunity to, uh, to fund those uh, areas. Senator McKenzie. If my question then goes, if any of those products then are used in the production, the supply chain for the coal, gas or resource industry, will that lead to them not being able to be supported by this fund? Minister. Yeah, look, um, uh, it's all about the manufacturing of those uh, products, not uh, where those products might um, ultimately uh, end up. So, as I said before, if um, if they meet the priorities of the uh, of, of the fund and uh, seek funding um, and receive it, it'll be on the basis that they meet the uh, the criteria. That's set out in the legislation. Senator McKenzie. And so, just to be clear, Minister, the NRF will support the manufacture of goods that will end up supporting and um, underpinning our gas, coal, and resource industries. Were the Greens aware of this when they signed the deal on the safeguard mechanism? Minister. Minister. That wasn't a question to me. Um, that was a question to the Greens, as I understood. Senator McKenzie. Uh, it's actually a question to you, Minister, because the Greens have signed up to the safeguard mechanism on the, on the understanding that this fund will not uh, back the coal, gas or resource industry, when in fact if it's building the trains, if it's building the railway lines, if it's building the ships, that are carrying our gas, that are carrying our coal, that are carrying our resources. Or, or it is absolutely underpinning Order. and supporting our fabulous resource Order. industries. 
Is this, is this the, a case of the Labor Party actually duping Adam Bant? Has Albo actually got it over, Adam? Order. Pulled a swifty? Order. Minister, has the Prime Minister successfully pulled a swifty against the Greens on this uh, measure? Order. Um, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Um, what you see is what you get with uh, Prime Minister uh, Albanese, uh, in, my, in my experience. And, uh, Order on my and, left. And, uh, and uh, um, um, you can have great faith, Senator um, Mackenzie, that um, uh, the Prime Minister is a straight dealer in respect of all of his dealings, whether it's with the Greens, whether it's with Senator D. Pocock, whether it's uh, with uh, Senator uh, Hanson. <coughs> Or any of the uh, or crossbenchers, or, or or even you, and of course, and of course, look, I can give you a, a, a good example of that. Of course, last week, when uh, uh, when the opportunity arose to uh, deal with the uh, <coughs> the voice machinery uh, referendum legislation, uh, <coughs> uh, so, Senator Scar, uh, Chair, I just draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Um, so a quorum has been called. Could we um, ring the bells, please? Quorum is present. I'm going to Senator Hanson. Senator, ha Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Minister, you just made a reference that um, it's a pity that the Liberal Party aren't on board with this fund that to get industries and manufacturing going in Australia. Now, I as a person, I've been speaking about this since 1996, since my first main speech in Parliament. I'm not associated with the coalition, but I will tell you. I have doubts about this legislation. Are you really upfront with the Australian people? Are you, are you being truthful about where the funds are going to go? I didn't like your answer earlier about who's going to be appointed to the board, with whether it's going to be union reps. Will union reps actually then appoint only monies going to their organisations that are union or unionised? I have a big problem with that. I also have a big problem with the fact that under section part 6 section 75 1 states the board must formulate written policies to be complied with by corporation bodies in relation to the following matters your amendment the government amendment then Senator, states Senator it Pratt. must it must be added that in the case of the corporation, the impact of investments of the corporation on First Nations Australians. Please explain that one to me. Minister.
Senator Pratt. That would Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Hanson for her, uh, her question. Um, the uh, Albanese government recognises the importance of putting First Nations people at the heart of decision making on issues that affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I think uh, that has been clear uh, from everyone on this side, including, of course, the Prime Minister. Senator Hanson. Thank you. I find that is absolutely disgraceful that you have actually ad advocated for a referendum for the people of Australia to decide whether this will happen. You are putting the cart before the horse and you are putting this in legislation that people must be consulted if they're First Nations people on legislation that the people of Australia have not approved to. That is exactly what you've done. This is only part. This is only the start of it. So you are holding the people of Australia in contempt of what you put in this legislation. The um, is is that the case? Is that please answer this by putting this in the legis legislation? Do you hold the people in contempt because you are not prepared to wait till what they say in a referendum that you've already, you've already overridden the people of Australia by putting this in legislation that you will consult with them? Senator Pratt, we're getting along so nicely. Um, <laughs> Minister, please. No. <laughs> um, I am going to go to Senator Brockman and then I'll come to Senator um, Ormond Payne. Um, um, oh, so it's Chair? He's been trying to get the jump for sorry, Senator Brockman's been trying to get the jump for a while. Senator Brockman. Um, I just want to clarify your answer to Senator uh, McKenzie's question firstly. So if I understand you correct, this fund can give a grant or an equity share investment or a loan to an Australian manufacturer that's making every component in an LNG train? Minister. Um, if the, um, the project meets the priority areas of the uh, funding uh, and the uh, organisation ultimately makes a decision to fund, then they can fund what, uh, whatever they like so long as it meets the criteria of the legislation. Senator Brockman. Oh, sorry, Chair. Senator Brockman. And what about in the other direction? What if um, the uh, entity involved in the manufacturing is, for example, a shipbuilder that is building a, a, uh, a ship fuelled by LNG. Minister. I refer to my previous answer. The answer is the same. Senator Brockman. Um, Minister, we've only got about 40 minutes till the Greens Labor guillotine falls on this bill, which is a disgrace. Uh, left lover guillotine. Minister, what heads of power under the Constitution is this bill invoking? Minister. Um, it will be uh, one of the numbers under section uh, 51, but we are absolutely satisfied, Senator Brockman, that uh, uh, this uh, legislation is uh, constitutional, unlike some of the legislation that the uh, Coalition has been bringing to the Parliament in the last few days. Uh, we believe this is uh, completely compliant with the Australian Constitution. <laughs> Senator Brockman. So I think I would like a more specific answer than that, Minister. But while while your, your while your advisers are getting that information, um, and I, I would like precise details, please, uh, Minister, what advice did you receive on the constitutionality of this bill? 
Minister. That the uh, legislation is constitutional. <laughs> Sen 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 Senator Brockman. You, you can't name the head of power minister. Who did you receive the advice from? When? Minister. The legislation is constitutional, uh, Senator Brockman. Senator, Senator Brockman. No, oh, Minister. Okay, Senator Brockman. What head of power, Minister? The, uh, the, Minister. Legislation, the legislation is constitutional, and uh, we, of course, don't provide uh, legal advice, as is uh, well known to the uh, opposition. <laughs> Senator, Senator, Senator Brockman. Firstly, the government provides legal advice when it wants to, Minister, as you well know, and we, we can show you examples of that. What? You finally got your piece of paper, Minister. Can you now answer the question? Under what head of power? Minister. The legislation Minister. is constitutional. <laughs> Senator, Senator Brockman. Minister, what advice did you seek? to allow you to state that claim. It's not simply not good enough, Minister, to say that a piece of legislation is constitutional because you drafted it. Wonder what power are you making this legislation and what advice did you receive that it was constitutional? Minister. Thank you, Chair. We would not bring a piece of legislation to this place if it was not constitutional. Um, Senator, sorry, Senator Brockman. Minister, did you seek any advice apart from having this drafted by your department? Minister. This legislation is constitutional and we wouldn't have brought this legislation to the parliament unless it was constitutional. Yeah. Min uh, sorry, um, Senator Brockman. Minister, did you seek advice as to we whether the Williams case have, it has any implications for this legislation? Minister. I'm not familiar with the <coughs> Williams um, case. Um, it's, it's, uh, well, I, look, you're, this is going to surprise you, uh, Senator Scar, but um, I, in fact, uh, did pass <coughs> constitutional law one and uh, constitutional law two. Well, um, I was lectured. I had the good fortune to have been lectured by a fellow called John uh, Bradman, of course, whose father was uh, was Don Bradman, uh, and uh, he was a very smart guy. And uh, I'm satisfied that um, <coughs> my uh, my uh, tutelage under him uh, <coughs> was uh, was good was good tutelage and. Uh, I'm very satisfied to say that this legislation is constitutional and we wouldn't, we wouldn't be bringing this to the parliament unless it was constitutional. Senator Brockman. Oh. Mi Senator Sorry? Brockman. Minister, I, I think it's fair to say that you haven't filled this chamber with confidence in your uh, statement of the constitutionality of this bill, when it is such a broad spending power that you are giving to an instrumentality of the Commonwealth Government under legislation that can spend money, it can invest in equity shares, it can in make loans, it can uh, give out grants, uh, it can do so across a broad sector of the economy. Minister, what controls are in place to ensure that this entity does not, for example, make all of its investment in one state or territory. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Brockman for his, uh, his question. Um, the, um, I, th I, I think you have uh, misrepresented the uh, legislation. It can't provide um, grants, and I think in that respect you have um, uh, incorrectly interpreted, uh, in interpreted the uh, legislation. <coughs> Senator Brockman. Frame it to say just equity and loans, Minister. What would stop this organisation spending all of its funds in one Commonwealth jurisdiction, <laughs> one state or territory? Minister.
Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank uh, Senator uh, Brodman uh, for his, uh, his question. Um, look, rest assured that um, the, the uh, abilities of the people that we're going to put uh, in, in, uh, in charge of the, the board and, and the people who will be working in this, uh, um, uh, in this uh, uh, fund um, will have all of the skills to ensure that the money is properly spent, number one. I mean, this won't be like a sports rorts uh, exercise um, where, you, where you simply hand it out to your mates, to your mates uh, uh, in order to try and win, uh, win elections. Um, we are here about rebuilding manufacturing in this country. Manufacturing that, manufacturing that was uh, devastated by the previous government's lack of interest. Uh, in building things in Australia. We want to start building things in this country again. We don't want to see the sorts of events in Elizabeth and South Australia where you wiped out overnight. One of the great companies uh, of Australia, Holdens, lost all those jobs, <coughs> all of the uh, add-on jobs that uh, benefited by, uh, uh, by, uh, by Holdens. <coughs> um, we don't want to see that again. And the whole the whole purpose of this legislation uh, is to ensure that we fairly distribute funds um, <clears throat> right across Australia, including regional Australia, including, including in Western Australia, uh, so that we can start making things again in this country, start rebuilding the manufacturing industry, which was so badly uh, affected by the neglect of, uh, of, your, of your government. Um, this is a big... This is a big project, Senator. Um, this is all about um, starting to build things in Australia, which we haven't been doing over the previous uh, nine years of neglect from your, uh, from, from your government. Um, we're serious about um, creating good, well-paying jobs um, in the regions, in each of the states and uh, territories. And I've got the greatest confidence that under uh, Minister Husick, that's exactly what we're going to do. Senator Brockman, I think there's I, one, almost, one question, and I'm going to send Senator Allman Payne. Almost finished, um, Chair. Um, Minister, will this uh, be covered by the Commonwealth Investment? Will this uh, organisation be covered by the Commonwealth Investment Framework? Minister. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator Brockman. It's a um, it's a corporate Commonwealth entity. Uh, sorry, sorry. So, um, Senator Brockman, that wasn't my question. Investments, equity investments made by this organisation, will they be covered by the Commonwealth Investment Framework? Minister. Minister. Okay, Senator Brockman. That's a very straightforward question. I, I asked the chamber again, and I asked the minister again through the chamber, and I asked the minister to be, to be respectful of the chamber. That is a straightforward question that deserves an answer, and it was not answered in your first response. Minister. Senator Orman Payne. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, noting the significant number of questions uh, to the Minister around uh, prohibited investments, I would like to put on the record that given we are currently in a climate and biodiversity crisis where we absolutely must do everything we can to stay within 1.5 degrees of warming and stop the massive uh, biodiversity loss that we are currently experiencing. The Greens are very pleased that we have secured uh, amendments to ensure that the fund cannot fund coal and gas and native forest logging. Uh, in that vein, I would like to add that the Greens also think that nuclear technology is a dead end. Uh, we have gutted our industry and manufacturing base 
and it's been hollowed out. And without direction, the coalition have been reduced to cynical attempts. Order. Thank you, President, Acting Deputy President. Um, the coalition have been reduced to cynical attempts at grabbing a headline, rather than actually engaging with workers uh, and a future of industry in this country. Just the other day, Senator Canavan and the members for Capricornia and Flynn got together and declared that Gladstone should be home to the $368 billion nuclear submarines. It is breathtakingly out of touch to think that the future of Gladstone is in a hypothetical nuclear submarine in the distant Order. future, rather Order. than the very real opportunity we have Order. right now to transition and build a strong manufacturing base. So the Greens will be supporting the amendment that makes nuclear technology a prohibited investment. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Hanson did, did get up first. Senator Hanson. Thank you. Um, what I find appalling about the minister's answer was this is about to uh, have industries and manufacturing going ahead, yet we've put a stipulation on no coal, no gas, no forestries, forestries, no nuclear. Well, what the hell are we doing then in our country to create industries and manufacturing? What are we going to do about our nuclear medicine? Because we are, we do have medicine in Australia that's connected with nuclear. So what are you going to do about that? And that's been going for a long time in Lucas Heights. So therefore, you siding up to the Greens, you really need to answer these questions: where you are headed with nuclear in this country? Are, or are they the tag wa tail wagging the dog? <coughs> Excuse me. There's uh, a question I'd like to ask because, before Minister, I asked you about the people <coughs> on this list. <coughs> oh. Who David to come to? Appreciate that. I asked you about the list. Who will be on this list? You said the department has a list. Well, I'm asking you, if I got former Senator Patrick to get me an FOI from the department on the list, is he going to be given one? Are you going to present the list? If I ask for an FOI on it, will you give me the list that the department has or the minister has of the people on the list? Minister. Thank you, Order. Um, look, whether Senator Patrick wants to, uh, well, of course he's no longer here, but, um, but if he wants to prepare a uh, FOI <coughs> um, for uh, Treasury, then uh, we will comply with all of the uh, legal obligations that uh, are re relevant to uh, freedom of information uh, documentation. I do notice uh, Senator Pocock has been trying to get the call for a number of uh, occasions. Senator Scar. Senator Scar has been trying to get the call too, yes. Minister. I want to uh, ask some questions, uh, firstly in relation to the very important points which Senator Hanson has been raising yeah. around who is going to be appointed to the board or who can be appointed to the board of this fund, which is going to be responsible for managing investments of up to Correct for five years, for five years, and managing investments of up to Australian fifteen billion dollars. Now, Minister, you keep referring to how you refer to it as a skills matrix, which is contained in section nineteen, subsection two of the board. Can you tell me, given all the matters which are covered through subsections A through to K? Why is it necessary to have sub subsection L, which says any other field that the ministers consider appropriate, which, as I read it, really gives the ministers a subjective right to appoint anyone they want to the board, regardless of what their experience is, as long as they subjectively consider it to be relevant? Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I uh, thank uh, Senator Scar for his uh, question. Well, the, the, stru the structure is there. The structure speaks for itself. There is a skills, um, there uh, is a skills uh, matrix, um, and uh, we originally um, started with the proposition of six uh, board members uh, in consultation with those people who have been prepared to uh, negotiate 
um, about this, we're going to increase that number to, uh, to eight. So you've got <coughs> eight people that you need to um, match with that, uh, with that skills, uh, uh, skills metric. Um, as I explained earlier, the department, um, uh, the department will uh, look at the requirements under that skills uh, matrix. Uh, they'll come forward with uh, a set of names uh, where they believe people will meet that uh, criteria. Now, I've got the greatest confidence that in that process we're going to get some of the best people in this country uh, who will be able to uh, establish uh, this board and uh, give advice um, about how the, uh, the funds should be best spent uh, in the spirit of the, uh, of the legislation. Having prepared those names, um, they're going to then forward that name, those names to the minister. And as, as is ultimately, I mean, there's no surprises about this. This is how boards, this is how boards, this, 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 Oh, fair, fair, fair crack of the whip, fair crack of the whip, uh, Senator uh, <coughs> um, McGrath. Um, I did pass, you know. I, I did, I did get a degree. I mean, let's give us a, give me a, give me a little bit of credit here, uh, Senator uh, McGrath. Um, so there is a process. There's no real surprises about this uh, process. I'm, I am surprised that um, you're so focused on how the board is uh, selected um, when, 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 when there are so many other things. There are so many other things. There are so many other things that uh, you could have uh, asked questions uh, questions about. Um, no, we're not going to go all night. Not, at least not on this. Uh, not at least not on this. Uh, at least not on this uh, particular bill. On the other bill, will go or not. Um, but look, look, there's a stock standard process here about how you might find the best people who are going to start the job of uh, rebuilding manufacturing in uh, in this uh, country. The manufacturing that you let slide over the previous nine years of your of, of your government, and we're going to start building things in this country again. Um, and so. When that uh, list of people uh, gets submitted to the uh, uh, to the minister, he will then, um, I, I imagine, very carefully, very calmly, um, make the selection about who the best people will be uh, to represent all of the skills uh, that are going to be required to get the best value um, out of this uh, out of this fund. Uh, and uh, as I say, um, there's nothing. Nothing complicated about this. There's nothing unusual about this. This is how boards get selected all the time, all the time, uh, all the time, um, <coughs> whether they be boards that uh, your government uh, established or, uh, or whether they're uh, boards that we've established. Uh, Senator Scar. Uh, Minister, uh, you talk about all fields of expertise required under the skills matrix being represented. But isn't it the case that under your proposed clause 19.2 that the government could, for example, choose to appoint, say, three of the six board members having industrial relations experience and being union members? There's no need, in fact, to make sure each of the skills is represented on the board. Isn't that correct? Minister. I'm sure that uh, when the board is ultimately uh, appointed, it will reflect um, all of the skills that are necessary to make this fund a great success. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a couple of questions. One about the priority areas. Can the minister advise how the NRF will build domestic manufacturing capability in disaster resilience? Uh, how does it fit in with the proposed priority areas, and, and is there scope to include anything more explicitly on disaster resilience in priority areas? And then on supply chain, what capacity does the NRF have to address blockages and shortfalls in the supply chain, especially in building and construction, uh, regards to things like plantation, timber trusses and triple glazed glass? 
Minister. Thanks, uh, Chair, and uh, I thank uh, Senator Pocock for his question and the constructive way in which he's engaged with this very important uh, project. And it's a lesson for the coalition as to how one advances um, your interest in these matters. The NRF may be able to build domestic manufacturing capability in disaster resilience where the project falls within a priority area of the economy as defined by the Priority Areas Declaration and lines with other criteria as set out in the Bill and Investment Mandate. The Government has previously announced the seven areas of the economy that will be the basis of the first declaration uh, to be made soon after the Bill receives royal assent. The detail of each, um, of each uh, area is still being considered, taking into account the comprehensive consultation conducted by the Government in late 2022 and early 2023. Given the Government has not yet made a final decision on the drafting of the declaration, it is not possible for me to rule out to, to rule particular projects or technologies in or out. As to the second question that you ask, it is expected that uh, through investments in priority areas, the corporation will build strategic industry capability and help to address supply chain vulnerabilities. Reflecting, <coughs> reflecting how critical uh, this issue is, the Government will move um, an amendment to Clause 17 of the Bill, which will require the Board to have regard to the desirability of enhancing uh, Australia's resilience against supply chain vulnerabilities, along with other important outcomes. Senator Hughes. Uh, Minister, stakeholders from industry and one of Australia's largest trade unions, the AWU, have called on the government to allow the NRF to invest in gas projects and namely carbon capture, utilisation and storage CCUS. The union's submission to the National Reconstruction Fund consultation further commits, and I'll quote having come from your union mates, these technology needs should be directly reflected in funding decisions under the NRF. As one example, the effective funding available for carbon capture and storage was cut by the 22-23 Federal Budget update in October 22. While the AWU recognises the need to target CCS funding to industries that are in most need, it is important to acknowledge that some industries do not have the option of electrification. For example, some industries use fossil fuel energy for process heat or their emissions are a direct result of their process, such as in the case of cement production. Minister, does the Albanese government believe that there should be investment of CCUS technologies in Australia, yes or no? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, um, th and thank uh, uh, the Senator for her, uh, her, her question. Um, look, you referred rather extensively to submissions that the Australian uh, Workers' uh, Union uh, made to, uh, uh, to this uh, um, uh, inquiry into this uh, proposed uh, piece of legislation. As I'm not sure if you were in the <coughs> Senate earlier when uh, Senator Mackenzie was singing the praises of uh, Mr Walton, but I can only reiterate uh, what a fine uh, individual he is uh, leading that organisation and what a terrific organisation uh, they are. And of course, unlike the opposition, uh, they have engaged in this uh, whole process of working out um, how the fund will uh, best, uh, best work and the sorts of priority areas. Um, this bill that you've got before you today reflects that wide ranging um, consultation processes that took place. Um, I answered <coughs> a question from Senator Pocock um, a moment ago where I talked about the broad, wide-ranging consultation process that went, uh, went on to create this uh, bill. Um, uh, and please rest assured that uh, all of the issues that people have raised have gone into consideration and what we now reflect here is the totality of all of that uh, discussion with the stakeholders. Senator Hughes. So we'll try again. Can you confirm, Minister, if CCUS investment is expressly prohibited from the NRF? Minister. 
I've answered the uh, question. <laughs> Senator Hughes. Point of order, that was not an answer to the question. We'll keep, we'll keep trying. So I'm, can you confirm, because we will assume since you are not answering the question directly, that prohibition on CCUS investments uh, is a direct result of the deal that Minister Husey has undertaken with the Australian Greens. Uh, so working on from that, confirming that that prohibition is because of the deal with the Greens, uh, as you just commended Mr Walton, he has been particularly vocal about green activists blacklisting CCUS and blue hydrogen, risking Australian jobs and significant investment. Do you accept this assessment? Why is it a prohibited investment in the NRF? And if you don't accept the investment, I'm giving you two options here, you either accept it or you don't. Has the Albanese government caved into the Greens at the expense of potentially thousands of blue collar jobs in the oil and gas industry? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. Well, I can only <coughs> reiterate your favourable comments um, about um, uh, Mr Walton and his uh, very fine organisation, the uh, Australian uh, uh, Workers' uh, Union, one of the great uh, trade unions in this uh, country, dedicated to uh, lifting the uh, wages and uh, conditions of uh, his members in often uh, very difficult, um, uh, very difficult uh, industries. Um, we have taken into account um, all of the submissions from all of the uh, relevant uh, stakeholders and interested parties in the, uh, the design of this legislation. And uh, this legislation reflects the totality of all of those uh, discussions. Um, the, uh, hopefully, uh, sometime tonight, this bill will pass um, the, uh, the Senate and uh, <clears throat> in the next day or two will become uh, law when it goes back to the, uh, the House of Representatives. Um, this bill reflects the totality of all of those discussions and negotiations. Um, and when it goes through, um, will uh, prevent, uh, will uh, present uh, the Australian people with a great opportunity to start rebuilding in this uh, in this country. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. I've served on the scrutiny of delegated legislation committee during the course of uh, the previous parliament, during the course of this parliament, and as you should be aware, the scrutiny committee has. Uh, concerns with respect to any instruments which are not subject to disallowance. I note the crucial role that the so-called investment mandate plays under section 71 of this bill, dealing with matters such as matters of risk and return, the allocation of investments of the corporation between various priority areas, etc. Et I also note, somewhat uh, with a great deal of concern, that in giving a direction the minister uh, may have regard not only to the object of the Act but also any other matters the minister considers relevant. And I'm not sure uh, what uh, that could in fact cover um, outside of the object of the Act. Um, given that the scrutiny of legislation, uh, Delegated Legislation Committee has made clear in this Senate, this chamber has made clear that there must be exceptional circumstances it, which apply uh, to a, an instrument, statutory instrument, such as, as the investment mandate not being subject to a disallowance process. Could you firstly please advise us what those exceptional circumstances are? And secondly, in considering the answer to that question, I have read the explanatory memorandum, which purports to give reasons for the investment mandate not being subject to disallowance processes, which it should be, no matter which government it is. And reading that explanatory memorandum, it's clear to me that there is nothing that would prevent, nothing that would prevent on any ground, including the ground of commercial certainty, for that investment mandate to have been prepared or to promptly be prepared and a period of disallowance allowed prior prior to the National Reconstruction Fund actually making investment decisions. Prior to the National Reconstruction Fund actually making investment decisions. So that this chamber would have an opportunity, would have an opportunity to apply its disallowance processes to that statutory instrument prior to any investments being made. And in that way, there is absolutely no rational reason I can think of that commercial certainty or operational certainty would be compromised. 
So if I'm, if I'm wrong in my analysis, if the minister could please explain to me why it is that there are exceptional circumstances which apply in this case that would make it um, commercially impossible for the investment mandate to be considered by this chamber, especially considering that we're at the start of this fund, assuming the legislation goes through, and that investment mandate could be considered prior to the National Reconstruction Fund actually making an investment. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and thanks, uh, Senator Rascar. Well, you've obviously thought deeply about the legislation, uh, Senator Scar, and I give you credit for, uh, for doing that. Had the coalition decided that it was going to engage constructively uh, in discussions um, about the legislation, um, I'm sure we would have uh, happily engaged, as, as I did last week with the uh, machinery of uh, referendum uh, legislation. I engaged constructively with um, uh, the sensible members of your, uh, your coalition uh, to try and get uh, an outcome. You had the option, Senator Scar, um, of doing that this time. And I, I, I think if um, you'd been in control uh, of, uh, of these negotiations, then uh, we might have found that uh, we had a positive contribution um, to, the, um, um, to, to, uh, to this debate uh, from the other side. But You've chosen not to do that. You've chosen to be obstructionist, and of course, that's meant in order to get our legislation through, we've had to go to uh, <coughs> discussions with the Greens and uh, Senator Pocock and, uh, and other, other groups to get the legislation through. But of course, the legislative uh, scheme set up by the uh, NRF bill provides that the investment mandate uh, will be issued by the government taking into account the views of the corporation board. The investment mandate... Well, look, will you please let... You asked me a question. I sat quietly... With respect, Senator Scar, I sat quietly and listened to the total, totality of your question. Uh, you've asked me a question. I'm trying to answer it as directly as I can. I, you might recall I did compliment you for the interest that you've taken uh, in, this, uh, in this matter, and I think if your other colleagues um, start um, doing the work that you've done, uh, then uh, we might get some, uh, some better outcomes in terms of uh, discussion about important changes to uh, legislation in this country. The investment mandate and any submissions uh, made by the board of the corporation to the government will be tabled in Parliament. It's important to note that the investment mandate does not create any powers for the NRF. Rather, it's a direction from the government about how the NRF performs its investment functions and exercises its investment powers. This model is an established operational model that is consistent with and, uh, in our view, has worked well for similar Commonwealth specialist investment vehicles such as the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility, the uh, National um, Housing Finance and Investment Corporation, all of which are guided by uh, non-disallowable investment mandates. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, can you please confirm that the uh, board of the NRF uh, will be required to give regard to climate-related risks and nature-related risks when making investment decisions. And as, as uh, TCFD and, and TNFD progress, and if, if that becomes um, uh, implemented in Australia, that the board may give regard to climate-related financial disclosure and nature-related financial disclosure frameworks when assessing those risks. And again, uh, thank uh, um, Senator Pocock for his um, uh, his question and uh, his um, uh, desire to uh, support the government in uh, starting to uh, build things in Australia again. Um, Clause 75 of the uh, NRF Bill required the corporation to develop a suite of investment policies, including uh, in relation to risk management. 
Consideration of climate risk represents best investment and governance practice, and the government expects the uh, NRF will consider these issues as part of developing its risk management uh, policy. Um, then in respect to your second uh, question, protecting the environment is a priority for this uh, government, and we will be moving an amendment to Clause 17 requiring the board to have regard to Australia's greenhouse gas emissions reductions targets and supporting decarbonisation when performing their functions. We are also moving uh, a further amendment to Clause 75, requiring the corporation to develop a labour, environmental, social and governance to be considered in performance of its investment functions. We expect issues like this will be considered by the board. Senator yeah. Canavan. A topic I raised in my second reading speech. Uh, I raised the uh, dire situation that the last urea fertiliser plant will close in Australia this year. I note that, uh, in reference to this bill, the Minister for Agriculture has mentioned a couple of times that somehow this could be a solution uh, for this issue. Uh, the Minister might be aware that uh, the Senex Atlas projects includes a proposal to build a urea plant at uh, Dolby in Western Queensland, giving us access to that. Uh, incredibly strategic sovereign capability. Uh, uh, however, that project also involves the development of gas fields in Western Queensland, because to make your ear, you need to have a feedstock of gas. They plan to extract 48 terajoules a day of gas. Minister, given the government's support for a Greens amendment that would uh, prohibit investments which, uh, and I quote, directly finance the extraction of coal or natural gas, would a urea fertiliser plant proposal that is combined with the development of gas uh, fields associated with it qualify for funding under the National Reconstruction Fund following the government's ag agreement uh, to these Greens amendments? Minister. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, thanks uh, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Canavan for his question. The areas of the economy the NRF can invest in will be set out in the Priority Areas Declaration. Senator Canavan. Um, thank you, Chair. Well, well, Minister, as I mentioned, um, the Minister for Agriculture has been uh, saying that the fund could invest in a urea fertiliser plant. He said uh, that very thing at uh, Senate Estimates uh, just uh, back in February. Um, is the Minister for Agriculture misleading the Senate then, or, or, or do you have some further information to add here? Because people are being told in Queensland, and this contribution from the Minister for Agriculture was very political in nature, pressuring uh, members of parliament in Queensland to say, hey, you should support this because we could get uh, fertiliser, a fertiliser plant out of the National Reconstruction Fund. Are you saying here that that's not the case? And in particular, I draw your attention back to the Greens amendment. What is the effect of the Greens amendment that you have supported? Uh, will that knock out a proposal to build a fertiliser plant that involves the development of gas resources? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Kenderman. Um, <clears throat> I might uh, start my contribution by saying uh, what a terrific uh, agriculture minister uh, Minister uh, Watt uh, is. And, uh, of course, uh, he's um, absolutely full bottle on uh, all of the things uh, that uh, relate to uh, <coughs> agriculture that uh, flow from this uh, uh, from this uh, new uh, new fund. But uh, I can only repeat uh, in the answer to your specific questions: um, the areas of the economy the NRF can invest in will be set out in the priority areas declaration. Senator Canavan. Well, look, um, with all respect to the Minister Chair, um, my question didn't go to the priority areas. My question went to an amendment that's in the legislation. So obviously these priority areas post uh, any bill uh, can't, um, can't, use, can't uh, uh, use the funds from this bill in a way that would be inconsistent uh, with the legislation. The, the legislation that now is as amended uh, through the agreement with the Labor Party and the Greens, does, uh, does prohibit, as I mentioned, um, the 
the financing of something that directly involves the extraction of coal or gas. And I just repeat again, and maybe this is a good education for the minister. I'm not sure how much he's aware of this, but if about half of our nation's agriculture comes from the use of urea. Uh, urea is a uh, effectively a, uh, proce a, 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 a developed process from natural gas through the Haber-Bosch process. You need natural gas to create urea. Uh, if we're going to have a sovereign capability to produce urea in the future, it will need to be the associated production of gas. Will this fund help us, help us uh, solve this major issue, which we'll be confronting just in a matter of months, where we'll rely almost exclusively, or for half of our agriculture, will be reliant on the importation of a fertiliser from overseas. A shocking development in a nation that's prided itself for its history, at least since the days of the early settlers, to be able to feed itself. Well, come in a few months' time, we won't be able to do that. Your own Minister for Agriculture has been holding out that somehow as a solution to this. Can you please address this issue before we vote on it? Will the Greens amendment knock out the development of a urea fertiliser plant being funded by this fund? Minister. You have 30 seconds. Thank you, Chair. Well, um, Senator Canavan, I know a damn sight more about the agricultural industry than you will ever know. And, uh, and then, and then <coughs> I find your comments completely patronising and, to be honest with you, Senator, quite insulting. Order. Uh, <coughs> well, well, I have answered the question. You don't like my answer. You never do like my answers. But <coughs> But I know a damn sight Thank more you. about you, agriculture in. Thank you, Minister. Please take your seat. Senators, it being 8 p.m., and according to the resolution that was agreed earlier, I'll now put the question before the chair and then put the questions on the remaining stages of the bill. So uh, we're going to deal with Amendment 2 on sheet UC140 first. Okay. Uh, yep. So the amendments to government amendment sheet two on sheet UC140 moved by Senator David Pocock on sheet 1895B agreed to. Uh, those that have opinions say aye. Those against say no. No. I believe the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Yep. Ring the bell for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the amendments to Government Amendment 2 on sheet UC140, moved by Senator David Pocock on sheet 1895, be agreed to. Those to the, of the question passed to the right of the chair. No, to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator David Pocock as teller for the eyes and Senator Cadill for teller for the nose. Honourable Senators, there have been 14 ayes and 37 noes. It's passed and negative. The question now is that the government amendments on sheet UC140 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Is division required? Division is required. Ring the bells. with the wind.
Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the government amendments on sheet UC140 be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair. Noes to left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the aye, Senator Urquhart. Teller for the noes, Senator Cadell. Honourable Senators, there being 34 ayes and 28 noes, it is resolved in the affirmative. I will now deal with the remaining sheet of government amendments. The question is that the government amendments on sheet SK150 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Call was too late. I will now. I will now deal with the amendment circulated by Pauline Hanson's One Nation. The question is that the amendments on sheets. I'm oh, sorry, Senator Cash. Uh, just in relation to the amendments, I would ask that the amendments on sheet 1866 be put separately to the amendments on sheet 1897 revised 2 and 1919. So, so just for clarity, you want sheet 1866 separated from the other two? That is correct, yes. Thank you, Chair. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to restate the question. I'm going to put the, the first the question I'm first question I'm going to put is that the amendments on sheets 1866 be agreed to, and then I'm going to put a second question that the amendments on sh sheets 1897 revised 2 and 1919 be agreed to. So there'll be two questions. The question is, and these are the One Nation amendments, the, that the amendments on sheet 1866 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the amendment on that the amendments on sheet 1866 be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair. 
No, it's the left of the chair. Can I ask who would like to be the teller for the eyes? Senator, Senator Roberts, I appoint you as teller for the eyes. Teller for the nose, Senator Cadill. Honourable Senators, there being six ayes and 46 noes, it is passed in the negative. I now intend to put the question for the remaining amendments circulated by Pauline Hanson's One Nation. I put the question that the amendments on sheets 1897 revised 2 and 1919 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. I have it. Division required. Yes. Ring the bells for one minute. doors. The question before the chair is that the amendments on sheets 1897 revised 2 and 1919 be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left of the chair. Appointed as teller for the aye, Senator Cadill, and teller for the no, Senator Urquhart.
Honourable Senators, there being 28 ayes and 34 noes, it is passed in the negative. I will now deal with the amendments circulated by the opposition. The question is that subclauses 63, 3 and 4 stand as printed, printed. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells one minute. Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that subclauses 63, 3 and 4 stand as printed. Those for the question part, pass to the right of the chair, no to the left of the chair. My point is teller for the aye, Senator Urquhart, teller for the no, Senator Cadill. Senators, there being 34 ayes and 28 noes, it is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the remaining amendment on sheet 1872 and the amendments on sheets 1821, 1824, 1825, 1829 and 1841 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Division is required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. I note that there is no remaining amendment on sheet 1872, so the question is that the amendments on sheets 1821, 1824, 1825, 1829 and 1841 be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left, I appoint as teller for the aye, Senator Cadell, and teller for the no, Senator Urquhart. Honourable Senators, there being 28 ayes and 34 noes, it's passed in the negative. I will now deal with the amendments circulated by the Jackie Lambie Network. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Chair. Now, uh, if I could request that the amendments on sheets 1884 and 1885 be put separately. Honourable Senators, I intend to put in, in response to the request from Senator Cash. Uh, two questions. The first question is that the amendments on sheet 1884 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Uh, I'll now put the second question that the amendments on sheet 184 Eight five be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Aye. Against no. No. I think the noes have it. You want a I, I hear. I've heard voices. Do you want? Would you like a division? No. The next question is that the amendments on sheet one eight eight six be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. I will now deal with the amendment circulated by Senator David Pocock. Me, yes, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And again, uh, if I could request that mm. the amendments on sheet 1840 revised and 1909 uh, be separated out. I'll be putting the questions. I will be putting the questions separately. I put the question that the amendments on sheet 1840 as revised, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Ayes have it. Is the division required? Yes. Division required for one minute.
Okudors. Question before the Chair. The amendments on sheet 1840 revised be agreed to. Those of the question passed to the right of the Chair, nose to the left of the Chair. I point it to Teller for the eye, Senator Cadell, and Teller for the nose, Senator Urquhart. Honourable Senators, there have been 28 ayes and 34 noes. It's passed in the negative. I now put the question that the amendments on sheet 1909 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the ayes have it. Have it. Division required? Yes, Division required. Bills for one minute. Bring the bells. Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the amendments on sheet 1909 be agreed to. Those for the question passed to the right of the chair. Those to the left of the chair, I point as teller for the eye, Senator Urquhart, and teller for the nose, Senator Cadell. Thank you. 
Honourable Senator, there being 37 ayes and 25 noes, it is it's resolved in the affirmative. I will now deal with the amendments circulated by Senator Thorpe. The question is that the amendments on sheets 1863, 1875 and 1876 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. Aye. Aye. The noes have it. Is the division required? Vision required. Ring the bells. One minute. That's no, more than one. Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the amendments on sheets 1863, 1875 and 1876 be agreed to. I appoint teller for the aye, Senator Thorpe. I, I, I require your assistance, Senator Thorpe. And I appoint teller for the noes, Senator Cadell. Honourable Senators, there being 12 ayes and 38 noes, it's passed in the negative. Uh, Senator Roberts. I have a division on the sheet SK150. I'm in the hands of the Senate. Is leave granted? Uh, as I understand yes. it, is Senator Roberts yes. is seeking to have a, a division on uh, government amendments SK150. 150, is that correct? That's correct. So the leave has not been granted. I will I'll direct that your opposition be recorded. And Senator Babette and Senator Hanson and yourself. Okay, that is it's directed to be recorded. Pursuant to order, I shall report the bill.
I will first deal with the amendment circulated by the opposition to the motion that the report from the committee be adopted. The question is that the amendment be. Oh, sorry, Senator Cash. The withdrawing amendment. it. Thank you, oh, Chair. Okay. Wrong. Uh, oh, I understand, Senator Cash. You need leave. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Honourable Senators, the committee has considered the bill and agreed to the same with some amendments. The question is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be passed. To put the question, those for the question say aye, against no, the, the ayes have it. Is vision required? Ring the bells. One minute. Oh, you want four minutes? Four minutes have been requested. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Dr Dawes. So the question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Cadell as teller for the noes. Order. There being 34 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. The bill for an act to establish a national reconstruction fund corporation and for related purposes. <clears throat> the president has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. I call the minister. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. I move that, this, that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. So the question is: the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Safeguard Mechanisms Credentialing Amendment Bill of 2023 for concurrence. I call the minister. Thank you, President. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is: the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Bill for an act to amend legislation relating to emissions reductions and for related purposes. I call the minister. Thank you, President. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. And I think I'm calling Senator Dunningham. Me, President. And uh, look, well, what a night. From one bill that will have a negative impact on the Australian economy to another. Uh, and what a way it's arrived in this place to have this legislation, which uh, the subject of a Senate inquiry and, uh, of course, a secret backroom deal where dodgy agreements have been reached in secret with no transparency. And here we are now at the 11th hour dealing with this bill, and we'll be sitting late into the night, I expect, to hear contributions from across the chamber. But it's a dodgy deal we should have seen coming. It's one that we should have expected because there is form developing here. And this is what the world looks like now. Post the last federal election, the Australian Labor Party relying on the Australian Greens to do business in this country. Uh, it's this new power sharing arrangement, a new coalition, and the end result we are seeing every step of the way, and I should know, I'm from Tasmania, I've seen what happens when these deals are struck up. It's never good. Just a tip. Punters always miss out. Power prices always go up. The cost of living always goes up. People's ability to achieve their dreams are always harder to reach. This dodgy deal, as I say, it's one we should have seen coming. This dodgy deal between Labor and the Greens is one that's going to drive up power prices. It's one that's going to drive industry offshore. 
and those jobs attached to those businesses, and this dodgy deal won't improve environmental outcomes at all, yeah. contrary to some of the assertions. It's actually going to make them worse globally, because we are part of the world. We're not just some bubble out off to the side. We actually do contribute to global emissions, and when they're offshored here, as this bill will drive emissions offshore, this problem simply becomes something elsewhere for someone else to deal with, not for us. It was most interesting on the road to where we are today to um, finally be debating this bill in the Senate, to sort of observe the faux interest in accountability that we observed from the Greens on the way through in the Senate inquiry. Uh, we heard evidence from various uh, stakeholders who were concerned about the impact, some who uh, were, of course, supportive of what was before them. This is before any of the secret deals had been hatched up between Labor and the Greens. But there was this sort of uh, faux interest in accountability, and it was about the modelling uh, that underpins this legislation, modelling that the government uh, wasn't going to release to us. They sort of hid behind this ridiculous claim of public interest immunity, um, complete contempt for the Senate. Now, right as senators to see this information, to understand what it is we're voting on, to make sure we're apprised of all the facts. And I went along with this. Um, uh, my colleague, Senator Hanson Young and Senator David Pocock, uh, on this Senate inquiry into this legislation, all made it very clear that it was not acceptable, it was not okay that this modelling be hidden from us, modelling that would give us some assurance that what this bill was proposing to do could actually be achieved, i.e. that businesses that couldn't meet their emissions reductions targets could rely on carbon credits or safeguard mechanism credits to offset their emissions, to continue to trade here, because the alternative is they have to pay a penalty. This tax, a $275 a tonne tax for businesses, that is not going to make the cost of doing business lower. That is not going to drive down uh, the cost of manufacturing. It is not going to create jobs. It is, in fact, going to make it all worse. So here we were, all of us everyone except the government asking for this information. All the while, the same people I was sitting in the committee with asking for this information were cooking up a sneaky backroom deal to get this bill through. And As I said before, we should have seen it coming. But genuinely, we asked the question, how could we actually vote on this legislation without this information? It's a concern I still have. We don't have this modelling. We don't know. We have no further comfort that this bill will do what the government tells us it will. All we have is a trust us. We've got modelling. We've seen it. We know what we're talking about. And I guarantee you, through the duration of this debate, uh, through the committee stage, we won't be given anything by way of supporting information. But the one thing that did change was suddenly those I was teaming up with to move motions, to demand that this information be released, suddenly don't think it's important anymore. They now are happy to bring this bill on for debate to rush it through this week without the modelling that was so important that we had all these concerns about. But as I say, we should have seen it coming. It's just another Labor Green stitch up and one that is becoming all too commonplace in this parliament. And this is the brave new world of Labor Green politics in Australia where uh, these deals are hatched up and the people that pay for these deals, of course, are going to be the people of Australia. They're going to pay for these deals, and this one in particular, much like the one we've just voted on with higher power prices. This new tax on uh, heavy emitting industries, carbon intensive industries, is going to drive up the cost uh, of electricity. Um, and you don't really have to take my word for it. You can actually go and listen to the concerns and the complaints of industry. Now, in good faith, industry peak bodies entities right across this country have worked with government to try and minimise the harm that legislation like this will do to their sectors. I dearly would love for them to speak up a bit louder about the concerns they have, because we'll be in their corner fighting with them, but instead they've gone along with it. But let's look at some of the concerns that have been raised uh, about the impact that this legislation will have on the economy, all elements of it, everything from the cost of living and the cost of doing business, like power prices, like the cost of fuel, like inputs to housing and construction. Let's look at uh, what it does to certainty around gas supply. We'll start with Saul Kavonich from Credit Suisse, 
who, um, and he's their uh, energy analyst, and he said, while the safeguard reform deal with the Greens is a far cry from a ban on new oil and gas, it certainly doesn't indicate new oil and gas supply is welcome. It lays the groundwork for more obstacles to new investment in gas supply, contrary to Labor's recent message that Australia needs more gas supply. So this is what happens when a government does a deal with their natural bedfellows, the Australian Greens, it starts to make it harder to bring on the essentials we need to have a functioning economy. Samantha McCulloch, the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association, said, this deal will make climate change targets harder and more costly to meet, given the importance of gas in providing a backup for renewables. New gas supply investment needs policy and regulatory certainty, but instead the Labor Greens deal creates additional barriers to investment, further diminishing the investment environment and adding to the growing list of regulatory challenges facing the sector. The changes announced today strengthen the need for strong government direction on critical step change technologies such as carbon capture and storage. But I tell you what, I don't reckon we're going to see much of that if that green tail continues to wag this Labor dog. Andrew McKellar, the CEO of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, um, said that energy affordability and supply have not been compromised in this deal with uh, the assurance that uh, energy affordability and supply have not been compromised in this deal with the Greens has not been given. And he says, while we welcome the certainty that an agreement will bring, business remains concerned about access to affordable and reliable energy. And I could go on, but the point is, and it's a very clear one, a very straightforward one, uh, that this legislation designed to bring down emissions has a far further reaching impact than just doing that. Because this is no longer carrot, it's all stick. It's a blunt instrument. And it got worse in the last 24 to 36 hours because the government found some dark room somewhere in this building, probably smoke filled, who knows, doing dodgy deals with a group who actually are not pro industry, who are not pro job. And the end result, as I say, is Australians that are going to be paying a lot more for their electricity and all of the other inputs into their daily life. Australians are going to be paying more for every single one of the essentials they rely on every day. And businesses are going to suffer too, and it's not just going to be the big emitters, the 215 big emitters that were originally caught under the safeguard mechanism. Uh, while they, of course, are directly impacted by these decreasing baselines, the 4.9 per cent per annum uh, to the year 2030, and of course, if they can't meet those targets and if, if they can't offset those targets, then they have to pay the penalty. That's bad. They are going to be making investment decisions based on this new tax that Labor and the Greens are uh, putting on these businesses, sending a chilling message out to the rest of the world that we really aren't open for business. It's the small to medium business enterprises in their hundreds if not thousands, that work with these big businesses, that rely on contracts with these big businesses for maintenance, for upgrades, for other services they provide. That work will dry up. The small to medium businesses that are going to be paying more for energy and other inputs that these large emitters put in, they're going to become uncompetitive. Business and productivity will slow. Productivity is going to be driven down by this legislation. It's just so ironic. The last bill that we dealt with in this place, President, is something that the government uh, vaunted as this uh, manufacturing, boon-creating piece of legislation. It's going to open up the economy and drive all sorts of new innovation and high-paying jobs. Well, then, here we are with the next bill bringing in taxes and arrangements that are going to drive jobs and productivity offshore. And what's to, in addition to that, it's going to drive emissions offshore. This is not good. Jobs will be lost, the economy will slow, everyone will be worse off, and here we are dealing with legislation that should be stopped, that's going to do all of this. Basic economics has gone out the window here uh, when it comes to, and I touched on it before, with regard to uh, the CEO of Appia talking about the need to bring on gas as one of the step change technologies and supporting a transition to renewables. The fact is all of the levers that have been pulled by this government in partnership with the Greens are going to drive down the incentive and drive away the interest in investing in gas exploration. We need it. We can't just switch it off tomorrow because if we don't have it there coming on, we will be having blackouts this winter. 
If we go down this pathway of banning fossil fuels, which is what the Greens have told us their deal on this legislation will do, we will not be able to cater for the economic needs and energy needs this country has. And so economics is gone. The laws of demand and supply have been ignored, and uh, we've been warned about the impact that these changes and these laws will have. But it's fallen on deaf ears when it comes to this government and, of course, to the Australian Greens. And as I said before, we are part of the globe. We are part of a global economy. We are part of a world that has a global environmental responsibility. It's not something we can just look at in isolation and pretend everything that happens offshore from this country is not our responsibility. Uh, these laws will not improve environmental outcomes. They won't improve economic outcomes. They're indeed inflationary. As I said before, it is a new tax. I have many concerns about the nature of some of the amendments that have been talked about in the media, circulated, I guess, at the 11th hour, uh, these 20 pieces of silver that they've been given in return for support in this legislation, legislation, incidentally, that doesn't seem to have been met with universal acclaim from uh, one of the supporting parties. Indeed, I was looking uh, at reports today about a tweet from one of our colleagues here, Senator McKim, who said, quote, We've been in negotiations with the corrupt, ecocidal government of Petrostate that was prepared to hold a gun to the head of future generations by threatening to blow up climate action unless they would continue to approve massive new coal and gas projects," he said on Twitter on Monday night. Now, this is coming off the back of, of course, Foundation Life member, former Senator Bob Brown, a man who is a man of conviction, and whether you agree with him or not, you know where you stand with him. You know he's never, ever, ever going to change his view on stuff. He is a man that is actually, when he says, this is what I believe, this is what I'm going to do, he resigned from the Australian Conservation Foundation uh -oh. because of their support for this disastrous uh, piece of legislation. Now, of course, he has different views about this. He doesn't like it for different reasons than I don't like it. But I tell you what, he was going to stick to his guns and he was actually going to hold his nerve and stick to his values and what he believes to be right. I can't say the same for the Australian Greens. They've done a deal which doesn't actually meet with the demands. I'll be interested to see what former Senator Bob Brown says over coming months of the Greens and their new deal with their friends here, their coalition partners, the Australian Labor Party. But at the end of the day, you know what? I can say all of these things. They'll ignore it. Correct. They'll ignore it. Yep. Power prices Sorry. will go up. The cost of doing business will go up. And there is, like there was with the gas cap legislation at the end of last year, colleagues, one test for this, and it's going to come in the middle of this year. Do prices go down? That's right. When Australians, when Australian households, when Australian businesses receive their next power bills, are they going to have gone up as a result of this, or are they going to have gone down? My tip, like it was at the end of last year, they will have gone up. They will have not gone down. And that is going to be a terrible reality for Australian families to deal with. Families who are dealing with increased mortgage repayments, 10 interest rate increases, people coming off fixed rates onto variables. And now, because of the Labor Green government in this country, they're going to be dealing with much higher power prices. They may well lose their jobs because we're going to drive those businesses they work for offshore, along with the emissions that are now going to be coming out of countries that don't give a damn about the environment. It's a sad day. And I hope people wake up and see what's happening. Here, Senator Williams, Senator Waters.